I would like to extend a warm welcome and a thank you to all of you for joining us today. My name is Jeanette Stewart. I am the founder of Translation Commons. We at Translation Commons are excited to host today's celebration of International Translation Day in partnership with UNESCO. I would like to extend a warm welcome and a thank you to all of you for joining us today. My name is Jeanette Stewart. I am the founder of Translation Commons. We at Translation Commons are excited to host today's celebration of International Translation Day in partnership with UNESCO. I would like to extend a warm welcome and a thank you to all of you for joining us today. My name is Jeanette Stewart. Can I please ask anybody who has the YouTube channel on to turn it off? We cannot have in our computers both the Zoom and the, um, uh, <laughs> the YouTube. If you can all switch it off, thank you so much. I apologize to our viewers. Um, I will start from where we left it. We celebrate this day that brings recognition of the importance of an often unseen element of regional and international communication. That is the skillful work of translators and interpreters behind the scenes in countless environments. Today, we also mark the launch of UNESCO's International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which extends from 2022 to 2032. This decade will shine a light on the many difficulties and the many successes that Indigenous communities all over the world are experiencing in attempting to keep their languages and cultures alive and thriving. Indigenous translators and interpreters face unique challenges while they are helping their communities navigate issues of health, safety, civil rights, mobility, livelihood, education, climate, and so much more. For many language communities, translation and interpretation are a necessary and normal part of everyday life. But what are the experiences and how are translating and interpreting unique when involving indigenous languages. We are honored today to have the participation of experts from various fields who will share their knowledge and experiences. We are honored to have a wonderful volunteer staff that is producing the event. We are grateful to each and every one of you for your time, energy, and thoughtful participation. We will begin our program now with a blessing and a presentation by Dev Kumar Sunuwar of the Sunuwar community in Nepal, which demonstrates what can be done when a whole community comes together to enable their language digitally. Neil Kalusio. Gonang Queens, Dave Kumar Sunwa. Siol Tasha, Giol Tasha, Ziki Yable, Kubi Yable, Dalkeb Yable, Full Day, Jam Lahasha, Mula Tinga, Eko Girapin, Ma, Go Shotnu, Shotnu. La Day Liki, Chushawaita, Mushawaita, Kia Domta, Hege Domtana, Greetings to all. I just prayed uh, in my Sunuar mother tongue for the success of this program. First of all, uh, thank you so much for a translation comments and a UNESCO Secretariat of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages and uh, the International Federations of Translators for this opportunity to present uh, how we, Sunwar Indigenous Nationalities of Nepal, 
are using and developing uh, different technologies to promote and preserve uh, one of the endangered indigenous languages of Nepal and uh, how we Sonora indigenous nationalities are translating our languages um, uh, and, and this, this uh, on the occasion of uh, International Translation Day with uh, which is uh, being observed with the theme, a world without barriers. Sunuar is uh, one of, uh, Sunuar is uh, indigenous nationalities officially uh, recognized as one of the 59 indigenous peoples of Nepal. And we identify ourselves um, as Quench, while others, recognize us as Sunuar. Our total population is almost 56,000, uh, according to 2011 census, of which um, close to 38,000 of us speak our mother tongue, which is called uh, Poinslo. Sunuar, like uh, many other indigenous peoples in the world, are world uh, communities, um, we are transferring and or the passing our language, culture, rituals, knowledge, and so on to the next generations uh, orally uh, through dance, through songs, uh, also uh, through the communications. This means that like uh, most indigenous languages, uh, quite slow or the Sunwar language is not uh, written widely nor it is used uh, to write literature extensively. Though we have our own uh, distinct script, which for long um, our ancestors preserved through uh, inscriptions on the animal skin or handwriting, and uh, they have passed down to us uh, for which we are very uh, grateful. And today, uh, it is our responsibility to further advance uh, promoting and preserving our languages and uh, pass down to the younger generations. Towards this end, uh, for these reasons, with the changing modern science and technologies, we, um, a group of Sunwar community members at uh, Sunwar um, Welfare Society, an umbrella. Uh, and the representative organizations uh, of uh, Sunwar indigenous peoples in Nepal, with the technical support from um, the translations common, translation commons, um, we are embarking towards having Unicode standard of Sunwar script. But um, so far, uh, Sunwar uh, indigenous communities have been uh, dependent, dependent on the Roman English and uh, also heavily on the uh, Devanagari script or the Nepali script and uh, or the uh, Devanagari, Devanagari Unicode to translate the Sunwar language text, basically Sunwar language text, while um, writing poems or publishing any newspaper or the writing of stories, we uh, very much have been dependent on the uh, Devanagari um, uh, script or Devanagari Unicode. Uh, the language for us is uh, not, not merely a means of communications. Uh, it is the expression of our social, socio-cultural identity and also the repository of our history our knowledge, our uh, belief systems, and uh, the language is a BSBL intangible heritage. Although having existed uh, or, uh, orally for a long time, we have been developing and using different technologies to preserve and promote our languages, which um, is one of the endangered uh, languages in Nepal. We are, uh, we have undertaken or we are undertaking the initiatives to document uh, and uh, the promote to promote our mother tongue 
um, we have been using them. Uh, we have been using our mother tongue in our everyday life uh, where possible and uh, preserving and promoting our languages um, within uh, our capacity, either by printing the newspapers, uh, writing poems or the story uh, stories or publishing story books, and also uh, a dictionary, uh, even if um, it is in a Devanagari script or Devanagari Unicode, Devanagari script. We have been producing uh, more than this. We have been producing radio programs and also uh, the television programs. And at the meantime, we have been teaching uh, our languages through the television. Uh, and uh, through the radio to the next generations so that uh, we can um, keep our language alive. And, uh, and lately, uh, we also have been uh, producing the podcast and using the Facebook Live, um, as well as the, um, the YouTube channels, uh, TikTok and other social media to record uh, our conversations. And these technologies like radio, television, TikTok, or YouTube, or uh, Facebook, um, or a podcast are helping us to record our oral traditions into audio and a visual or a visually. During this uh, international decade of uh, indigenous languages, we have planned to engage uh, strategically to further advance our script, um, uh, our uh, script as well as our language, so that our indigenous languages can be uh, a motivations and inspirations for um, not only for our younger generations uh, but also for the um, policymakers, uh, especially to use uh, our languages for. Um, in the education, educational purposes, in justice delivery, or the, in, in the government businesses, and uh, for dissemination of information uh, in our mother tongue. That is what uh, we want, and uh, for that we are committed, and uh, we have been using science and technologies to um, uh, create uh, more media content or contents as possible. And finally, um, uh, on behalf of Sunwar, uh, Indigenous Peoples Nepal, and all Indigenous Peoples of Nepal, I wish a very uh, success and I wish a very happy International Translation Day. Thank you so much. Namaste. See you. You have to unmute. Jenny, you have to unmute. Thank you. <laughs> Our first guest opening the celebration of International Translation Day is Ms. Dorothy, Gord Dorothy Gordon, Chair of the Intergovernmental Council of the UNESCO Information for All Program and a board member of the UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies in Education. Ms. Dorothy Gordon is a global leader in the field of technology and development with a focus on digital transformation. As an advisor and consultant, she has worked with the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence, the World Summit Awards, Linux Professional Institute, and Chatham House. Dorothy, thank you for joining us and delivering the opening address. Thank you. So much, Jeanette, and congratulations to the entire team that has pulled together this event. Let me start by apologizing in case my bandwidth isn't good. I'm actually in Silicon Valley, and it seems there's too much demand on the bandwidth at the moment. I just want to say as the chair of IFAP that the issues that the day addresses, a world without barriers, are very central to the IFAP mandate. We've been working on these issues for decades now. 
and I'm particularly proud of the work that has been done by our vice chair in charge of multilingualism and the documents that have come out of that particular working group, including the Yakuts Declaration and very recently an almanac that details 20 indigenous languages. Indigenous languages are at the core of our belief in terms of what needs to be done for effective communication in development. And let me remind us that it is only recently that people have woken up to the importance of language for development. And unfortunately, it didn't feature in the SDGs, but we are very happy that following the International Year of Indigenous Languages, the UN has now declared the decade and that this is the first World Translation Day within the decade. I just want to um, highlight a few things that I hope will be taken into account as we move forward. First of all, technology is moving very fast when it comes to language. I want to reassure you, this is not my avatar speaking, and there's no words that I'm speaking today that have been created by uh, language modeling, you know, uh, like the GPT-3, creating the speech without any human involvement. But that's a part of the reality that we live today. We have to understand that a lot of what we see online was not necessarily created by human beings. And um, you may think that you're having a real conversation with a person rather than a machine, but that's not the case today, very often. And another impact that we are seeing is that that affects indigenous languages in a particular way, because those language models that use um, the latest techniques in artificial intelligence to create content rely on huge amounts of data. And unfortunately, we do not have those data sets available in indigenous languages. So we need to wake up to that particular dimension that can affect our concerns in order to ensure that indigenous languages have their right, rightful place in the whole development agenda. So the other thing I want to mention is that while we benefit greatly from the involvement of the translators and interpreters of indigenous language that are rooted within their communities, we need to work better with them in order to give them the latest tools that are available to all translators, because they are professional translators and they should be treated as such. And also let me mention that when it comes to our schools of linguistics around the world, we have a big gap because they often do not teach computational linguistics, which are becoming central to the work of translators today. This has to change and we need to make sure, I'm hoping that those who will be attending today, among you will be people who can get a wonderful online course in computational linguistics that linguistic students and indigenous translators and interpreters could access to upgrade their skill set. So on this day, um, the opening remarks were supposed to be brief, so I'll control myself. But let me just call on everyone to support translation commons and the wonderful effort has been making to present schematics and to simplify the process of taking a language online and being able to be professional about the interpretation and translation. They've already done a great deal to map out what needs to be done at the level of the community and how to train the guardians of language to manage and control the process. As I said before, we need to exploit the internet so that we have 
more courses, both online and offline, that will ensure that people can take control of the process. And let me now end and uh, really looking forward to the discussions today. Let me end by congratulating all the organizers on what promises to be a great event. I am happy to see that there are members of a number of IFAP working groups who are already part of the events and who are online and involved. There's a great speaker line up and it's very balanced. And I hope that together we can make a positive step towards our goals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you very, very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Ingarda Cassie Kate Bundenberg, Advisor for Communication and Information at UNESCO. She has more than 20 years of professional experience in international relations, minority rights, information and communication, social inclusion, and sustainable development. She has tirelessly worked for the International Year of Indigenous Languages, and I'm privileged to have worked with her over the last few years in preparation for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Imgarda will share with us how multilingualism policy and preservation factors in the global action plan for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Uh, thank you very much, Annette, for this wonderful introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Really happy to see so many colleagues and friends around uh, the virtual table. And I'm very pleased to welcome you today to celebrate the International Translation Day, which marks the first celebration of this day at the outset of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. The previous speakers already mentioned that this is the first time that we will be celebrating within the context of International Decade. And I would like to take this opportunity immediately to thank our partner, Translation Commons, for the leadership and cooperation in organizing this timely event and all speakers who joined from different parts of the world, different time zones, who agreed to contribute to this discussion today. And I'm very happy as well to see what the chair of IFOP is with us today. And thank you very much for your uh, welcoming remarks. So we are here to commemorate the work of translators, interpreters, and language specialists who play, of course, a very key role in ensuring the right to interpretation and translation for all, and in particular today for indigenous peoples. As it is stated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, I would like to start my brief intervention by focusing on why uh, language professionals are important and highlight a couple of issues which I believe are important for the role in building inclusive, equitable, open and inclusive societies. Everyone has the right and freedom to use the chosen language as it is an essential element for human dignity, for the life of the community, for peaceful coexistence and for sustainable development. We all know what languages allow us to interact with each other, convey our thoughts, share and learn from each other. They also help us to maintain, safeguard and transmit our histories, establish our own identities and share centuries old wisdom and knowledge. This is why it is so difficult if it would be not possible to achieve all this if we would not have language professionals, interpreters, translators, terminologists, and many other specialists who are working today to develop new language technologies which would facilitate intercultural dialogue, uh, leading to mutual understanding and cooperation among nations. Uh, few already mentioned what the proclamation of international decade um, was announced in 2019 by United Nations General Assembly. And this is the first year that we launched the International Decade, which will um, last until 2032. This is a key outcome of International Year of Indigenous Languages, which we all celebrated in 2019. 
And I must tell you what, in 2019, it was a really, truly global international uh, cooperation um, process where we were able to mobilize a very wide range of stakeholders from the nearly 100 countries around the world. And we were able to record at least 1,000 activities. Imagine every single day we had maybe three activities somewhere in the world taking place, which were related to indigenous languages for the promotion and for the support of indigenous language users. And we obviously see today what the scope of the work needed during the international decade is beyond the capacity of any single nation, uh, country, stakeholder group, generation even, discipline, policy framework, or even set of actions. So this is why we believe that international decade is a unique opportunity in this regard as it offers important entry points for tangible and long-term actions of all stakeholders. And among very important initiatives that we launched immediately after the proclamation of International Decade, UNESCO um, developed together with many stakeholders, including those who are here around today, a global action plan for International Decade, uh, which was developed in order to provide a strategic framework for, uh, for joint actions. And it is clearly outlines a number of important um, uh, action lines, um, provides guidelines on its implementation, monitoring, evaluation of uh, global activities. It is as well structured around four outcomes, 10 outputs and 30 very broad activities which we identified around the world. We carried out at least seven regional consultations involving different stakeholders from indigenous communities to governmental representatives, many research institutions, information media, um, as well as private sector organizations joined this effort. And it was done during very difficult period for all of us during COVID crisis, but at the same time, it did not prevent us not to achieve something what we wanted, to have a comprehensive action plan, which would really provide us a guidelines in and um, support us in our activities related to inclusive education, um, inviting uh, governments uh, to recognize languages, um, speak about digital empowerment, promote gender equality, um, ensure that indigenous food systems as well have something to do with indigenous languages, as we know, putting clearly what these are the issues which are related and have to be addressed together. Number of discussions were focused on biodiversity, cultural heritage, and obviously employment opportunities, technological development and partnerships. And what is interesting that the action plan at early beginning during this consultative process, which took us around one year, we identified language professionals, interpreters and uh, translators, language technology developers as those who could be considered or should be considered as target group, as one of the target group. And we have to make sure that the role and engagement and preservation and revitalization, promotion of indigenous languages would be clearly understood and supported. So the capacity of interpreters and translators to provide quality language services in indigenous languages is one of the core actions of the uh, action plan as it contributes to the realization of the right of, to interpretation and translation of, for indigenous peoples. And especially I would focus here and maybe draw attention to the critical contexts as, as such as legal cases and justice systems to make sure that um, uh, access to healthcare and public information is provided. And these requirements are of course equally equipable uh, in the cases of conflict and post-conflict situations on persons who use sign languages in everyday communication. I would like as well to take this opportunity today to share with you what uh, UNESCO's recommendation concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism and access to cyberspace, which was adopted by UNESCO member states during the General Conference in 2003, is a very unique uh, normative instrument within UN system, which stresses the importance of translation and interpretation as well it invites member states and all other stakeholders to work together on the elimination of linguistic barriers online, improving technological devices, creating more multilingual local content, 
open content um, and building digital skills and capacities uh, to provide more information in different languages. And this recommend recommendation is relevant to today's discussion as many indigenous peoples and language users still experience multiple challenges in accessing public information online. Many devices, uh, personal computers, mobile phones, applications do not have indigenous scripts. Majority of websites do not offer content or digital services in indigenous languages. And here there is a really big work to be done. And I'm glad that this um, event today will contribute to the first discussion, what can we do together during international decade. And in parallel, I would like as well to stress that language professionals have an increasingly technology mediated profession. We need fully to understand their responsibilities and the importance to support them, uh, but we would be able to cope with potential benefits and limitations what technology has, and as well as uh, for the benefits of all stakeholders. Uh, so this is why the Global Action Plan reflects the overall positive process and progress in terms of digital empowerment, freedom of expression, and as well highlights the importance of uh, language professionals, as such as interpreters and translators. And in conclusion, let's celebrate International Translation Day. Let's remind everyone about the importance of language professionals and the need to work together to achieve the long-term goal uh, for leaving no one behind, no one outside, leaving no, one, no language behind and no language outside. So UNESCO very much looks forward to continue working in close cooperation with all stakeholders in order to make this decade of action for indigenous languages. Thank you very much and enjoy this wonderful discussion today. Back to the chair. Thank you, Imgarda, very much. Um, the first session of the day covers the theme preserving indigenous languages through translation. Our moderator is Dr. Siva Prasad Rambatla. Siva is a retired professor of anthropology and currently honorary professor in the University of Hyderabad. He is a member of the Information Ethics Working Group of UNESCO's Information for All program. He has been working on issues related to indigenous and marginal communities from a multidisciplinary perspective. The session that uh, Siva will be moderating touches upon issues related to digital methods in preserving indigenous languages, indigenous knowledge systems, dialects, and language preservation in Indonesia. Siva. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sinet. I, now, I uh, would like to request all uh, the panel members uh, to uh, restrict the time because uh, it's difficult to manage time. Uh, 10 minutes is the time because we have five speakers. Five into 10 means 50 minutes. We, uh, I think five minutes, are another uh, 10 minutes possibly for smaller, if there are question hours or maybe introduction of things. I'll start with uh, uh, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Niladri uh, Sheikha Das, uh, a good friend of ours. And uh, he is a professor and head uh, from the famous Indian Statistical Institute. And uh, he basically works in the areas relating to corpus linguistics, uh, language technology, language documentation, digitization, and digital lexicography. Now the floor is yours, Dr. Nilata. Thank you, sir. So let me share my screens. Is it visible now? Yes, yes, it is. Right. So should I go first full screen? Let's do it. Okay. <clears throat> so today, this is a very technical uh, talk. Uh, before that, I should say that uh, at present, we are uh, working on an indigenous language, trying to develop a digital dictionary for that particular language community. And also 
we are trying to translate some of these texts from those indigenous languages to the standard Bengali language. And the, <clears throat> the basic is that here I would start, uh, I, uh, highlight the, some of the problems and challenges and the issues that we have faced with regard to translation of those texts from that particular language community. The first thing that I would soon say, there are only nine slides, so I should try to finish within time. Directionality of the translation that we have faced the problem from an indigenous language to power language here for suburb language, the language which we are working with, to the standard Bengali language, which the identity speaker are acquainted with. Or alternatively, we can go for a power language to an indigenous language. For our purposes, in this case, we are trying to translate some of the texts from the Savar language to the Bengali language. The reverse directionality is not considered because from not from Bangla to other language because due to illiteracy of the Savar community. Now the content for translation that you have selected, we have primarily emphasized on oral texts. Oral narratives of the Savar speech community that are the text which has been available to us Written text is not available with the community. So since they have no script, no writing system, whatever is available is only the oral texts. So for us, this has been a real challenge to translate those oral texts from the Sabra language to the standard Bengali language. The types of oral texts available for translation for us, we found that there are large number of imaginative texts particularly the prose texts, which are more preferences given to those for those texts. Also, there are some poetic texts, also more representative of the community. So the sober community has a limited amount of poetic texts, songs, riddles, and lullabies like kind of texts, but they have a few prose texts also like folk tales, some fables from jungle related stones. And the informative texts that we so far have been successful to retrieve are related to the methods of hunting, foraging, wild honey collection, bar catching, and leisure catching, and all those kinds of activities. So for us, all these both imaginative texts, prose texts, and poetic texts, as well as the informative texts that are available from the community are the texts that we can consider for translation purposes. The people who have been involved in this translation, this has been a real good, uh, real challenge for us. Educated members of Sabor community was the first alternative for us. This is a rare possibility because the Sabor community has no educated adult, first issue. Second, the new generation who are below the age group of 15 has just started going to schools. Only one girl so far has earned a graduate degree this year only. And parents and older people cannot do this task. Our second alternative is that through professionals, which has been a preferred choice, that no professional translator is available to translate the oral subword text into Bengali, Hindi, or English. Some local people have some speech competence in server, but they also cannot do this task because translation task is a highly technical task and professional task. So the third alternative that we could think of is through a modern mediator that the original software speaker in between there is a mediator and last there is a translator. So a mediator who understands the software texts can help a translator to carry out the task. And at present till now, this has been the best option for us to translate those texts. Now, what purpose does this translation actually task serve? We can clearly understand that there are specific tasks that can be addressed. This helps us to preserve the Sabar oral texts through translation into another language or multiple languages as possible. Utilize those translated texts for making uh, scholars or ethnolinguists making interested to scholars like ethnologists, linguists, sociolinguists, sociologists, even the curators interested about the sober speech community and its culture. Because let me tell you here that majority of the people are not aware about the very, very bad conditions of this particular speech community. And they are one of the most endangered communities living in a remote place in the state of West Bengal in India. 
We are also planning to utilize those translated materials for global representation of identity of the Sabur speech community. And also making this indigenous knowledge system of the Sabur community available to others through translation. Finally, we are planning to utilize the text as a part of their language teaching syllabus to train up the new generation of learners. So this is a very important component for our task that these materials can be utilized for training up the new generation of skulls. The immediate benefits of this translation that you can find out that three types of benefits that we can visualize here, knowledge generation, linguistic empowerment, and economic benefits. With regard to knowledge generation, generation of few new knowledge for the Sour community, many unknown ideas and information are captured through this translation, which is not, not av available before. The community members now are aware of their knowledge and information. They also are interested to preserve them. And individual information is now a collective knowledge. So what was initially a particular old man is now made available to the larger number of population of this community. The linguistic empowerment that the community is linguistically now empowered. They get new data and new information. They learn that their oral texts are now translated into Bengali and some other languages. And they feel slightly boosted up with their achievement. Economic benefits also are there. The whole process gives them some of them some engagement because some of the people got engaged in the whole process and they are paid for that. Some informants earned wages for helping the translation. So certain amount of financial gain also they had from this process. The translation contributing to human resource generation. We have given maximum importance to this part that we have identified a few eligible people from the Sauer community who could be engaged in this kind of work, not today, but when we are working also in future. We have trained these selected people in information sharing tasks. That means so that they can organize the information they have and they can share with us so that we can do those kind of translation of that information. A crucial part of this mediated based translation. Some of them are also engaged as passive translators or information providers in translation of subtle texts. Most of the time, they are actually a passive translators because before translating, we have long discussions about the concept they want to share with us. A large number of Sabal members are trained in the actual process of transcribing their indigenous oral texts into Bengali. And we are thinking of creating job opportunities through translation of the, for the Sabal members. Now, what are the language technology tools and devices that we have under our disposal? We are now using we have already started developing a digital text archive of several indigenous oral texts along with their transcriptions. Since our ongoing project is mostly concentrated on developing a digital dictionary for that particular community for the first time, we are having all those indigenous texts also archived and processed and annotated for further usage. Sabur oral text and their Bengali translations in digital version. We are also keeping those things in digital version. Developing speech to text system from an oral text transcriptions. This is a long challenge for us that we are thinking that if possible, we can have take help of the technology so that their oral texts can be automatically transcripted into standard Bangla script or Devanagari script for further access. Make those Sabot text and their translations available on digital platforms. We have already developed a digital platform for that, for them, and storing those texts to make them available. Develop dictionaries and essential knowledge empowerment resource. As I have already mentioned, this translation task is an extension of the digital dictionary project that we have already undertaken, and certain amount of task is already been completed. Develop bilingual and bidirectional dictionaries. Once so, that particular translation so task is done, yes, finish. Yeah. And generation of a digital profile for that community. The recommendations here, the last slide here, we suggest that we should involve various agencies in this project, have provision for adequate financial support for such long term projects, awareness campaign among the community members, 
provide audio, audio visual support in the form of documentaries and train large number of community paper mem people who engaged in the language part and preservation of oral text in multimedia format and make translation of indigenous text of the language as a part of their academic curriculum and engage in experts of successful exchange of information and ideas thank you very much it's done thank you thank you thank you very much uh, yeah, I, it's uh, interesting this thing possibly uh, people can put uh, questions in the chat box Yes. Now, the next uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Parmeshwari Krishnapurthi. Uh, she is uh, a faculty from the University of Hyderabad and uh, uh, from the Center for Applied Linguistics and Translation Studies. And uh, in fact, uh, she has been uh, working uh, uh, with, uh, you know, on computational linguistics. In fact, uh, uh, she is one of the uh, very few who have in the institute in the university now working in this area and uh, uh, and also machine translations and she has been involved in also morphological analysis and generation and divergence studies and uh, in fact she has a number of research projects and the publications now the floor is yours dr parmeshwar are you there I'm not seeing her because she was texting me. Maybe you... maybe we'll continue with the next speaker and then we can get back to the yeah, yeah, sir. yeah you're just... there. Okay. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh because thank we you are losing the... time. That's okay, sorry. Thank you for the nice evening and uh, very uh, good evening from Hyderabad, India. So let me share my screen. I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Yeah, it is visible. So today I'm going to discuss on uh, connecting language and technology and uh, can indigenous languages benefit out of it. And also I would like to discuss this one uh, from the case study while building machine translation systems for indigenous languages, including the other like major languages. Uh, so there is a growing need for connecting our natural languages with technology because a lot of improvement in the technology again requires the language also be equipped with like a lot of technological improvement. So now the question is can we teach computers to communicate with people? Uh, so that's what I, I would like to discuss now and if so what kind of resources uh, like we need to build uh, to build language technology tools? And what are the ways to develop this human language technology, especially in NLP community, we call it call the languages with less information or less resources as low resource. So what kind of uh, like, you know, steps we have to put forward to build such kind of technological uh, innovations. And uh, we have to also see machine translation as a, a kind of useful activity, because when we are living with multiple languages, where there are a lot of information that are available right now, can we access all the information on any information, anytime, anywhere, by anyone through any gadgets? So we are now have to look for that kind of uh, requirement. Now, language technology, as we know that it is an interdisciplinary field, uh, the end result of this particular field is to produce a lot of software products, uh, like you know, involving the human language intelligence, to the human, uh, like to the machine. Uh, so mimic the human mind and create a machine which behaves like a human being in the analysis as well as generation of the natural language. Now, this is really a tricky thing, right? Uh, understanding our human language is, uh, itself is a big thing. And again, generating a human language is an another uh, challenging thing. Now, it's it, we could even see that it is a natu natural language revolutionary thing. Like, you know, when we can build a machine which behaves like a human being in terms of uh, like communicating with that particular machine, understand the, that machine understands our idea, that's a big revolutionary thing that, that can happen to that particular language. Now, uh, by doing so, we are kind, kind of transforming that computer from a powerful compute calculator to a smart machine, right? So this is what, what we need. We want to 
actually mimic our human mind to the machine so machine now understand like you know behaves like a human being in terms of language production now the history of language technology is not a new thing because when when language start started inventing the script itself the technology has started then the then comes the writing and publishing field where like you know the information are recorded and disseminated across uh, people and then comes the broadcasting like radio television and other stuff now internet is an another biggest technology where language uh, is evolved with lot of information now the uh, right now the current uh, technology that are there in the languages is nlp and machine translation so the major applications people normally build using this uh, uh, nlp uh, research is building speech to speech translators machine translators which are text to text and also dialect translators because i don't want to even look like no get that information in my own dialect we need a dialect translator we need dialogue systems automatic text summarization intelligent search engines agents and sentiment analysis similarly the minor applications which every language should be equipped with is unicode font development keyboard apps predictive text inputs script translators spell checkers grammar checkers proofreading tools dictionary pen and what not right so now the major challenge is languages are not designed by a single person right it evolves over time and lot of changes new words new rules everything is happening like every day a number of tokens in a language are not fixed we cannot say my language was only these many words these many sentences no it keeps evolving and handling ambiguity is the biggest challenge as long as the nlp is concerned and similarly dialects idiolects and speech registers are a huge factor of complexity and again the major important thing is scarcity of bit training data like corpus it, because you know we are living with the era of nlp where a lot of data is required so nlp is a data hungry field right now so when we don't have a lot of corpus in terms of raw corpus or an annotated corpus definitely that's also try to like you no know, tag our languages as low resources or no resources or zero resource kind of languages so now if when i take the indian languages into the context as india is a very rich multilingual country with lots of languages with lots of language families spoken across the uh, like you no know, country and we have indo aryan uh, language family with like lot of uh, like languages which belong to that family and uh, the largest languages under the bito burman family and dravidian austroasiatic andamanese uh, of course beside uh, a couple of language isolates now what indian language technology right now is indian government has taken some initiatives in building standards and also in applications for indian languages but apparently initially these applications and standards are made for only the 22 scheduled uh, official languages of india so after that you know the empty consortium machine translation consortium in india is also not a new one so through last three four decades people were working especially in institutes other like you know uh, government agencies non government agencies are working in building machine translation systems across indian languages starting from anusaraka to angla bharati mantra matra shakti anuvadak anuvadak and indian language to indian language machine translation system english to indian language machine translation system the recent uh, uh, like you know effort by the government of india is called boshini which is a kind of scheme under national language translation mission which aimed at building resources and technologies to human like you know the native speakers of any language to understand their information in their own language so of course the selected languages are being like used in building applications and tools now when it comes to the machine translation can we build a machine translation which translate from one language to another language without any hassle of course still now we are not satisfied with most of the machine translation output right so it's because it's it's a highly knowledge intensive activity a human translator if he has he or she has to translate a text he has to possess a lot of information about both the languages starting from linguistic pragmatic world cultural and domain knowledge of that language now inputting all this information into the form of like you know rules or uh, other annotated information and providing it to the machine translation models is highly a challenging task for us 
Now, when it comes to the machine translation, of course, the most uh, commonly used three important methods are rule-based methods. Of course, they're very little old, but even now, some of the machine translation systems are being like run using this particular uh, method. And there is there comes the statistical systems where it relies on big data again, a huge amount of parallel text are required. The current technology that people normally use in building machine translation systems are NMT, neural MT. So it employs some kind of machine learning and deep, deep learning technology and gaining a lot of popularity in the field of research of machine translation because of its like you know very uh, few amount of time that can be used in training the data and recreating a model. Okay. But you know all these models, uh, creating creation of models requires data, and the data is not just raw data. Sometimes we also need linguistically enriched data. So now some are, sometimes people even develop the machine translation by combining two or more models. We call them as hybrid systems. Now, when these kind of uh, like you no know, building of machine translation is there, again there are a lot of issues. Either it is uh, what kind of methodology we follow. If some basic issues that we face are how to understand the source text. The source text itself has a lot of richness in their richness, right? So how to understand the natural language understanding is the better problem and convert that information into the target language where we should not have information loss as well as information gain. So we need to translate the text as, as, uh, as exactly as the source language as it has. So now we again have to generate the language into the target, which is acceptable, which is fluid, which has the fluency and comprehensibility, right? So the some issues like linguistic gaps, the coverage. One language may have a particular word, but another language may not have that word. So in such cases, we, we have lots of challenges like the dictionary lexicon has to be equipped with some kind of technique to cover that particular words. And again, the presence of ambiguity is another issue because the ambiguity is prevalent everywhere in the language, right? So obtaining uh, that, like, you know, disambiguating that particular ambi ambiguous situation is a big challenge because when you look at the models, rule-based or a statistical or neural-based, of course, rule-based, we have a, a very, uh, like, you know, organized way of understanding the ambiguity and the, doing it, but it is a cumbersome task. But when it comes to the neural network based thing, you can do it you know, overnight, but understanding why something has gone wrong with the PNMT is a really difficult thing. Right? So again, in addition, there are yeah. other issues like divergence. Can you so divergence, through? what we mean is, yes, yeah. I'll just finish it in one minute. Uh, so divergence issues are if any two language involved in the, uh, like, you know, building machine translation system, there are a lot of cross linguistic differences. So these differences create the divergence. I would like to show one of my slides over here to show uh, an example between two languages, which I have selected here as Tamil and Telugu. They are Dravidian languages spoken in the southern part of India, where you could see that, uh, like, you know, this diagram is a very complex diagram, but you could see there are different colors are encoded here. So the red colors are the one which I would like to write the focus. The red colors are the one the area where these two languages do, do not match. So it's a very kind of interactive tool that we have developed. So for example, if you take the dative, that is a kind of functional uh, like you know, uh, information on nouns. So the dative can express a lot of information, but not all the time these two languages can be straightforwardly mapped. So when these kind of red areas that you could see between two languages, they create a lot of issues when it comes to the machine translation, building machine translation systems. Please conclude. Yes. So my final conclusion uh, to this one, we need to have a lot of participation in building a lot of linguistic resources for languages. And also we have to address this linguistic diversity through technology because technology would be really helpful uh, in, in like, you know, connecting any languages with speaker with any other languages. So it's a great time. We have to speed up our NLP and MC activities for uh, like, you know, indigenous languages and also reshaping language policies in education is important because 40 percentage of the population do not have an access to read and read or have an education in their own language, according to the uh, Gym report. So uh, definitely yes, language technology helps us in building that universal information access. And I'm sure that machine translation systems preserves our mother tongues. Thank you.
thank you thank you uh, now may i request uh, avni khatri dr avni khatri and dr soumya sharma uh, avni khatri is a uh, faculty now uh, from the department of uh, anthropology punjab university in anthropology department as a guest faculty and soumya sharma is a freelance researcher with canvas india i uh, would like to i think one of them will be presenting or two of them but time is 10 minutes please uh, if you can reduce your time you will have time for answering questions now okay okay I'm okay yes okay yes uh, thank you sir thank you good evening everyone uh, i'll just share my screen Okay, so I'll be sharing the screen, and uh, Dr. Abni will be speaking. So the presentation will be uh, uh, done by uh, both of us, five minutes, five minutes each. So yeah, over to you, Dr. Abni. Thank you, Soumya. Namaste to everyone. Greetings for World National uh, Translation Day from Soumya and myself. Today, our presentation will talk about. and contest the use of anthropological lens from going local to global through translating indigenous knowledge systems and we are going to uh, do this in basically two uh, themes that is role of government and policy making and use of technology and media one theme will be taken by each of us now language and culture are what makes human species supreme in the course of evolution if language is the primary tool that human beings use for communication then culture is the essence of it next please next slide the theme for previous one the theme for today's uh, translation day for 2020 is a world without barriers what a beautiful theme but at the same time have we ever given a thought that that in the time of globalization when every information everything is just a click away and still we don't know our human counterparts we have no knowledge about their systems we have no knowledge about their language and their culture or cultural organization just because their way of living and social cultural nuances are different to us but why what made this a world without barriers the evolution of language is a direct result of culture influence which explains the vast and see this slide uh is it fun the vast diversity present in human kind this diversity has given rise to an unequal world with barriers and connotations like primitive local indigenous which are not mere corner connotations but symbolic reflections of the disparities and discriminatory stance present in human kind also one of the biggest challenges for an inclusive and equal society is the gap between the formal literacy and the denial of immense wisdom and knowledge that local and indigenous communities possess local and indigenous knowledge refers to the understanding skills philosophies developed by societies with long histories of interaction with their natural surrounding for rural and indigenous peoples lo local knowledge informs decision making about fundamental aspect of day to day life this knowledge is integral to a cultural complex that also encompasses language systems of classification resource use practices social interactions ritual and spirituality these unique facets describe the world's cultural diversity and provide a foundation for locally appropriate sustainable development now indigenous knowledge that predates colonialism was once regarded as primitive and unsophisticated and this cultural bias historically obscured both the structure and practices of these knowledge and hence we are at a place where english is st still the dominant language globally now if we have a world without barriers then what is the way out the way out is by mitigating one thing is like mitigating language barriers through the technique of translation and translation but how do we incorporate translation to these in communities which are socially and culturally different and do not have medium uh, uh, like literacy and education that we can address 
also they had more on the tradition of oral tradition and so what these challenges what this presentation and our paper contest is that we need an anthropological lens a cultural lens to understand these peer people and their nuances and their social organization and the way they work and in this concept of cultural relativism now what is cultural relativism all cultures are legitimate expression of human existence cultural relativists promote this thinking all cultures and communities are, are of worthy in their own equal right and in value and it helps us make sense of unfamiliar culture but how cultural relativism promotes that we need to understand people in the way and the context they are living in and if we need to translate this policy uh, these languages we need policies and we need med uh, mediums and propaganda which asserts coming from them uh, coming from their own uh, community like volunteers from them building their capacities and understanding that the nuances how they are going to work with us also translation interpreting and terminology underpins the human rights and fundamental freedoms crucial to sustainable development inculcating governance peace and social equity so using it both in ways of policy making and government and then using in broader uh, framework of media and technology propagation where we can actually address the barriers and we can address the issues of uh, getting us acquainted with those people and understanding them and getting to know them better now if when the policy is made what should be the key policy drivers first is the affirmation of national regional community culture values in the face of globalization secondly development of the services provided by indigenous knowledge holders and practitioners you have 3 minutes you have 3 minutes left now yeah, can you wrap up so because we can yeah, talk yeah, about contribution uh, next slide you just sum it up so that you yeah. can speak otherwise I'll just, uh, it will end up with yes. that yes uh, thank you so much abhi i'll just quickly take three, just 3 minutes to uh, talk about uh, technology and media so uh, we've been talking about computer computational linguistics and ai and machine learning for a very long time from uh, since the beginning of this presentation this uh, conference and uh, what is most important in the present era that revitalization of any language is only possible through education accessibility which means that when language is refashioned uh, and when it is transferred uh that is if the language transfers even poss possible uh, one has to take into account words sounds grammat grammatical structures and now uh, in the present era uh, in the present times uh, almost everyone gen z is millennials i am also a millennial everyone is using a smartphone and a laptop in fact there is a study done by generational Kin kinetics which says that 95% gen z is are using a smartphone which means we have to make language tools accessible to the young people computers uh, computer keyboard and especially mobile uh, keyboards and all. and there are a lot of efforts being done by indigenous societies across the globe and but in even in india for example in india uh, there are social media groups and uh, uh, made by gond santhals and tamangs among some of the other uh, uh, indigenous uh, tribes um and uh, um, there are these are some use cases which, which we can quickly go through in terms of role of technology uh, it can help in online learning uh, teaching through zoom uh, which was done uh, by uh, kanepsi a website for the wampanoag tribe and uh, then there are audio archives which helps to preserve and uh, revitalize record and archive audio files of elders and fluent speakers in case the first language speakers not there or also helps the linguists uh, for in their research then there is there are open source digital access platforms uh, then uh, there are uh, moving to the role of social media networking uh, which basically helps in bridging the digital divide and particularly in terms of being inclusive because if there's no inclusivity if the first language speakers are not in, involved the whole purpose of translation and preserving the language is lost so there is facebook live which became very popular during the pandemic era where people were connecting with their members and help learn their languages then there is a clubhouse that was used another uh, platform Uh, one of my favorites is first voices first voice is a web based tool where and what they do is they have an archive of audio clips words and phrases and tribes can adjust according to their need and uh, public recordings are can be played by anyone but private recordings can have to go via the administrator of the archive 
So uh, just before I end this presentation, our presentation, since we are short on time, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about uh, Mr. Ganesh Birwa, who belongs to the whole language. And he's been uh, translating or he's been a pioneer of bringing whole language to the digital age. Uh, the script of whole language is Varang Chitti. And what he has done after he joined the Facebook page, he started uh, translating whole language words uh, into, uh, in, into uh, not just Odia, but also English and which creates a bi-directional relationship between uh, people from the whole community and the outside world as well. So, uh, yeah, and just last, uh, before we end, uh, this is uh, from my field work, um, knowing the language and being able to translate and including people from the community also helps majorly uh, uh, to a great deal in uh, ethnographic filmmaking. So what we do or what I do during my, uh, before my ethnographic film, I joined a Facebook group. So here in this case for the Gone Tribes of Bastar and where I learned the basic phrases. And so that it becomes easy for me to build rapport or uh, also overcome any cultural shock that might be, but particularly building rapport and uh, have no biases. And then once the film is done, it is important to, uh, in, important to uh, get the subtitling done by the member of the community as it helps in editing. And also being in the field helps me understand the nuances and context and embody meaning of different words and phrases. Because in indigenous communities, the words, uh, phrases, and is everything, that, it is all in context to or all in uh, correlation or the norms is very close related to the objects, their places, things, and the surroundings. Yeah, yeah. so uh, just 30 seconds more, sir. And uh, so, uh, and since uh, the subtitling is done by the community member, it uh, allows for a very wholesome and inclusive audiovisual documentation and to preserve um, archive the cultural, especially the Gondi language in this case. Uh, and finally, just to end this presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to uh, share a quote by Ganesh Birwa uh, because uh, this presentation would be incomplete if I do not take, did not take an input from somebody who's already working and someone from the community. So he says that his goal is to include the whole language into the Google keyboard. So every speaker of uh, the community of the language, a uh, new learner can use it with ease. Uh, however, the current challenge is that the Varang Chitti host script is only supported by Android version 11. And whereas 80% members use Android 9 and 10. So such nuances have to also be taken into consideration what is being used, uh, what are being by the community. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. We're cutting so, into the times of others. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'm sorry because uh, uh, there's time shortage for other speakers. That's why I have to do that. Uh, it's an unpleasant job, uh, but it's good. You have a uh, lot of materials, but then uh, uh, you have to Thank cut you. it down for the uh, time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, now, Thank you, sir. Uh, now we have uh, Professor Udanaran Singh. I think if I have to introduce him, my 10 minutes is also not enough because he is currently uh, a professor at Amity University and he is a chair professor of linguistics and cultural transfer studies and he was also earlier the director of the uh, well-known uh, CIIL uh, Institute of Languages from Mysore and he was a pro-vice chancellor of Sambhata University and I have known him since 1991 uh, uh, because when I joined my university I have known him. He is one of the institution builders and a great uh, I certainly has, in fact, he has a lot of credit, uh, credits to him, and I, I, I find uh, time is very short for me to introduce him. Thank you, uh, Professor Vinansen. Please, floor is yours. You have to unmute. You have to unmute. Thank you, Shiva Prasad, and uh, I'm actually quite uh, floored by the kind of presentations uh, we have seen so far. I'm particularly happy that the kind of work that uh, Ganesh has done or kind of work that uh, Dev Kumar is doing for Sunwar community. And um, in particular, I would like to mention that there is a lot more material which perhaps many of these people are not aware of. For instance, we made four films on Sunwar on language, literature, culture, and the geography, uh, cultural geography. Uh, we have also done a lot of work on Ho. So uh, it, it is important that 
these things also be made available to many of these people so let me uh, also uh, compliment miladri for the kind of uh, uh, suggestion that he has made that these communities if you support them it does the knowledge generation it does the linguistic empowerment and there is also the revision of economic benefits now i'm talking about the curse of dialects now what are the curses that these smaller languages or smaller speech forms have and what is the predicament of the indigenous communities a five or six curses that i will talk about one is the curse of not being able to write the world of indigene does not know what the written world can achieve without which you can't do otherwise because as members of many unwritten speech communities in india we have to begin to understand it's very painful we realize that not having one's own feelings or commands or wishes expressed graphically may not have much value in a material world where only written word is trusted so second curse is the curse of oral c and as you know uh, 30 of us uh, led by uh, bbc's chris mosley who created the atlas for the world's endangered languages in 2009 for unesco we actually uh, noticed with dismay because we had had uh, meeting previous to that with uh, crystal and others uh, in uh, a european country uh, where we actually learned about the kind of alarming situation that going to come in by 2050 whether you look at pagels or crystals predictions by then 90% of world languages would have gone now you can understand disappearance of a single individual but wiping off an entire culture is very painful and many australian and canadian surveys have shown that only some elders can speak the language in all contexts actually even the members of these indigenous communities are not always aware of the grave danger that we have we call the iucn prediction uh, they have talked about a red list of threatened species of mammals of birds and creatures now similarly when you look at ethnolog uh, predicting that 516 languages are already gone see languages like kusunda in nepal already gone uh, they are nearly extinct and india too we noticed that 196 of these languages are threatened now for nearly extinct languages our culture studies our anthropology our linguistics people they are documenting but what do we do for those indigenous groups which are facing the threat very soon could translation be an answer that's my question but there is a third curse of rapid fading as we all know the writing was discovered as a technique of record translation retelling those days even in oral days added value to our records now our aesthetic inclination showed that we must go towards graphics right but it's also true that there have been a millennium of oral c for the indigenous groups now we know that our oral texts were sung cited passed down from one generation to another. the technology to arrest that something it disappears in the thin air the fourth problem of our languages smaller languages is that we are always grounded because we are bound by space and time they are bound by vertical and horizontal dimensions now thanks to the many new technologies that ananya has talked about nilad has talked about we have known that man has learned to communicate across time and space telecommunication internet and uh, social media they have changed the world for smaller groups also as a logocentric animal man's discovery of being able to foreground the logos is very important that simultaneous interpretation started even earlier the fifth curse is the curse of iconicity there is a problem now as we all know or perhaps some of us don't know that 175 of smaller languages have been worked on during our time at the CIL Mysore and there is a huge amount of digital archive that already available 
we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Now, the problem, except the problem is that the unwritten world of indigen, even if you transcribe them, they remain a kind of derivative. They remain translated. So, you no, know, we are talking about trans, transliterate, transcribe, transcript. In that sense, that you know, we are trying to trying to cross over. Now, the other uh, problem, other curse is the curse of ambiguity and brevity. And it is right that Parameshwari also talked about how to handle ambiguity. It's a big challenge for any language. Now, as students of translation, we know that even the normal major language texts, they open up for numerous interpretations, just as painted images do. And writing also practices brevity. That is, you speak a lot, but as you write, you write very little. So when you're talking about the, uh, you know, the subtitling of a film that you're making as an anthropologist, you will notice that subtitling has a limited space on the screen. Therefore, speech is, uh, you know, uh, minimal. Uh, writing is elaborate. So we have to learn how to minimize that. Now, historicizing civilization. You know, our histories they all uh, always give prominence to the written culture. Spoken word was never cared for by the majority groups. As a result, the second and third generation migrants, they feel like getting assimilated to the bigger languages, to the neighboring languages, to the major languages. So we only you know, curse them by calling them primitive vernaculars. And then there are these killer languages which assimilate them. What do we do then? As speakers of major languages, it is our time to give back to the smaller groups by translating from indigenous languages. Remember uh, Levi Strauss's warning in 1952 when UNESCO was waking up to talk about education through mother tongue, their 1953 document. The diversity of culture is behind us, before us, and all around us. The only demand we can make of it is that it takes forms that each one makes a contribution to the utmost generosity of other people. The long years of neglect could lead to very large scale of dislocation. And of course, you will say that displacement, it cannot be avoided, but an unplanned and untimely displacement can also kill literature, culture, and their medium, which is language. I'm sure translation will be a way to record their creativity and bring the indigenous to the mainstream. If you do not do that, then there will be marginalization of the speech groups, increased mortality, chances of morbidity, food insecurity, complete breakdown of values, split families, complete disorganization of their societies, and of course, regionization and loss of these languages. So I think this is what exactly I wanted to tell you, and I wanted to finish within your time frame. I hope I have been able to do that. And uh, if necessary, I will answer more questions as you ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zalansen. You are absolutely at the dot. Thank you very much. Now, the last speaker we have is Mr. Hiro Patrianto. Uh, he's a linguist from the Language Office of East Java, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology. And uh, uh, I welcome. Uh, uh, Thank you so much for the opportunity. Let me scare my screen now. Okay, uh, this presentation is a part of our ongoing research in, on Indonesian multilingualism, and I'm presenting uh, for my two other colleagues. So in this presentation, I would like to talk about translation practices into many indigenous languages in Indonesia. Sorry, I think I get it freezes. I think we all agree that losing a language is a significant loss for humankind because when a language dies, its unique vocabularies and spatial grammatical features are gone. 
Even if the language has been well documented and studied, we will not be able to find a real dynamic linguistic interaction between the speakers anymore. Uh, we lose this spatial intonation, rhythm, or musical pattern the native speakers produce in their actual communication. So shortly when a language dies, a particular part of our, our world dies as well. Related to it, it's never been easy for Indonesian people to keep our languages alive. Just to bring you the picture of how serious it is, we have more than 700 indigenous languages. 668 are documented, but not necessarily studied. Of those 600, only 71 languages have been identified in terms of their vitality. The results are 11 languages are dead, four are critically endangered, 19 severely endangered, two definitely endangered, 16 are threatened with extinction and only 19 are safe. There has been no information yet about the other 597. We are still working on it. Uh, and considering this huge number of languages, there has always been a question for Indonesian. Are we really able to actually preserve these languages? Of course we can, and we really want to be optimistic with that. But again, with the real situation, we would like to raise the next question. Is there a potential effective way to preserve our, indig our indigenous languages in Indonesia, remembering that huge financial support and long-term efforts are usually expected for a language preservation? Responding to those questions, first, we would like to motivate ourselves by firmly hold the idea that one important factor in developing personal and cultural identity is our first language. Therefore, we need to keep them, uh, we need to keep them timelessly available. Second, in this talk, I'd like to illustrate that translation, particularly the one using digital platform, can be an effective strategy for language preservation. We assume that through the translation practices, we can keep an indigenous language passed along from the older generation to the younger. That way we can hope that the numbers of the speakers will not decline. The translation results can motivate people to continuously access their language. When the results are presented in a digital platform, people can also get used to a new domain and media. Another potential advantage is that the possibility to use the translation results as materials for education and literacy. We certainly hope that the translation results will make people enjoy reading in their own language and find that their language can be presented nicely in written forms in digital platforms. This hopefully can be a motivation to respect their own language more. And finally, the translation results will definitely be natural and actual materials for documentation. Next, I would like to discuss the existing translation practices involving indigenous languages in Indonesia. So translation practices into indigenous languages have been exercised in many places in Indonesia. One common type is the bilingual public, uh, public name signs, usually presented in Indonesian language and one local language. Some places like Yogyakarta, Central Java, and Bali even provide the translation in native alphabets, since Javanese and Balinese have their native uh, writing systems. When the COVID-19 situation is getting worse in Indonesia, the government initiated a translation project for the protocol guidance. The government thought that they need to change their communication strategy since information related to COVID-19 was not well received by the people. The government decided to translate the COVID-19 protocol guidance into many indigenous languages, 77 languages according to the National Language Agency. This is, I think, the first massive indigenous language translation project in a very short period ever happened in Indonesia. This is uh, the illustration of the translation project. And this is the illustration of the indigenous language involved in the translation project. This translation project was organized by the National Language Agency through its 30 provincial language offices throughout Indonesia. The results are available in PDFs and distributed online. However, we still think that the translation practices done so far are still not enough to really preserve a language. The translation practices I have shown you don't seem to target particular readers, especially younger generations. Uh, the practices result of kind of general audience, uh, audiences, which usually are adults and not interesting enough for kids. We need translation practices or that specifically uh, or that specifically targets younger generation. 
Chitral literature translation into indigenous languages of Indonesia, in fact, have been practiced, but according to our observation, we only found such digital practices in a platform called Story Weaver. This is a platform particularly aimed for providing multilingual children's books. Story Weaver is ability to Pratham Books, a nonprofit children's book uh, publisher from India. The statistic, the statistic shows that all of these translations are accessed and read by internet users. Therefore, it is a good sign of indigenous language digital preservation in Indonesia. Since the readers are children, perhaps they can't read the stories by themselves, but they have their parents or any other member of the family to assist or do the storytelling. In Indonesia, it's very common for people to practice mixed marriage. Therefore, it's possible for us to employ a strategy called one parent, one language. Each parent communicates with their child or children using his or her native language, and therefore the child or children will, uh, will be kept exposed to their parents' native languages. From the data collected from Story Weaver website or more, uh, of more than 700 languages in Indonesia, only six indigenous languages of Indonesia could be found. In this platform, we can find, uh, we can find approximately uh, 1,835 short texts that can be translated to other languages. However, not all translated to the six indigenous languages. Around two, uh, 200 short texts uh, are, are, were translated and used as data in this article. So these are illustrations of some short stories for children in Story Weaver translated to the six indigenous languages. So among the six indigenous languages of Indonesia found in Story Weaver, Japanese has the highest number with 197 short stories available. The others are below 50 with the least short story is from boundaries, only one story. Japanese also has the most readers with more than 4,000 readers. On the other hand, it's quite surprising that Sundanese version with its less than 50 short stories has been read by 2,400 readers, more than half of the number Japanese has. Minangkabo and Balinese have hundreds of readers, while Daya and Banjaris only have tens. In terms of reading levels, again, Japanese has the readings available in all levels provided by Story Weaver. There is no emergent level reading supplied in Minangkabo. Uh, Sundanese doesn't have any reading for level four. Balinese lacks of emergent and level four. No level three and four are provided in Daya language and the only one story available in Banjari is for level one. So to close this presentation, I'd like to deliver some remarks. Despite of the stories that is translate, uh, they are translated and available in Story Weaver website or platform, only six languages are available in Story Weaver out of more than 700 languages in Indonesia. This is only 1% of the total number of indigenous or local languages in Indonesia implies that we need to encourage more people to have their indigenous languages accessible in Story Weaver. And Indonesian stakeholders should encourage speakers of other indigenous languages in Indonesia to take part in translating stories to their own languages, either by providing simple trainings or distributing best practices. Another recommendation is to develop our own digital platform or website as a means of Indonesian indigenous languages database. This database will be useful for being accessible for people from all over the world. And finally, we haven't found any sign language used for this children literature. Variation of sign languages have been used by the devs in Indonesia and any translation project into indigenous language, I think my, uh, may not leave them behind since sign languages are also parts of our multilingualism. Thank you and happy International Translation Day. Thank you, thank you very much. This is all. In fact, uh, uh, we are slightly uh, five minutes uh, past my uh, time. I I can uh, only uh, in, in summary I can say they are all very rich presentations, and uh, we hardly have time to uh, interact because uh, there is a paucity of time. But then I think uh, uh, possibly uh, this can be shared. Uh, in the links so that everybody will benefit from this. And I must thank every uh, 
uh, speaker. They have very rich presentations. And uh, I, I'm also apologize if I had, uh, you know, tried to curtail your time. It is the, uh, you know, part of the problem that a moderate has to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet, for uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Siva, for moderating. Thank you. The theme of our next session is language policy frameworks, and the moderator is Dr. Zadiala Brabakar Rao, Professor of Linguistics at the University of Hyderabad, Bureau Convener of UNESCO's Information for All program. Prabhakar has written over 60 international and national publications and has edited 10 books. During this very important session, Next slide, slide, please. We will hear from many esteemed colleagues about the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, UNESCO's Courier Magazine, UNESCO's Communication and Information Sector, an amazing effort in creating an association of Indigenous interpreters in Mexico, and our very own International Federation of Translators who forged this year's theme, A World Without Barriers. Prabhakar? Ravakar, are you muted? Oh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I, I welcome all the speakers to the second session on language frame, policy frameworks. I also request as a timekeeper to, to maintain the time and make their presentation within, complete their presentations within 10 minutes. First, I invite uh, Ms. Aluki Kotere from Canada, who is president of Nona with Tungana Vic Inc. and also co-chair of the Global Task Force for IDIL. Now uh, the floor is yours, Ms. Aluki. Uh, Prabhakar, I, I don't believe she has managed to uh, get online. I don't see her online. Perhaps then we what can... we will do is we will go to the second one. If she joins, then we can uh, take her uh, later. So uh, now may I request Miss Agnes Burden, uh, who is going to make her presentation on From One World to Another, special of the UNESCO career and translation. Uh, let me briefly introduce her. She is uh, editor, Agnes Burden is the editor in chief of the UNESCO career, UNESCO, a journalist by training. And also she has uh, worked in UN mission in Haiti. And then uh, in the UNESCO office, she is presently in the UNESCO office for 12 years. And also now editor in chief, the UNESCO career. Now I request Agnes Burden to take the floor. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for uh, for uh, inviting me. Um, as uh, as you said, I'm the um, I'm the editor in chief of the Courier, so I'm not. Um, uh, a practitioner. I'm not an academic, so um, uh, my um, the reason why I was kindly invited to participate by by my uh, UNESCO colleagues uh, is that um, we uh, devoted one of our uh, latest issue of the UNESCO Courier uh, on translation. It is indeed called uh, "From One Word to Another." And um, uh, just maybe a few words uh, about the magazine itself, because uh, in the context of the Word Translation Day, it uh, might be uh, interesting to remind that this, uh, this uh, magazine 
um, which is the, the, the organization's flagship magazine uh, since uh, 1948, um, is um, multilingual since the, its very beginning. Uh, it was uh, first published in French, English, and Spanish uh, in uh, 1948. And um, the number of editions has grown uh, to reach uh, uh, 38 languages at, at its uh, highest in the late uh, 80s. And um, unfortunately, it's not so high today, but it's, um, it is now available in the six UN languages. Uh, so the, the question of translation has always been at the, at the heart, the very heart of our daily activities and, and uh, challenges. Um, the reason why we, we, we chose to, to devote one of our issues to translation was that, um, apart from the fact that we are uh, dealing with, the, with translation, uh, as I said, uh, in our daily work, is that um, uh, the, the magazine is, is, uh, is aimed at a, at a wide audience. And um, we have a, a journalistic approach uh, dealing with the, the uh, UNESCO friendly uh, topics. And we, we realize that uh, translation is, is not often um, dealt with in the, in the, in the media. Um, so um, uh, the, 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 our dossier, the, our um, a wide angle section explores several aspects of, the, of this uh, topic, like uh, how challenging it is to translate humor or uh, the benefits and limits of uh, translation systems, for instance, and many other articles. And of course, um, the, the magazine covers the, uh, the, the question of translating um, indigenous language. It is the, the this topic is uh, is reflected uh, in two in two articles. Um, the first one reports on uh, a book published last year in Mexico, uh, which is called Intraducibles and Translatable. Um, it is signed it is signed by uh, Irma Pineda, a Zapotec poet and a representative of uh, indigenous people to the UN. And uh, as a poet and a did Saza speaker, sorry for the pronunciation, um, she's uh, much concerned about the, the decline of um, indigenous language in, uh, in her country due to the, the predominance of uh, Spanish, uh, which, is used for, which is used for all uh, official literary and uh, educational purpose. So the book, she, um, she, she, she designed, uh, collects words and expression from uh, 33 languages of uh, Mexico's uh, indigenous people uh, and um, that do not have a Spanish translation because they, they deal with the sensation, emotion, tradition, and can't really be captured in one, in one word. So um, each word has a, has a corresponding illustration that sheds light on, on its untranslatable nature. Uh, I give you an example, uh, the notion of chuchumi, which means to, to stare in the void in uh, Akateko language, a ritual dedicated to the earth that consists in placing stones in the river to ensure the, the health of a newborn, for instance. In, chuchumi means all this in a word. And uh, so there's uh, an illustration in the book uh, explaining all this notion. Um, of course, the, 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 the purpose of this book and what is reflected in, in this article, in this uh, Korea story, is not a, a question of a semantic vocabulary. The idea is that these words collecting among elders find a place in, uh, in everyday life and contribute to a better understanding of um, indigenous culture. So this, this was one of, of the, the, uh, the article um, um, related to, to um, the, the challenge of uh, translating indigenous uh, languages 
in in this uh, in in this uh, in Mexico. Um, the second article is about the uh, what uh, one of the person quoted uh, in the article uh, called the decolonization of science, and uh, it deals with the difficulty to translate scientific terms um, in in um, indigenous language. Maybe I can share the link up. Um, sorry, I've just shared the link to to the to the magazine to this issue. Um, so yeah, um, not having the words to discuss scientific or technical issues is a problem that that uh, people in um, in Africa with an estimated of uh, 2,000 indigenous language face every day. Uh, one of the examples um, uh, mentioned in the article, it's, it's, uh, it's the uh, experience of a journalist, a South African journalist, uh, explaining that uh, in Zulu, uh, there is no word for a fossil or even dinosaur. So he tried to find something that was close to to describe to, to to write an article, but uh, kind of struggled and uh, ended up with a an, an expression in Zulu meaning I mean, not an expression. I mean a, a, a sentence saying "all bones found in the ground." So um, this uh, this uh, this experience uh, by this uh, this uh, scientific journalist. Uh, was to introduce the, the, the project called Masakane, uh, created in, uh, in, in 2019 by African researchers from across the continent. Uh, it is a non-profit organization focused on developing language technology for African language. It is, it is uh, made of uh, machine learning experts, linguists, engin engineers, political scientists, and um, they're working on a translation tool able to translate, uh, at least at the beginning, six African languages, Swahili, Igbo, Lingala, Yoruba. Um, and um, so it should be uh, operational in the, if I remember well, um, next, uh, next year. Um, and in the meantime, they're also translating the abstract of um, of scientific uh, papers in these uh, three um, African languages, so that um, they start to have a corpus of uh, of um, uh, scientific terms that uh, that can be um, uh, used in those uh, languages, um, and um, um, so. Uh, this uh, article, uh, among many others, can be found in the, in our issue. I also mention um, it's a it's a bit older now, but uh, it was uh, an issue published in uh, in uh, 2019 at the occasion of the International Year of uh, Indigenous Language, and uh, where you there's also um, an interesting piece. Um, by Mini Degawan, who is the director of the Indigenous and Traditional Peoples Program at Converse, uh, Conservation International in the US, uh, which is called Knowledge and Hope, uh, and is uh, that is really interesting on the on the on the on the topic among many others. So, um, uh, well, of of course. Uh, um, I recommend the, the, you to, to, to read uh, this uh, issue on translation if you have time and if you, um, it is available online. Uh, you can subscribe for free and um, uh, voila, I think I'm, I'm done with my presentation. Oh. Thank you, Ms. Agnes Burden, for completing your presentation within the time. We will take the questions uh, at the end. And now uh, I request uh, Ms. JNF Varogol Varoglu, uh, who is a program specialist, uh, communication and information sector, UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you very much for the floor. 
I will share my screen. Please. And dear colleagues, thank you very much for this kind invitation. I'm the program specialist responsible for technologies and education in the communication and information sector of UNESCO. And uh, I am going to speak to you today about the UNESCO OER recommendation, UNESCO recommendation on open educational resources. And the reason I'm going to speak about this is because there is a very strong element about multilingualism and uh, language use in this document. And there are direct links to this, to, to the recommendation, uh, through the recommendation which my colleague uh, Ingarda uh, Kassinskaita mentioned in her introduction also, which is on multilingualism. So I will um, just take you through, first take you through the recommendation so you have an idea about the context. And then I propose to take you into an issue, into an example of when we have actually gone into translation and contextualization of a course that started in New Zealand and ended up in Senegal. And from there to tell you some of the larger UN issues that are involved in this regard. So, uh, let's see. So first of all, in terms of these instruments uh, and this instrument in particular, it is linked, the overarching framework that we're working on is of course the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in this regard, Article 19, which is about the right to receive and impart information through any media regardless of frontiers. And of course, Article 26, which is the right to education. We're also focusing on UNESCO's commitment to the free exchange of ideas and the sharing of knowledge using technologies, which is part of our constitution. Now, this is what this recommendation looks like. This is what the um, instrument, which I'm going to talk to you about in the next eight, nine minutes will be all about. It's on our website, you can find it. You can go into the website, type in you know, the name of the recommendation, legal instruments, and you'll have it. Um, this, the next uh, image that showed up on your screen just now is a list of similar recommendations that have happened over 30 years. There are only 12 or so, it's a dozen recommendations in this area. So just to let you know that it's, um, it's a recommendation is a very, um, it's a very serious matter for UNESCO member states. It's very hard to get it in, in get, it, get it adopted. And when it's adopted, it stays adopted forever, basically. And it's um, a recommendation is a normative instrument. It's a legal instrument. And it's what it means semantically, it recommends that member states take actions in a certain area and report back to UNESCO every four years on it. The value of this is that it puts a certain topic onto the policy level at the highest level of member states. Every, and every four years, it requires that member states are able to respond to UNESCO on it. So what you have, what's interesting about this recommendation is that you have a very clear definition of what it is, an open educational resource. It's any resource. So it's a book, it's a, it's a video, it could be um, a lecture, anything, but it's open on an, it's available on an open license, which allows it to be shared, reshared, and, um, and uh, reused and repurposed and adapted uh, openly. It's a very quick slide here, but you have a large list of stakeholders. And you can see many of the stakeholders are many of the people who have spoken in the discussion today also. So you have your typical uh, classic educational stakeholders, and you also have cultural institutions such as libraries, archives, museums, the publishers, the public private sector, etc. What we're talking about here is an open license. It's an example of what the open license is. So we're talking about mainly the most common one is the Creative Commons license, which gives users the right to do a certain number of actions. As you can see, it has three levels, machine readable, human readable, and a legal code. I think this might be common knowledge for most people, but I just wanted to put it out there. An example of where it looks like, it's also the, the UNESCO Courier is, I think, openly licensed, if I'm not mistaken. All UNESCO publications have to be openly licensed. You'll see here that it's a CC by SA. And here, this is how you know if something is an OER. 
Now, this recommendation has five areas. It talks about five areas, and the one that's where I'm going to focus on is the one that's in gold. Um, the first area, though, I just want to put it into a larger context so that it can uh, just to have a look bird's eye view first. Um, the first area of action is, of course, capacity building. The recommendation advises stakeholders that they should understand, uh, they should take a number of actions to show the added value of OER, to have the digital skills necessary to create access, reuse, redistribute OER, openly licensed platforms, interoperation policy. It's about incentives and policies to support the implementation of open licensing. Um, I'm jumping the one in gold, but then the other one is on sustainability. So making sure the learners and teachers don't shoulder the cost of, uh, of, um, of learning materials and international cooperation. Now, going back to the gold, um, the, the middle the, in the heart of this recommendation is quality, multilingual and inclusive OER. And it focuses on multilingualism, accessibility for all persons, regardless of language, or, or condition of living, whether it's a rural, it's urban, um, online, offline, support for public investments to support accessibility, and then issues of quality. This is a really very wordy, wordy, wordy um, slide, but it's, I've done this on purpose. This is what it says in the recommendation about multilingualism. It says that there should be that learners in formal, non-formal contexts, irrespective of inter alia, all these factors residing in conflict or natural in conflict zones or natural disasters, basically everybody should have uh, access to uh, quality, equitable OER. And this is, when it comes to language, there's a call for needs for material, that it meets the needs and material circumstances, including language and modalities for accessing it, and linguistically relevant, create in local languages, particularly in indigenous languages, which are less used, under-resourced and endangered. I think that's the heart of our discussion here. Ensuring the principle of gender equality, non-discrimination, accessibility, inclusiveness is reflected in strategies. This is what it says in the recommendation adopted by 193 member states. That is all, every single member state by consensus. Um, so we did, we tried, we put it into action last year. We did a, we did a, an activity with a, a foundation which is called OERU, it's in New Zealand, and they work in English. And they, um, they have a course that's on open licensing. It's a 400 page course if you were to print out the course. It's an online course on a learning ma management system. And we took this course, the first step we did was we, um, the, 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 our partners in New Zealand gave the text of the course which was very difficult. And I have to bring this up because this is something that I think has not been mentioned. We're talking about a course that was on an LMS. Therefore, in order to get the course and be able to translate it, most translators work on paper or Word. So we actually had to get the entire course into Word from an LMS. We gave it to UNESCO Translation Services. This, these, we have professional translators, the highest quality at UNESCO that translate all our documents all the time into English and French for our uh, official events, but also have the capacity to do it into the other five languages of the UN, other four languages of the UN. So uh, Russian, uh, Arabic, Spanish, Chinese. This, but we gave them to the French translators and it came back about the equivalent of, in French of these 400 pages in English. And that was just the beginning of everything um, because while the translation was professionally done at the highest UN international level, it was not enough for us to actually use it. Um, the reason for this is because the subject matter was about uh, open licensing, which is a legal matter. And it was also uh, done technically, but it needed to be contextualized and adapted 
to the format of the LMS. So we put together a working group with ICDE, which is um, an NGO based in Norway that has been a partner of UNESCO since 1967. The Université Numérique France, which is a, a body, it's an NGO that's linked to the Ministry of Higher Education and its goal, its uh, mission is to mutualize resources on, between in French, between French universities in Frank and also in the Francophonie. A working group of governmental and institutional experts in for Africa and in Europe. And we put it up for comments. It was reviewed. There were a lot of comments, a lot of reviews, and we had to go through a, a number of issues, which I'll go into on the next slide. And then after nine months, which is about the time it takes to make a human being, there was the uh, course was available and adopted by the University of Virtu oh, There was an iteration of the course given by the University Virtual of Senegal in French. Now, this sounds even, it was much more complicated than even what I saw, what I just said. Um, the issues that were addressed in this process of actually contextualizing the course into another language, and it's not an indigenous language, it's not a lesser known, it's not a lesser spoken language, it's French. But nonetheless, this was the, the issues that were done, was the, the technical issues of copyright versus intellectual property, the concepts that we're talking about were not the same between the two languages. Uh, one of the things has to do with law and common law about uh, perpetual rights and revocable rights. There was the vocabulary that would needed to be changed, even though it was already in French, it had to still be, um, still be, uh, adapted. And then finally, the issue of the resolution of conflicts. This is about litigation. This is about copyright licensing. So the issue, the way that litigation was done was also this had to be changed within the two, um, two versions. Yes, what came out of this? To conclude. Yes, I am concluding. Uh, the, what came out of this is the importance of linguistic ad adaptation, cultural adaptation, the use, the issue of technology to, uh, platforms and that what they have in terms of the challenges they pose, because a lot of the information is now in some languages is actually digital and uh, the content. Uh, as I conclude, I just want to give you a heads up that this recommendation is going to be, is already at the UN level, it's being recognized as was part of the Transforming Education Summit, and therefore the issues in the recommendation are coming to a very high level of discussion also, and multilingualism is a key one. Um, if you would like to know more about what we're doing, there is a link and I'll put it into the chat. You'd be very much welcome to join the dynamic coalition that we have around this recommendation that looks at all the work that we're doing around it. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Jaina Baroglu for, for your very good presentation, quite informative and uh, exciting. Now, the third speaker today we have with us is Mr. Hector Santiela Barrera. Uh, he is uh, pursuing his doctorate in social anthropology. And also he is uh, board of directors of Association of Interpreters and Translators in Community Public Services. Uh, and and uh, he is uh, from Mexico. Yeah, now the floor is of Mr. Hector. I also would like to add that uh, uh, Hector will be speaking in Spanish and he will have interpreters interpreting for him uh, consecutively right after he speaks. Please, Hector, the floor is yours. Pues muy buenos muy, muy buenos Muchas gracias. Este, muy buenos días a todas y a todos. Pues agradezco esta invitación que yo creo que es muy importante en este día de hacer una pequeña reflexión. ¿En qué aspecto? En el aspecto de llevar y reflexionar exactamente lo que hemos estado platicando y he estado escuchando con los compañeros y miembros que nos acompañan en este 
pues, este análisis que tenía que ser muy importante hacia el mundo entero, por la razón académica, por la reflexión de técnicas, por la reflexión de conciencia también que tenemos que hablar, por ahí hablaron de la conciencia y creo que es algo muy importante de decir que es muy importante mencionar que los intérpretes es un puente, pero ahora vamos a hablar sobre lo que vendría siendo los pueblos indígenas y que en México me corresponde, porque hemos estado pues, trabajando aproximadamente en la organización más o menos ocho años, pero eh, me he involucrado en toda mi vida, eh, aproximadamente unos 40 años trabajando en instituciones y entonces y hemos reflexionado exactamente esta temática que es muy necesario la interpretación. Pues para entonces ah, empezar. Y don Héctor, yo, yo puedo sí. interpretar. Sí, 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 gracias. Uh, well, first of all, I would just like to uh, extend my greeting to everyone who is here present today and uh, thank you for the opportunity to offer this reflection to you. Uh, it is important to reflect on all of these different aspects and consider the different areas that I've heard my colleagues discussing today with regard to al analysis of all of these different areas, the academic, the technical, the scientific, and to open our awareness. I believe that it's very important to emphasize that the interpreters that we work with, we are bridges to communication. Um, but just to mention a bit about what we've been doing in Mexico, we have been working um, in the field of this uh, indigenous interpreter and translator association now for eight years. But I personally have been working in this field for my entire life. I've been working um, in, in these different areas for approximately 40 years now. And so I would just like to offer uh, my reflection on our experience. Adelante. Gracias. Bueno, para empezar entonces estaremos este, diciendo de nuestra organización, de la intervención que va a ser que hemos vivido como asociación. Esta asociación está constituida por tres miembros, que uno es por la doctora Georgian Weller, que es doctora en, so en sociolingüística, Alejandra Hernández, que es este, socióloga y su servidor como antropólogo. Este, esta breve intervención aborda la expresión que hemos vivido como asociación y base de la intención y suma de voluntades. Dicha ayuda se ha volcado en diferentes acciones que contribuyen a la profesionalización de intérpretes y traductores comunitarios desde 2016. Personas hablantes de idiomas indígenas nacionales quienes se han formado de modo empírico, ya que en México aún no hay una licenciatura y su rayo licenciatura de traducción e interpretación en lenguas indígenas, ni siquiera como carrera técnica a nivel superior, se han intentado exactamente hacer un, eh, en, dentro de las universidades interculturales, pero un tipo de pues, este, maestrías, pero tenemos que tener que volcar a las bases. Ya que en México aún no hay una licenciatura de traducción e interpretación en lenguas indígenas, ni siquiera como carrera técnica. Para esto, los profesionistas existen y también existen intérpretes y traductores comunitarios que se preocupan por apoyar en situaciones desvan, 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 desventajas en sus, que son sus paisanos. Por ejemplo, estar en un proceso jurídico privados de su libertad o que no entienden y acceden sus derechos, asimismo que estén en una urgencia médica y no pueden comunicarse. Kelly, no sé si... Sí. Yes. sí. Uh, we will be speaking briefly about the experience that we have gone through as an association. Our association is made up of three members. First, Dr. Jordana Weller, a social linguist 
as well as Alejandra uh, Hernandez, who is a sociologist, and myself, who uh, is an anthropologist. Um, our, uh, on the basis of our intention and the work that we are offering and desire to be of service to our community, uh, this has brought rise to different actions that have contributed to the professionalization of um, interpreters and translators at the community level since 2016. Uh, indigenous language speakers in uh, Mexico uh, have been largely taught by practical experience in because in our country there is no university degree and I really underline that the notion of a bachelor's or university degree in indigenous language translation or interpretation there have been attempts to establish higher level degrees master's degrees etc but uh, we really need to get it just to a basic level of formal education program uh, we don't even have a degree of this nature at the technical or associates degree level nevertheless we do have individuals who are practicing this profession they are community translators and interpreters who are dedicated to offering support to their neighbors who find themselves in situations of great disadvantage, uh, for example, facing uh, criminal charges, uh, jail time, they may not know or be able to exercise their rights or they could find themselves with serious medical need and the ability, inability to communicate. Partimos de reconocer a la sociedad mexicana y de todo el mundo como multicultural y plurilingüe, de donde la persona intérprete y traductora representa un papel especial e importante con capacidad de vincular y unir las realidades de dos culturas diferentes. La gran mayoría de, de las veces su trabajo o intervención casi no es notorio y precisamente de ello se trata pues a lograr esa invisibilidad en el proceso comunicativo. Se logra el éxito de su trabajo, la dedicación, análisis y estudio del tema que se desarrolla, social, jurídico, médico, político, ambientalista, educativo y sus técnicas adecuadas y sus rayos técnicas lograrán el resultado deseado que es transmitir el mensaje y sobre todo que sea comprendido por parte que hablan idiomas diferentes. A darnos cuenta de que esta problemática para la interpretación y traductores era una falta de capacitación, comenzamos a indagar aún más así y así surgió de manera de trabajar junto con ellos. We, we can start out by acknowledging the fact that Mexican society, just like society across the world, is both multicultural and multilingual. And it, interpreters and translators play a very important and special role with the ability to link and bring together the realities of two different cultures. In the vast majority of cases, their work and intervention, their contributions uh, practically go unnoticed. And that is precisely the point because uh, when interpreters and translators manage to quote unquote disappear from the communicative process they are succeeding in doing their job through dedication analysis and study of the topics at hand, including social, legal, medical, political, environmental, educational uh, topics, and more, along with a, a appropriate technique, which I emphasize uh, the notion of technique, interpreters can reach their desired result, which is both communicating a message to individuals who speak different languages, and more importantly, making sure that there is understanding between those two groups. When our association realized that 
our translators and interpreters were facing this problem of a lack of proper education and training, we began investigating further. And from that was born our means of working alongside our country's translators and interpreters of indigenous languages. Consultar en la organización de intérpretes y traductores en servicios públicos y comunitarios, escuchamos a los intérpretes y traductores en lenguas indígenas de México mediante foros anuales en los que se manifiestan de manera libre quienes llevan a cabo estos oficios. Primero, esta organización se ha dado la tarea de unir diferentes aliados, como son las organizaciones de intérpretes indígenas que existen a nivel nacional y sus agremiados, a intérpretes certificados o no, pero que tienen la experiencia en el tema de servicio público y en el ámbito comunitario. Asimismo, invitamos a las instituciones públicas y académicas y a otras organizaciones civiles. También se han unido de manera personal varios intérpretes y traductores en idiomas extranjeros y de señas que con su amplia experiencia nos han aportado conocimientos para ir siguiendo con el trabajo comunitario en servicio público. Así generamos las temáticas. que van guiando las o se hace la interpretación clínica o médica en México 2016 resultó que hay intérpretes certificados y administración y procuración de justicia pero no en salud sin embargo los primeros hacen interpretación médica ello, ello impactó de manera positiva pues a partir de ahí las instituciones que se encargan de certificar los a los intérpretes indígenas en México, en México, Instituto Nacional de Lenguas Indígenas, Secretaría de Educación Pública y el Consejo Nacional de Normalización y Certificación de Competencias Laborales abrieron el tema de certificación para programas de salud. Entre 2016 y 2017 era una necesidad para los intérpretes y traductores indígenas reconocerse saber cuántos eran y en dónde se encontraban. Gracias a la sinergia que hicimos con la Fundación Italia Moraita y con American Interpreters, pudimos dar respuesta a su petición a través del estudio de la encuesta Traducción e Interpretación en México 2017. Consecutivamente hemos atendido en medida nuestras posibilidades cada una de las grandes necesidades que nuestros aliados los intérpretes y traductores indígenas manifiestan en estos ejercicios de consulta. In our work with the uh, as the organization of community and public service interpreters and translators, we have listened to uh, the needs of our indigenous language interpreter translators across Mexico through the mechanism of annual forums in which these uh, stakeholders are allowed to speak freely about their experiences with this profession. Uh, first, uh, having undertaken the task of bringing together different allies, uh, we, we worked with organizations like Indigenous Interpreters, at the national level and their members, we brought in um, both certified and uncertified interpreters with experience in the communi community and public sector, as well as uh, extending invitations to public and academic institutions and civil organizations. From there, Several sign and foreign language interpreters and translators have personally offered their contributions to our project, uh, contributing their um, vast experience and knowledge to guide our group of new interpreters in the community and public service sector. This is the procedure that we follow to determine our next steps. By way of example, we have our first forum, which was titled, uh, How is uh, Medical and Clinical Interpretation Undertaken in Mexico? That was in the year 2016. 
And the conclusion we drew was that there are uh, legal interpreters certified in, in their area in our country, but there are not certified healthcare interpreters, despite the fact that so many interpreters begin their work in the medical field. This conclusion did have a positive impact. From there, our certifying bodies in Mexico who offer certification to indigenous interpreters, which are the um, National Institute of Indigenous Languages, the Department of Public Education, and the National Board of Ed Certification and Education in Workplace Competency did uh, take up the topic of healthcare certification. Also, between 2016 and 2017, we learned how much our Indigenous interpreters and translated translators really needed to learn about one another, how many there were working in their area and where they were located through synergy that was created um, with the Moriaira Italia Foundation and American Interpreter. We were able to answer those calls and um, we did a study of the translation and interpretation survey in Mexico in 2017. From there, uh, to our greatest degree possible, we have attended to the significant needs of our um, language service providers in indigenous languages. And uh, we've helped with what they have indicated they need in these areas. Re resultados palpables. El primer... Berrera, ¿me sí. puedes concluir? Sí, voy concluyendo. Señor, señor Héctor, sí. We are, I'm about to conclude. Yeah, thank you. Resultados, resultados palpables. El primer foro también nos guió para construir el primer caso taller básico en intérpretes de salud y fue impartido en línea, lo cual obtuvimos interesantes materiales bilingües por el apoyo de la interpretación. El estudio de la encuesta sobre la traducción de intérpretes de México 2017, como ya mencionaba, no tiene procedentes en, tiene procedentes en mi país. Fue una investigación muy ad hoc al gremio hacia el día de hoy que contenía vigente de la información abierta disponible que podré, que podré en el chat y la liga para la versión digerible. Para todo esto, en cuanto al foro tradicional de escribir y hablar en lenguas, y asimismo el tercer foro y, y hoy hasta el último que vamos llevando sería hasta el sexto foro. Integramos a jóvenes celtales o chiles a diferentes de gran diversidad y por ello desde nuestra participación como sociedad civil consideramos que el gobierno debe tener un proyecto a largo plazo y no solo políticas sin continuidad, evaluación de seguimiento y creemos fervicentemente que debe de haber respeto a la diversidad cultural lingüística de los pueblos y permitirles su desarrollo en todos los ámbitos públicos, además de que se fomente su uso. Así, celebramos el día de hoy, el Día Internacional del Traductor, quienes ejercen una profesión y lo hacen conforme a su derecho lingüístico. Thank you. Uh, real world results that we have obtained uh, through our series of forums, we are up to our sixth at this point in time. Our first forum, for example, led to the development of our first course, a uh, basic uh, workshop in healthcare interpretation, which was offered online and which uh, used very interesting and useful bilingual material to help our translators and interpreters. I've already mentioned Mexico's 2017 study of the translation and interpretation survey. It was a rather ad hoc study of our membership, but it still is uh, up and available today. Uh, and I will put the downloadable link in our uh, chat here today. Like I said, we've moved on to our sixth forum 
And one success we've had is that we have integrated young Tzetzal and Sotzil interpreters and have for the very first time offered simultaneous interpretation via booths through the um, indigenous theater group. Uh, and so those are all experiences that we have had in, as uh, interpreters of indigenous languages. And because of what we are experiencing, our position is that um, the government of our country must make a long-term commitment to creating uh, projects to support our up and coming interpreters of indigenous languages and not just create um, policies that are based on short-term political whims. We fervently believe that there must be respect for the cultural and linguistic diversity of our indigenous peoples, and they must be allowed to uh, participate in all public uh, forums and, and, and they must um, promote use of our first languages. So for this reason, we celebrate, celebrate today's International Day of the Translator and we recognize those who practice this profession and uh, in accordance with their linguistic rights. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hector Berrera, for sharing your experience of trans of interpreting indigenous uh, indigenous languages, and I also thank uh, the madam who has translated very good, very good translation, ma'am. Thank you. I thank you both. Next speaker is Ms. Ms. Elson Rodriguez. Uh, she is uh, president of International Federation of Translators. Australia, and she has been strongly advocating multilingualism, multiculturalism, and cultural and linguistic diversity and inclusion. She is going to speak on a world without barriers, how translation and interpreting navigate language as a barrier to sustaining culture, understanding, and lasting peace. Now, the floor is yours, ma'am. Good morning. Happy International Translation Day. My name is Alison Rodriguez. I'm from the New Zealand Society of Translators and Interpreters, and I'm president of the International Federation of Translators. And today, I'd like to speak to you about some of the ways in which uh, translating and interpreting uh, navigate language, language as a barrier to sustaining culture, understanding, and lasting peace. Now, this topic is taken from this year's theme from International Translation Day, which is A World Without Barriers. Since 1991, each 30th of September, the International Federation of Translators carefully chooses a theme and then celebrates International Translation Day on the Feast of St. Jerome, Bible translator and patron saint of translators. Since it was officially recognized by the UN General Assembly in 2017, International Translation Day has become even more widely celebrated and an important day for translators, interpreters and terminologists by bringing greater visibility and recognition for the profession. Translation plays a key political and cultural role in, multi in multilateralism and also is a conduit for multiculturalism, bringing many languages living together. Now, the, uh, the origin myth of the Tower of Babel tells us the story of why we have so many languages, or at least had so many languages, because we've lost so many. And ironically, it also uh, tells us how language is a barrier to communication itself. It symbolically highlights the power of language uh, to unite, or conversely, to confound cooperation. And it also it frames language as problematic. It begins as our superpower and then ends up as a barrier, a barrier to harmony and to progress. Translators and interpreters occupy that space between the languages, and we work as a conduit to overcome barriers and to revive communication. As essential actors in the dialogue, 
translators and interpreters connect worlds, whether it be in discussions around tables or in corridors, formal dinners or informal meetings, wherever cultures and nations meet, that's where you'll need translators and interpreters. Now, President Zelensky is an excellent communicator. And even though he speaks functional English, he knows that his message will be best understood if he uses a professional interpreter. He's very careful with his message because he knows how important it is. And therefore, in order to get it across, he usually uses his own professional interpreters. Because in diplomacy, your interpreter is your reputation abroad. But in humanitarian settings, your interpreter is your lifeline. Without them, non-English speakers will not understand what's going on and will not be understood. And Indigenous languages are particularly vulnerable in this respect. Indigenous languages provide us with an intergenerational transfer of intangible cultural heritage and knowledge. And this will be invaluable in facing the future global challenges. Accessing this knowledge requires the deep understanding of a translator or interpreter because they understand not just the language, but the cultures from whence they came. Translators and interpreters of Indigenous languages are often at the heart of cultural and linguistic activism and language revitalization through participating in the recovery of traditions and ceremonies or works of literature and art. But translation is a two way street translation from the minority language into the majority languages around it provide an awareness of the richness of Indigenous culture. And translation into the Indigenous and minority languages provides access and mitigates exclusion. But none of this can happen without the translators and interpreters who allow that participation, because for many, to participate in their language of proficiency requires using a translator or interpreter, and above all, the speakers of minority languages. Language rights, the right to use your own language as an integral expression of your identity and agency, are part of the human rights agenda. Linguistic rights are fundamental human rights, because they allow access to the other important rights, such as health, justice, or education. Quite often, there are few available translators and interpreters in minority languages, and services don't always have permanent language staff ready to assist Indigenous language users. There's also often no specific training given to help staff with the specific requirements or needs of working with Indigenous languages and cultures. Without translators and interpreters, many voices would not be heard, many collaborations would not materialize, and many dreams would not be realized. Research outlines the role of mother tongue-based education in increasing equitable outcomes across education, employment, justice, and healthcare. Translation enables community inclusion and empowerment by providing both access to information and services and a way for a community and its members to be heard. Now, increasing advances in technology have led many to believe that translators can be overtaken by machines. Yet we already know that unsupervised machines pose a real risk, especially in entrenching existing bias and dominance, the very issue that translation aims to mitigate. While Indigenous peoples can find creative uses for technology, access to that technology is important because that can also allow them to become the custodians of their own language and heritage. Artificial intelligence, machine translation and machine learning all pose additional risks for Indigenous languages on top of the risks for monolingual users. Machine translation is tone deaf. It's tone deaf to cultural differences and it's really difficult for it to deal with ambiguity. And all of this raises serious questions of the ethics and cultural rights over the use of the data. AI falls short where there is a lack of diversity in the training data, increasing the chances of exclusion and discrimination. Now, one of the downsides of this technology is that it's going to be limited in its effectiveness where there is little or no data because systems are based on data, on big data, which trains on itself. So that makes it a numbers game where there's less people, there's less data. And then that lack of data can sometimes translate into a lack of diversity and then becomes exclusion and discrimination, especially for Indigenous women. 
Indigenous languages will continue to be marginalized because they will lack the data. And those that do have it must work very hard to preserve its value for their own communities. Maori language broadcasters in New Zealand soon found themselves fending off corporate entities trying to appropriate their data, which they'd collected over decades. So therefore, guarding this data became a priority for them because the only people truly interested in or with the benefit from revitalizing the Maori language were the Maori people themselves. The global development agenda depends on a wide range of factors, economics, uh, sustainability, security, health and human rights, and environmental protection. And their successful delivery depends on equitable access to information and open dialogue, dialogue between individuals and communities, and a building of a genuine engagement in lasting relationships. And the role of translators, interpreters, and terminologists in this delivery cannot be underestimated. In the pandemic, those whose English language proficiency was limited through no fault of their own, found themselves with a 35% more likelihood of dying. So that basically made languages other than English a health risk, especially where an interpreter or access to translated information were not available. Exclusion and discrimination can be compounded by the status of the language and the difficulty in, attain, in, in obtaining an interpreter and, and for that particular language. Translators and interpreters and terminologists also mitigate language barriers to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. With these being the goals that are specifically rely on language access, Translation supports the Sustainable Development Goals by allowing access to education. And for example, we know that mother tongue education has been proven to improve student outcomes. It's also about access to healthcare, legal services, gender equality, just to give an example of where language services are essential. And yet language and language services are not part of deliverables in global development. Feedback exercises, such as the ongoing intercultural listening and collaborative learning of the NGOs that uh, are attempting to further develop service delivery couldn't happen without the interpreters and translators who help them with these listening exercises, for example. Global multilingual institutions and NGOs must recognize the importance of language in achieving their aims and begin to design coherent, sustainable linguistic policies early on. This would assist in the overarching language management and facilitate access. It would also address a range of other language issues and address entrenched biases of majority language dominance or the use of a lingua franca, which can exclude both users and staff. Translating and interpreting is essential for their work because it increases their reach and their effectiveness. Translators and interpreters of Indigenous languages are often the only way to access and store cultural wisdom and community history, and they're also essential in language preservation. Losing a language is not just the loss of language itself, but it can also mean a loss of family connection and community, as language is the key to understanding and navigating the complex social worlds for the communities in which they live. Losing the word for a particular relationship makes it difficult to understand how those relationships interact and interconnect. So translators, interpreters, and terminologists can overcome Babel. They can overcome language as a barrier to communication and therefore as a barrier to harmony, progress, and to building culture and unity and developing lasting peace. So FIT sends you its very warmest wishes for a very happy International Translation Day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And uh, now I hope that uh, Ms. Luki has joined. Can it? Uh, I believe she has recorded a video, but uh, I don't have access to it if uh, if she is here, maybe she can share it with us or if somebody else has it. I am looking and I have not received it. Okay. Maybe we can show it a little bit better if we receive it. Yeah. 
So now shall we close the session? Ah, okay. Then uh, uh, is the, I think uh, uh, we are running out of time. So uh, we cannot take questions. But however, I thank all the speakers for their wonderful presentation on wide ranging of issues related to translation, interpretation, and also sharing their experiences is a wonderful thing. And, and I also thank Jeanette for giving me this opportunity to chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhakar. Thank you very, very much. And all the speakers, thank you for joining the session, this uh, particular theme. Now we would go, we'll go to our next session, which features testimonials from indigenous translators, interpreters, and activists. Our first testimonial is from Ms. Alfreda Gasparillo Pineda, an indigenous interpreter of the Nahuatl language. She will share her experience as a professional indigenous interpreter. Luego nos toca Alfreda Gasparillo Pineda, Nuchan, Citlala Guerrero, México. No, Nantlato, Nahuatl. No, Niwan, Siwame, Huantlacame, Nimanuche, Quechante, Ipamuin, Tlaltipaque, Nevecho, Tlapaloa, Nican, Ipamuin, Calpan, y toca Guerrero, México. Nahuatl nos toca Alfreda Gasparillo Pineda, Nahuatl no Tlato, no Nantlato, Nahuatl. Ipamuin, Ilquit, y toca Campano Chicuepa Tlatulcin, no chique chica, huey tlali chante. No ne me chulos notas, que ni que cauinti siguame, guantinti pia tahuame derechos. Campa Chicuepa Tlatuli, Campa Tlacuiluli, ni man Campa Tlatuli. Campa ne me Campa Kila Guante Kiwake, Campa Kane me Guante Pacha, ni manos nunca Campa Tahuame, ti siguame ti Chicuepa Tlatuli. Todo me tiene que Maka matech la abuelita kan tiene que cual chima te selican campaxle campachas que tonte que panosque tiene que meter chas la abuelita quien la quitla quitlane o que se quitla came no hay que no hay que tiene que campa un ti ti te quitisque matech macacan guantino ti te quitiltisque no na fui ngam amat la fui lusli no chiva mapuasli caron tu se whisky no chivo maca matech la abuelita kan no hay que tener como te siguame, cuachas que cana, matico chica, campa cual se entusia whisky. No hay que tener como te siguame, tacuame. No hay que maca mate chatitlanica que tú fui ante ayuda, maca mate potopopolusque. Tago me tiene que ser seca matinemica, campa tacual chinca, ni man campa tacual can. Tago me te siguame más de la yuguilla que un un seque tacame. Tlacame no tlas yuguya, pero tzisiguame te más tlas yuguya. Tien casteo a tu coneguan, tien casteo a unigan capatichante, que maña huelita eso mucha. O con tome tineki, no chibun, en tlacón que tu hagan que ya no tlayuli, tineki no chibun tu derechos ni man garantías. No chibun, maca matech tlacayita, maca matech tlahuelitacan, cual si matech tlacayitacan, ni man cual si matech pipiacan, campa tlacume ticun tlacetit chiwa, y caun ticun copa tlatuli. Our next testimonial is from Mr. Ubaldo Pedro Mariscal, a legal and indigenous interpreter of the Mazatego language. He will share his experience as a professional indigenous interpreter. Ubaldo Pedro Uascani, 
Sakisima, Sakushikitima, Kuishashi <laughs> Our next testimonial is from Mr. Aksan, a musician from the People's Republic of China. He will share his insight on the necessity of national language art for national culture and inheritance. Um, <laughs> Petersome 我一直从事音乐制作工作在 2000年前後我蒙受了一個想法,就是尋找滿足民間的傳統歌謠,由於當代很多滿族人,其他的家庭都失去了用滿語交流的能力,甚至很多人對自己民族的母語一無所知。我也是這樣的一員。所以為了能
，与他们多年的交往和接触，从最初的陌生人之间的警惕，嗯、呃。他们当他们听到我说满语时候的惊喜啊，再到慢慢的熟悉，我们之间呢，这种也培养了相互的信任和亲密的感情。他们毫无保留的教给我的每一首歌谣，都是真实的存在于生活状态，就是生活状态还有劳动人民的心态性格的这种体现。这样的语言艺术的传播，相比单纯的书面语言教育传承，会更加生动。更让人直观了解语言背后的一种人文。经过多年搜集和整理呢，我制作并发表了其中一些满语音乐作品。首先是受到了很多满族人啊、年轻人的关注和喜爱，因为信息化的时代，他们看过了太多的其他民族精彩的文艺文化，对于自己民族文化上的空白，大家会感到一种失落，甚至是一种自卑。而满语歌曲呢，此时的出现有效的弥补了这一空白。经过我发表作品数量的提升。还有这个网络信息化的影响，我和满族歌谣的故事呢，被更多的人呢所熟知，甚至呢是很多是不是满族的朋友，包括很多国外的朋友，他们都来关注。我的满语歌曲除了发表和演出以外，也逐步的被一些影视剧作品、哎游戏、哎博物馆展出等各个领域使用。而语言专家的优势，它主要是在于针对学术领域的探讨和研究。语言的艺术呢？就是针对日常生活的传播和推广，嗯，它能够寻找更多的应用方式吧，使其具有实际意义的存活价值。事实上，也确实有很多人，嗯，因为听了我的一些满语歌曲，开始学习满文和满语。所以，在我看来，民族语言艺术的延续和传播，对民族语言文化的传承是必不可缺的一部分。我采访过的满语，呃，母语的老人，他们自己家的家庭。成员，你尤其是年轻的家庭成员，他们几乎都不会传承本民族语言，还有歌谣的演唱。老人们对此也感到很悲观。而现在的母语者呢，大多数都是已经八九十岁的，随着年龄的增长，我们也会慢慢失去他们，包括失去他们珍贵的声音。而这种情况不仅存在于满族，全球很多文化弱势的民族都存在这个情况。每一种语言和文化的存在。都为人类文明增添了一种色彩，也希望更多更多的人能加入咱们，使其得到延续的可能性，使世界文化保持多样性，能更加美丽。啊，你好。This concludes our testimonials.、Um, our next、uh, session's theme. Is civil and language rights, and I will be the moderator. In this session, we will hear from experts on the role of translation in times of crisis, how Canada's translation bureau created Indigenous workshops, what it means to be an Indigenous translator, the significance of translating into Indigenous literature, and the Samata judgment in India. Our first guest is Lucio Bagnolo, head of translation and language strategy in Amnesty International in Spain. He will be speaking to us about the role of translation in the context of human rights crisis. Hello. Hi everyone.、Uh, my name is Lucio Bagnolo, and I'm the head of translation and language strategy at Amnesty International, and I'm based in Madrid.、Uh, today, in this presentation, we will talk about the role of translation in the defense of human rights. So, as you all know,、uh, Amnesty International Global Impact、uh, depends on ensuring accurate, consistent, reliable, and credible timely output. So, it is precisely. The accuracy and timeliness of its、uh, research into allegation of human rights violation、uh, that has contributed to the、um, organization's 60 years history of exponential growth、um, and sustained leadership in the field of human rights.、Um, as the world's largest human rights organization, Amnesty plays a crucial role in responding to human rights violations around the world. And particularly key to this scope is the intersection between. Translation and the response to such crises at global level. It is indeed、um, its、uh, 
you know, the public denunciation of human rights violations and the desire to give the victims a voice that especially resonates with the role of transition um, and that transition plays in the context of human rights crisis. The importance of accurate and timely translation can be particularly observed um, in three main stages of the strategic approach taking crisis response management. Uh, the first one is well prepared and for or during the deployment of on the ground. Um, the second one, following interviews with victims, witnesses, uh, key stakeholders, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the third one is the most well known, I guess. Uh, it's when rolling out uh, the communications uh, advocacy products. Uh, uh, related to the launch of a uh, report uh, or another type of output. So in the first case, uh, you know, if we, we stop there, when we think of uh, the first case, in the first, the first case mainly involves uh, the broader meaning of translation, um, intended as linguistic and cultural transport from one language into another, uh, which can be in a written form, and uh, that is performed by trained professionals as well as by pro bono and sometimes untrained volunteer individuals. Uh, usually, um, the appointment of such linguistic mediators, uh, as I would call them, is based on recommendations from trusted um, interlocutors on the ground um, and takes into account the strict risk assessment framework, among other factors. Um, at this stage, translation basically uh, and typically takes the form of aid in communications, easing access, uh, and often being the first port of entry if we want to look at communities. So in the second case, written translation, so not oral, is an integral part of any post-mission activities, really. And uh, more specifically, I would say that it helps bridge the language gap in research evidence, for example, um, interviews with victims, uh, witnesses, testimonies and statements, internal mission um, notes, phone notes, uh, media files, uh, et cetera, uh, which are get, gathered in a language or languages other than the ones spoken by the main researchers or the group of researchers deployed on the ground. So here, translation has mainly the objective of supporting researchers in their accurate accounting of the given human rights crisis they plan to publicly uh, denounce. So the third, in the third and last case, um, and I mean, the further last case undoubtedly represents the most apparent contribution of translation, um, which is uh, closely linked to public dissemination of research output, uh, uh, for example, uh, research report, when related assets um, like uh, campaign material, uh, media, social media material, letters to um, head of governments or state, uh, websites uh, or web pages, uh, etc., as well as. Um, the associated um, campaigning uh, and advocacy activities. In this case, though, professional translation applies a slightly different role, depending, I would say, on the type of um, research conducted, the target audience uh, of the given output, and what or whom the organization for amnesty aims to influence. If, for example, um, we take a human rights crisis that has broken out in one of the Francophone countries in West Africa or um, in one of the Spanish-speaking Latin American countries in South Korea, um, it is very likely that Amnesty would react to, to something like this by issuing um, a timely press release or another type of output in French or Spanish, respectively. Um, although I would say the source text would originally be written in French or Spanish in this uh, uh, hypothetical case. Um, a translation into English would most likely be commissioned to. Why? To draw global attention to the case and to attempt to further influence bodies such as uh, the UN Security Council, the UN Human Rights Council, um, or the, U the European Court of Human Rights in what may refer to uh, as high-level advocacy. Conversely, um, if the materials focusing on such crisis were written in English, it is highly likely that translation to French and Spanish would be commissioned in order to target and influence local governments, the security forces, and local media. At the same time, um, targeted assets or advocacy documents may also be translated into a given non UN Security Council language to target mainly influence 
uh, especially the UN Security Council member, on a key vote, or um, as I was explaining earlier, to aid in the campaigning and advocacy in the country in question. However, um, we also need to take into account that if, for example, Amnesty Advocacy Goal were to try to influence um, the US government to stop killing or injuring civilians in Somalia with the airstrikes, Mati was originally written in English, would pro, you know, most probably suffice uh, or would be given at least the highest priority to meet um, the set objective, uh, I mean, advocacy objective. And the translation into Somali might not be necessarily, uh, you know, issued uh, because uh, it wouldn't be required to um, achieve uh, that specific objective. That being said, this is exactly where, uh, or the kind of situation in which translation brings a, a specific type of added value beyond uh, that of a pure linguistic and cultural transfer, as it acts as the bearer of a message of caring and support for the rights holder affected by the human rights violations in question, or those living in a situation of human rights crisis. Um, in other words, uh, what I would say is that we would still want to have this material translated into Somali to say to the victims in Somalia or the diaspora, uh, hey, we're here and we care about you. Um, so, you know, therefore, the, the message of caring um, and support uh, that in amnesty context translation offers and acts, uh, acts mainly on two dimensions, I would say, the textual side uh, or the textual dimension meaning that it acts as a public record of the facts, of the findings and recommendations, which then acquires um, both you know, current and historical evidential value. And on the other hand, the social political side or dimension, which um, through the sharing of research findings in the local language is fundamentally associated with the self-awareness of the affected uh, community. On um, a deep level, uh, translation makes another critical, yet uh, seldom visible contribution to the meaningful work of the organization beyond its more immediate link to the response um, to a human rights crisis and the organization's relationship with the communities whose human rights are being violated. This additional function concerns three key concepts, uh, which, which are trust, empowerment, and linguistic justice. We have to think that um, you know, several international organizations and international non-governmental organizations uh, that have origins dating back to the post-war period that are geographically located in the global north often risk being viewed as alien Western organizations uh, and are therefore perceived as being miles away from where a given crisis occurs. This sort of gap tends to be um, exacerbated by the widespread use of among these organizational support in the Franca. Generally, we're talking about English and French or French, um, that in most cases is the result of a colonial or imperialist past. Translation therefore becomes particularly important as it helps to produce quality materials that gain the people's trust and confidence, because it helps in bridging the gap between policy makers and the people. It gives credibility to the research uh, of the organization and it helps in building confidence in the organization. In other words, people can trust the organization because the organization speaks the language, which is very important. Within the context of human rights crisis, translation contributes to uh, the achievement then of the linguistic justice as it becomes a crucial means of upholding the dignity of individuals and communities impacted by the crisis, removing those feelings of a disadvantage among those who are not from the dominant and public anglo from linguistic culture, and promoting the development of trust between involved parties. On the other hand, um, beyond the advocacy um, objectives mentioned earlier, which are mostly uh, targeted at governments, authorities, and so on, translation also plays a fundamental role in enabling and empowering the powering rights holder, as it allows them, of course, when there is, uh, we are not in a situation of government big house uh, or armed group restrictions and so on, basically it allows them to take full ownership of research findings and to 
cognitively engage with them. In other words, high level of democracy is undoubtedly key, especially in situations of human rights crisis. However, whenever possible, this should go hand in hand with raising social awareness uh, within affected communities about their human rights or the deprivation thereof. And this is exactly when access to information in one's own language, not only in the official language of high level international borders, is critical to enabling and empowering rights world to slowly contribute to this essential process of change from inside. Translation, therefore, becomes a catalyst of change. So in terms of, you know, figures um, and of, you know, translation work at Amnesty, in uh, 2021, uh, the Language Resource Center translated over 7 million words, which equals to uh, over 15,000 pages of documents, uh, for a total of nine, uh, 97 language combinations, uh, um, uh, 22 different source languages, among which, you know, Oromo, Maric, Uyghur, and so on and so forth, 61 different tribal languages, uh, um, and we can think of, you know, uh, we can list, for example, uh, Filipino, Urdu, Kiswahili, Tajik, uh, and so on and so forth. 80 document formats and text types, uh, and over 2,700 projects managed in turn. And this leads to what, you know, I refer to as a tangible impact. Uh, and these are... Um, um, you know, examples of feedback on how translation was key in achieving greater local impact and relevance. Uh, for example, you know, translated versions spread easier when they uh, were there by media or common people. Uh, if they're not translated, no one would read them. Or another case, participants in TPVs with Android phone appreciated the fact that we were able to, um, uh, to send them all the recorders in clear, recognizing their plights and the key messages to address mental health. Or translation makes it possible for local NGOs working on death penalty abolition to easily quote Amnesty's as well. So this to me is tangible impact. And you know, it summarizes quite well the, um, you know, the importance of translation in the defense of human rights. So thank you very much and a very happy International Translation Day, everyone. Our next guest is Ms. Thel Morgan from the Translation Bureau of Canada. Thel is a senior interpreter with the Government of Canada. She has a master's degree of advanced studies in interpreter training from the University of Geneva. And since 2019, she has co-led workshops for indigenous language interpreters at parliamentary or political assignments. Thel? The floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, well, it's morning for me anyway. Um, I'm just going to turn on my presenter mode and then I will begin. Um, here we go. I believe you can all see it now. Okay. So uh, my name is Thel Morgan, and as was mentioned, I'm a senior interpreter at the Translation Bureau. Um, but before I start, I would like to say that in addition to being International Translation Day, it's a very important day in Canada. It is also a day we call Orange Shirt Day to remember the children from the residential schools who never came home. So it's the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and we remember um, the survivors and the children, and we reflect on reconciliation today. Um, so I would like to say that. So I'm going to talk about how the workshops came to be and what these workshops are like. Um, just advance through my slides here. So um, at um, Canada's Parliament, the Senate of Canada began using an Indigenous language in the Senate chamber before the House of Commons did. It was back in 2004, the Senate was asked by a senator to change the rules to allow someone to speak an Inuit language, Inuktitut, um, and it became possible to do so with four hours notice, but there was no interpretation at that time. There was only a written translation that went into the Hansard 
of uh, in French or English. So this was a problem. And in 2006, the Senate committee began a two-year study on the issue. And the 2008 report noted some of the challenges that they had at the time. And those included the lack of interpreters, the lack of training programs for interpreters, specifically with the language combinations required geographic challenges because Canada is a very large country and people live remotely, particularly the interpreters for the languages in question, which was the um, Inuit languages. There are three of them. One of them is Inuktitut is the most spoken. Uh, we still face some of those challenges today for many of the languages, but eventually the Senate decided to provide interpretation for Inuktitut in the chamber and then in two committees, our Aboriginal Peoples and Fisheries Committee, and then gradually for other Indigenous languages. So it was a progressive approach. At around the same time, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission began six years of hearings to learn about the legacy of the residential schools and the commission's 2015 report set out 94 calls to action for government, media and civil society. And these included a number um, on the use and promotion and preservation of indigenous languages. So media committed has committed to uh, providing more programming on the radio, on TV, in print, in Indigenous languages, and about Indigenous people's issues and Indigenous peoples, et cetera. The first MPs in the House of Commons started to persistently raise the issue of speaking an Indigenous language were Romeo Saganash, who was elected in 2011. He actually spoke twice in Cree in the House without interpretation either time. Another MP, Robert Falcon Ouellette, began raising the issue in 2017 upon his election. And Falcon Ouellette wanted to speak Cree in the House, but he had to provide the translation himself. And he felt, and obviously this um, would, would take away from him being understood, he felt. So he wanted to speak and be interpreted. Um, the speaker told him to go to a committee of the House responsible for procedure and House affairs, essentially the rules again, to ask that the rules of the House be amended. And the Senate did recommend, the committee, sorry, recommended the change to allow the use of Indigenous languages with interpretation. The 2017 federal budget invested $90 million to support Indigenous languages and culture. And there was also a very important bill that came around, uh, Bill C-91, which enacted the Indigenous Languages Act, which recognizes Indigenous language rights as Aboriginal rights protected under Section 35 of our Constitution Act in uh, 1982. As the Translation Bureau's mandate is to serve parliamentarians and government, it anticipated that once C-91 passed and given the requests that were increasing by MPs to speak in Indigenous languages, that it would need to anticipate the needs and prepare to build capacity in these Indigenous languages. So on December 3rd, 2018, the House of Commons did adopt the committee's recommendations on the right to use Indigenous languages in the House with interpretation. And shortly after that time, on January 28th, 2019, so barely six weeks later, Dr. Kevin Lewis, a Plains Cree interpreter who is speaking after me, became the first person to provide a live interpretation in the House of Commons of an Indigenous language. And here he is with Falcon Wellet, the MP who, who, who forced the issue through. So just so you can understand the challenge for Canada um, and for the Translation Bureau, here's a quick overview of Indigenous languages in Canada. This is a map on the left of, uh, from Canadian Geographic and using statistics from uh, 2011 from Statistics Canada, our federal statistics agency that shows where Indigenous languages are being used now. And now, of course, refers to 2011. Um, so it's a little out of date, but there are about 70, 60 to 70 Indigenous languages in Canada, as we have, like all other countries in the world, we are seeing a decline in the number of Indigenous languages. Um, there are 12 distinct language families in Canada, Inuit, Ten First Nations, and Mischief, which is a Métis language. About 4.9% of our population is Indigenous, but it's also the fastest growing part of our population. So there's many Indigenous languages then for which we may need to build capacity. And of course, as I mentioned, not all languages have a very high population of fluent speakers. Many fluent speakers may be older. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Canada is very large and communities can be quite remote as you can see here. So it can take several days for interpreters 
or workshop participants to get to the capital city, Ottawa. So not all communities have high-speed internet either. Uh, there is an issue with the coverage. And so this means that we can't train remotely most times. So this is a picture or two pictures of Indigenous language workshop participants. Um, the one on the left is from the recent papal visit to Canada in July 2022. And on the right, you see uh, during the pandemic, we had an election and we had a leaders debate. And this is the sign language and Indigenous interpreters who did the, I believe it was the French language debate or the English language debate, sorry. Um, so as interpreters and interpreter candidates within the language communities were being identified as potential freelance interpreters for the Translation Bureau, the decision was made at the same time to offer an in-person workshop, and the workshop would provide context for parliamentary and government assignments and reinforce simultaneous consecutive and documentation skills. So many of the people that we were trying to identify obviously have some experience interpreting, not everybody, but many have experience interpreting, but the context of parliamentary and government is quite different from the community um, interpretation that they may have done. So I, I have co-led many of the workshops or most of the workshops alongside Marianne C2, a senior interpreter for Indigenous Languages Interpretation, Emily Vachon, senior interpreter at Parliamentary, and there's an Indigenous Language Lead Project Officer, Vanessa Brousseau, who liaises with the communities and really helps facilitate culture and communication because obviously the cultural piece is very important. Um, to build trust and relationships and to get it right, because we can't afford to do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, um, because that prevents learning. So the workshops use student-centered methods to teach simultaneous consecutive documentation, meaning training is collaborative, flexible, we use scaffolding, and we focus on skills development. And hopefully we also respect the principles of learning for first peoples. Learning is reflective, relational, holistic. We recognize the role and importance of indigenous knowledge, sharing, and it involves patience and time. Uh, there were four workshops held in 2019 to build general capacity, another two to prepare Indigenous language interpreters for the 2019 leaders debate, uh, federal leaders debate, because we had an election that year, and then one workshop in 2020, just before the pandemic, which shut down everything. Uh, in, we had another one in 2021 um, because there was another election and there was therefore another federal language leaders debate. Uh, a workshop was held in early 2022 to build capacity and a very large workshop with many um, different Indigenous languages uh, was held just prior to the papal visit to Canada in the summer. Usually the workshops are three to four days in duration. So typically we invite four to five interpreters minimum, preferably with at least two participants per Indigenous language and obviously with English or French as the common language, so we can work out of a shared language. So we don't have French and English in the same workshop, um, just one common language. Speakers from the same language family are easier to group because of a potentially very similar language structure and possibly similar challenges, but that's not always feasible uh, because we invite people based on needs and upcoming events uh, um, when, when we have to. We try to train a full team at a, at, a, at a workshop who may later work together. We have a wide range of participants from extremely experienced interpreters and translators to those with little formal to no interpretation experience. So we have many people who are language teachers or teachers, professors, journalists, chiefs, translators, um, but almost all are language professionals in one way or the other. Some come from, as I said, remote regions and they need to travel several days to come to the workshop. And we need to carefully consider how to meet professional and personal needs to ensure an environment conducive to learning. So principles, um, we, as I said, we use uh, student-centered and the principles of learning for first peoples. We acknowledge and build in time for appropriate cultural practices. We want people to feel comfortable and to know that they are not adapting to us, that we work to include and adapt to them. So this may mean smudging before we begin, a prayer by an elder. The setup is very important. We sit in a circle, everyone is equal. Um, and that really tells them that we want them to participate and they are considered the experts as well because they are in their languages. 
So we want participants to freely share experience, knowledge, and expertise, and obviously consult on terminology and reformulation and help scaffold each other in their first language. We do tell them every time that they need to use their language around us to um, resolve issues amongst themselves. And it's very important because on a practical level, they can give each other relevant idiomatic speeches and feedback. They can give and take relay. They can practice turns taking and discuss reformulation and terminology issues. And this does take time. So we need to constantly adapt the program and have a lot of materials in order to um, adapt to performance outcomes and needs. So even for experienced Indigenous language interpreters, there may be an intimidation or trust factor. Coming to Ottawa and to government can be very difficult. They don't know us. We are not part of their community. So it's really important to build a relationship and be patient and open. Uh, Emily and I um, well, do a lot I of- ask that, Sorry. Um, yes. uh, it, it, May I ask that you wrap up soon within the next couple of minutes? Sure, sure. Okay, so um, I'll just skip down to um, this next slide. Um, uh, so communication and consensus is important. I'll just tell one story um, about they may not have some of the same ideas of, do, of how to do things. Uh, or may not have experienced that the way that that interpretations have interpreters have made standard practices such as 20 to 30 minute turns and and so on and so what we preach is really communication and consensus among team members on how to proceed during one leaders debate a team decided that each team member would work as long as they felt able and then they would signal when they really needed to be relieved and we identified the consequences of the decision but they felt it was more important to ensure continuity continuity of service and not equality of turn duration so they come up with the solutions themselves and we just help to make them aware of some of the issues that may be involved in that decision so skipping to the last slide and this is really the last point I promise these are two of the manuals that we used in order to come up with how we would approach training the one on the left is the indigenous interpreter manual there is also a handbook it's obviously meant for indigenous interpreters in a different setting a community setting um, with different types of educational backgrounds than our interpreters but it has proved useful and on the right, um, training in languages of lesser diffusion, which seeks to train interpreters where there is, you don't, you, the trainer doesn't speak both languages. So those have been helpful to us. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me. I'm sorry for taking so long. Oh, th thank you so much, Thel. It, it was a great presentation. I'm sorry I had to cut you <laughs> a, a little short. Um, uh, our next uh, uh, guest is Dr. Kevin Lewis. Uh, he's an Indigenous freelance interpreter and translator from the Cree Nation. Um, Kevin is an associate professor in the Faculty of Curriculum Studies in the College of Education at the University of Saskatchewan. I am so sorry for the accent. Has worked with higher learning institutions within the Prairie Provinces of Manitoba, Satchuswen in Alberta in Cree language development and instructional methodologies. Kevin, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, if I can uh, share my slide, uh, I'll just open it up. Hopefully, um, hopefully you see it. Uh, is it up? It, it, it is up. If you go to, oh no, no, it isn't. It's still the uh, Fels uh, slides. There you go. Yes. Okay, I'll stop sharing and then I'll do it again. All right. So I, I guess um thank you for uh having such a, a gathering and then um also the uh the benefits of uh, hearing everybody's perspectives all all throughout the world world and um I guess Nigan kita tamskat na o international na o kaya mina kota gisga o kap mamigusya we're gifted another day um and of course like Tal said it is still uh, morning for us, and um, uh, thank you, Thal, for uh, doing the uh, the hard work that the, the translation bureau, and then also summarizing sort of like the steps that I don't have to go through, uh, but just uh, speak from the experience that I've had as a freelance translator and an interpreter. 
So I'm from um, uh, Minnesticwin Lake in Sukskawaisi, which is a place of little islands. And in Saskatchewan, you're pretty close, uh, uh, you know, very close on the uh, on that. But uh, Saskatchewan is um, a, a place of a fast flowing river, which is uh, North Saskatchewan River. And uh, we're right in the center of Canada. And uh, this is where um, we still see the, uh, the fluency. But I also wanted to add something. There's a, a, a very interesting stat here. Um, my interpretation work that started, I think it was about 2018, which is the year of the Indigenous people, uh, we launched um, a, a Cree immersion land-based program uh, here in the community. And uh, we, uh, this is where, uh, with the funding that we, that uh, I guess we raised um, when I was uh, hired as a freelancer to go to Ottawa to do these um, the translation uh, jobs and interpretation uh, assignments out there, I had squirreled away enough money and um, I actually took some of the students out there uh, to see this interpretation that was happening in the capital city of Ottawa. And because Canada is so big and wide and vast uh, in terms of land base, um, it was it's it was very far away. You know, Ottawa was way on the east side of the country. But um, because of us doing this, uh, we took the kids there. And one of the uh, the stories that came out was um, one of the, my daughter who was going to school at the time. Um, she was one of the students uh, out of the three that went at that time. Uh, she said, when I grow up, uh, this is what I want to do. I want to be an interpreter. I want to do what you're doing, dad. You know, so that was a very, um, you know, uh, it was a, such a good story. Um, so the motivator uh, also, is uh, the statistics in 2021, if you look at them in Canada, uh, there is a decline in language, um, but at, it, it was done during COVID. And a lot of our First Nations had cut off the, uh, the borders, so nobody uh, could come in. And uh, when we did have to go out, leave the reserve boundaries, or, um, uh, it would be, you know, on a clock, we would make sure that we're giving our names and then coming in again and then and then all the COVID protocols and whatnot, because we needed to uh, save our, our our elders as well. We need to keep them safe, uh, our community members and, and everybody else like that. So the numbers, you can look at them. Um, they're really good, uh, nonetheless, but also understand that they don't give the full picture because a lot of our language speakers, the fluent speakers are in the communities and they were on lockdown. They were in their bubbles. They were um, not being allowed to leave very much uh, during this time. So uh, again, with that said, uh, there's an alpha generation in there, which is uh, zero to eight years old. And that number of as second language speakers um, rose from 11,000 to 28,000 within that time. So it's from 2016 to 2021. So I wanted to uh, raise that because, you know, I wear this orange shirt today to remember uh, the children uh, that didn't get to go home from the Indian residential schools and uh, that didn't have a chance to speak their language within those institutions, you know. So uh, we we wear these in remembrance not to do that again. And I'm, I'm glad that Thal had mentioned it as well, because it, it is Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. And uh, and I'm also glad that uh, we're shedding light into this important is initiative here. So we've worked with uh, the Translation Bureau. Uh, we've had private clients come approach us either directly or indirectly um, through the Translation Bureau of Canada since 2018. And then we've also had industry um, that have uh, stepped up as well uh, because of the calls to action. And um, we've uh, worked with uh, like Air uh, Canada, for instance, uh, we've worked with um, uh, private industry companies, um, you know, uh, uh, all, all sorts of industry throughout Canada. Along with that, you have the provincial government agencies, but then you also have the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit inter uh, agencies as well that we translate for. And then we've also done translation work for higher learning institutions like the University of Saskatchewan, University of Blue Quills. Um, the courts also have uh, constant interpreters that are needed health authorities, especially like uh, 
I got a, I don't know if people know what 911 is, but it's an emergency call center and dispatchers are, uh, are called. And then th th depending on the emergency, uh, they were needing medical uh, interpreters, depending on where they were from, what community they were from. So again, uh, and then all the way down to the micro level, the grassroots level to the local government authorities. So we have a whole bunch of people that are and agencies and governments and industry that are coming to us for interpretation. So it, it's timing is very good for this. Um, what I see is uh, we do need, um, like we need continued research on this. And I appreciate all the academics that are in here as well, because I have a, a number of hats that we wear here. We work with the local chief and council. We, we work for, uh, you know, you see the Minister of Indian Affairs, uh, Honorable Mark Miller there right in the middle. Uh, he stopped by this last time. Um, but we were reaching out to uh, ask for resources towards, uh, you know, creating, uh, you know, um, uh, resources. We're wanting to digitalize. Uh, we need to uh, database, you know, we need to, we need lexicons, uh, depending on uh, the situation. And uh, also, finding institutes that are willing to train uh, that are so we don't have to you know take days to fly to Ottawa so we can kind of separate them possibly um, you know throughout the country because the uh, Canada is pretty big and then also understanding uh, the linguistic diversity within Canada because um, yeah there's a, like 70, 70 plus languages you know that are being spoken right now and some of them were were gone they were nobody was speaking them but thank goodness somewhere somewhere down the line somebody had written uh you know uh, some of these lexicons and dictionaries and grammatical books on some of them so there's a revitalization of indigenous languages throughout canada and the world as you see uh, based on all the presentations also um having indigenous institutions to develop these as well but to co-develop them uh, just like what we did with the university of ottawa and I know up north, there's a, um, there's a college, Arctic College, that uh, does interpretation work um, up there where they certify interpreters that can work in all these various uh, places. And then again, uh, finding out um, what are the standards compared to the world. Because like Thel said, we have chiefs, we have elders, we have, um, like my mom, uh, Nigawi, was one of my uh, co-interpreters this last uh, assignment that we did in Ottawa. And uh, and this this last time when the Pope had come, we had a mother and daughter combo as well. So you have uh, kinship where languages are are strong still in some of these homes, where they're uh, acting as teams, and, and that's very nice to see. And again, uh, resources, right? And uh, um, resources locally, uh, but also nationally. But uh, like with an institute like this or. Uh, a space like this to safely talk about our our, our issues, uh, resources to go international, right? Resources for um, this type of circle. So I think uh, um, I also wanted to point out the complexity of the indigenous languages in, within Canada. Like I said, there are 70 plus indigenous languages and they vary in language health throughout. You know, there, like I said, there's some that are uh, becoming alive again, and then there's some that are uh, that are still rising because of the population growth. Uh, resources vary from community to community and between the provinces as well. Databasing uh, the interpreters and updating their skill sets and making sure that they're fluent and uh, and then thinking of ideas of uh, creating some sort of language proficiency exam. Um, you know, I use English, for example, uh, but we, we, we should develop our own, uh, you know, language proficiency exams to understand that there is a level uh, and that, that we're meeting those levels because like the, um, uh, I think it was the New Zealand uh, presentation, she had said that, uh, you know, our voices are the voices of the people um, that we're representing and we, we, we're not um, bipartisan. We, we have to represent them and try to be as true as what they're saying. So again, uh, some of the highlights uh, I'd like to um, point out is um, uh, the Pope had just come here and did an apology and that was very, very emotional. Uh, it, very, it was very taxing, but we pulled it off uh, as a team. 
And I think it create and we need a team. We need a team of people that are uh, that know how to do the technical, um, you know, the the computers, the the linking in, and the, all the audio and everything else like that. And then we had signers as well. Uh, we had, uh, and on top of that, we had the French interpreters, the English interpreters, and then we had twelve indigenous languages that were introduced or uh, represented at this last uh, the Pope's visit. And then we had two uh, simultaneous translation uh, uh, assignments that were very, very fast. And um, you just, you have briefings that you get uh, before, you know, the actual debates, but you really don't know what's going to come out of their mouths, right? And, and so you have to come up with these new on-the-spot terms. And it's beautiful because our languages, our Indigenous languages can do it. And we've been proving it since 20, 2019. And uh, now today, um, since then, I've seen it cross, uh, like we have Hockey Night in Cree. Um, we have, we had football that was uh, like, a, it was the American football, not the, not the soccer football, but the American football that was translated in, in uh, Cree as well. So, and then there's Blackfoot uh, um, th that they interpret these sporting events as well. So again, I see the benefits of that. And I want to highlight uh, all the work that's been going through this. And there was one legislation there that I'm still um, really studying and we're still trying to fill out the skeleton of it, but it's the Indigenous Language Act. And I believe the Maori possibly have a, a, a Maori Indigenous Language Act of some sort as well. And it's a Commonwealth country uh, type of legislation. And maybe there are some other Indigenous um, countries out there that, are out, um, that could look into something like this, but the, the legislation definitely helps. Uh, but I, I just wanted to highlight uh, those and I wanted to keep it nice and short and be cognizant of the time. But thank you, everybody, for your presentations and we're, we're uh, doing a whole bunch of different note taking here. But and we'll, we'll leave it open to the next presenter. Thank you very much, Kevin. And Sal, I believe you have a very short video. Would you be able to share it with us? You will need to unmute yourself for us to hear the audio. Sorry about that. I accidentally did something before I was ready, but now I will. So this is... Um, an indigenous interpreter and a woman who started um, the Atikamek, an indigenous language, um, uh, Wikipedia. So I will attempt to do a very low tech um, solution to this, um, to, to, to interpreting her video. She starts in Atikamek, I will let her speak. And then when she starts to speak French, I will mute her and speak instead. So I hope the sound does share. Um, how am I? Oh, yeah. Start sharing. Um, no, we can't hear it. Okay. Um, if I unplug. Yes, maybe if you unplug. No. Yes, yes. yes. Can you put the volume up? My name is Teresa. I am an Atikamek woman from Manawan, mother of seven, a grandmother. I'm very proud that my mother tongue is being here, heard here today on this National Day of Truth and Reconciliation and the Indian International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which begins this year. I'm honored Indigenous languages are being recognized by the UN. As guardians of our languages, we, the Indigenous peoples, must take action to protect our heritage. The Atikamek language and culture have always been important to me. Since the beginning, I've been the coordinator of the Atikamek Wikipedia. I spoke about it at different institutions. I've been the coordinator. Um, I attended Wikimania in 2017 in Montreal and the 2019 Francophone Wicket Convention in Belgium. I've been giving interviews on the radio and I've written online about this project. 
In 2019, we, along with a German techno-linguistic student, won an award at the University of British Columbia. I did a micro program in 2018 on teaching a Tikimek given by the University of Quebec in Trois-Rivières. I took part in the intensive interpretation workshop at the Bureau in Ottawa to prepare for the 2025 federal leaders debate. But I first worked as an interpreter during the visit of Pope Francis in July, 2022, where 12 Aboriginal languages were represented. I was very proud of this. Sorry. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing, Fel. <laughs> Our um, next uh, guest speaker is Dr. Gulway. He's a lecturer of the Hebei Normal University for Nationalities at the People's Republic of China. Uh, he's a doctor of Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, master of Minzu University of China, and his main research fields are Jurkin literature and Manchu literature. Hello, 今天呢在这里主要是和大家简单的交流一下关于满汉对译文献及其在满语保护中的重要意义相互了解与中原地区有着广泛的交流交往交融的民族之一有清一代留下了浩如烟海的历史文献就藏有满文档案抄本、晒印本、石印本、洋印本、铅印本等等等等版本各异所收藏的机构在中国国内包括北京、黑龙江、吉林、辽宁、内蒙古、新疆、山东、台湾等地都有专业的机构比如说图书馆、高校、研究
著名的《三国》啊，《金瓶梅》《四书》《聊斋志异》等等啊，这些优秀的啊汉文文呃文学作品啊，呃就被大量的翻译成满文啊，形成了一种满汉对照的文献。呃，以《三国》为例啊，它是非常早的啊，由汉文翻译成满文之后。啊，在广大满族呃满语使用者啊满族群众当中流传开来的，甚至一度啊在满语使用者人当中不把它当做一个章回体的小说看待啊，而是把它当做一个呃兵书啊兵书啊指导作战的啊这么样一个书籍、啊、当然啊我前面说了啊，不单单是有这个满意呃、啊、汉译满。还有满意汉啊，比如说《大清全书》啊，《预知增定清文鉴》《清话问答四十条》啊，这些书都是将满文啊满语的内涵翻译成汉文，然后介绍给汉语使用者的这样一些文献啊。这里特别还要提一些提一句，就是《大清全书》啊，这本书是清代呃这个翻译家吧啊，翻译家沈启亮。他所做的啊一本词典啊一本词典分类词典是清代满汉词书的第一部啊第一部，虽然啊他这个创作就是开始时期啊开始新编撰时期呢要、呃、比这个《清文鉴》啊要晚一些，但是他完成的时间啊完成的时间要早啊，说如此大量的满汉对译文献啊，可以说呢。啊，既是记载着清代满汉民族间交流、交往、交融的历史史料，啊，是一种能够证明哈、啊，在清代的时候啊，民族间存在着广泛的交流、交往、交融啊，又是在近三百年的时间里啊，众多满汉翻译者啊，他们的实践成果，啊，他们的实践成果，而这些实践成果呢？如今就静静的等待着我们现在的有识之士啊，有识之士将其从一种实践的经验的积累啊，升华成为啊一种满汉翻译理论啊，满汉翻译理论啊，也就是说，目前啊，在这个领域，满汉翻译理论领域啊，很少有人做深入的研究和探讨啊、呃，那么。满汉对译文献呀，在满语保护的当中呢，又是起到一个怎样的作用呢？啊，怎样的作用呢？哎，呃，我们首先呢，就是看一下满语现在啊，基本上处于一个什么样的阶段啊？就是目前来看啊，满语基本上已经处在了说是所谓的功能性灭绝或者叫功能性消亡的这样一个状态啊，在呃部分的边远地区呢。会有一个别的老人啊，能说啊，能听满语啊，甚至他们说和听的水平还很高啊，呃，但是这些人当中啊，这些人当中已经没有会读会写满文的了啊，也就是他们处在一种是文盲的状态啊，文盲的状态，而他们在使用满语进行交流的这种场合呢，啊，是极其有限的，极其有限的。呃，这种而他们在交流的内容上啊，相对来说啊，相对来说范围也是很窄的，很窄的，一般都是生活当中的一些琐事啊。而这些人，因为大这些人大部分生活在农村，他们会的东西基本上也就是农村的身为呃周边身边的一些事啊、物啊这些东西。呃，随但是啊，随着我们中国日新月异的发展啊，人们对于满语的这种保护意识呢，也是在逐渐提高的。啊，特别是说，呃，中国语言资源保护工程啊，这样一项工程的实施，在积极搜集啊，现存现今啊，我们还活着的，就是满语母语人的语音材料啊，包括一些词的读法啊，包括对话啊，这种长篇的语料啊，民间啊，民间也有很多啊，有识之士，特别是青年人，开始向这些呃、哦，现今还活着的，或者有一些这个。啊，语音呐、啊，历史资料啊，流传下来能够被大家得到的啊，这样语料啊，去学习母语人的这些日常的对话，啊，这是呃，可以说是一种非常欣喜的这种一种形式啊。但是
啊，我们上面提到的这些呃保护满语的这个方法哈、啊，虽然取得了不小的成果，但是呢还有很大的局限性啊。这也是今天我们为什么要谈一谈说这个满汉对译文献啊，对于满语的保护的重要作用，就说我们呢。观察这些母语人也好啊，这些学习母语母语人的这个学习者也好，或者保护者也好啊，我们能够看到或者听到啊，就是他们在使用满语的时候，啊，有非常大的自身的优势，就是他们在使用的时候，他们的语言非常灵活啊，语言非常灵活啊，表达一个意思的时候可以运用运用一些词汇的组合啊，运用一些呃词汇的转变啊，就是变化词汇的变化。来指示一些啊，表达特定的意义啊，表达特定的意义。但是啊，有一些问题，包括他们所知道的词汇量小啊，词汇量小，使用的环境啊，使用的环境窄啊，而且满语他们所使用的满语作为啊一种粘着语啊，有着很严重的分析化倾向啊，分析化倾向。而这些问题当中啊，这些问题当中啊。有很重要的一点就是啊，很重要的一点就是他们所学的这个现代状态的满语，就是他的在词汇啊和在词汇上，就是他的能产性极低啊。所谓的能产性极低就是什么呢？他们这个满语啊，是他们所学的这个满语是没办法啊，通过自身的造词机构啊，就是造词啊，通过自身的造词机制。啊，去产生啊新词术语，用以指代新事物、新问题啊。因此啊，这样的满语啊，即使被保存下来了，也只能处于一种相对低层的啊低层低相对低的一种层次啊，只能表达一些简单的意思啊，或者是概念，比如说吃啊、跑啊、走啊、跳啊、爸爸妈妈等等这样的，而没办法进行更高级的。这种概念啊，或者是更复杂的概念进行描绘。说而这个满汉对译文献啊，所涉及的词呢，那就是十分广泛了，要比这个咱们前面所说的这些母语者啊、学习者啊，他们所使用的词汇大得多啊。为什么呢？就是因为清代有大量的翻译者啊，将汉文的经典或者其他民族的这个呃、啊、经典翻译成满文啊，致使。这个词汇量，当时的词汇量极其庞大啊！这种词汇量庞大啊，一就是从两个方面能体现，就是它的词汇量大，这种大远超现代我们活着的这个母语人、满语母语人他们所使他们的这个生境当中所使用的语言啊，就是因为你无法想象说一个农村的这个常年劳作的老者啊，能够给你讲一讲啊什么是这个核物理，对吧？啊，但是。呃，这是一啊，是从这个范围上；二就是说这个词汇的呃这种高呃高低等级上来看啊，高低等级上来看，因为它要表达一些复杂的、啊、甚至哲学化的啊思想化的这样的概念，所以在清代在翻译的时候呢，你通过自身的啊这种造造词机制啊，它创造了很多很多高级词汇。那、啊、这也是说所谓的就是书面语啊，书面语。啊，他的一身优势，这是无法被口语所替代啊。所以以这个钦定新清语为例啊，就说他所代表的满汉对译文献，就记录有当时大量的啊，就是翻译新词啊。这些新词并不是说，呃，它的意思，它所表达的概念，并不是说在钦定新清语当中啊第一次出现，在很早之前就出现了。但是由于当时的满语这个，呃。满语加工水平或者说这个造词机制啊还不够完善，那只能又采用一些，比如说呃音译介词啊这样的方式啊来达到目的，来达到使用的目的啊。而在新京新京语当中，就通过一系列的造词造词机制啊，把这个赋予了它这个新的词啊，用一种新的词啊去指代这样的概念。因此呢，就是通过啊，通过分析。满汉对译文献当中啊，满文词所对译的那个汉语啊，能够啊，能够得到，能够提啊，能够得到说满语的造词造词机制啊，我们分析它，然后最后能够得出一个
比较准确的结论。这也是有赖于什么呢？就是满汉对译文献当中两个文种的精确对照啊，讲精确对照。这不仅能够丰富满语保护过程当中啊所收藏的词汇量，说更能增加啊满语本身的这种造血机能啊，这种造血机能。通过恢复满语自身的能产性啊，就是说它对于新词术语的这种制造的能力啊，说改变现在呢这种呃在博物馆里保存标本一样的这种保护模式啊，就是改变现在这种简单的说拿来保存、拿来保存啊这样一个方法啊，恢复满语本身的活力，说将满语从功能性灭绝的悬崖上，咱们能抢救回来。啊，好，我想说的呢就是这么多，谢谢大家。Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Ravi Repabragada, who is executive director of Samata. Samata is a grassroots NGO who has been uh, and and uh, Ravi has been living and working with the Adivasi people in the Eastern Ghats of India for the last three decades. The Samata judgment was delivered uh, by the Supreme Court of India on July 11th of 1997. Uh, it uh, should be mentioned here that there are only two judgments in the last century which uh, were on behalf of tribal or indigenous populations around the world. One was Samta in India and the second was Mabo case in Australia. The Mabo case got overturned, so Samata still remains and remains as the only case of judgment in favor of tribal people. Or indigenous people uh, around the world in the last century. Now, let me give you a very briefly uh, what the whole judgment was about. Uh, in the Constitution of India, we have special provisions um, called the Fifth Schedule and the Sixth Schedule, uh, which deal with the tribal populations. Uh, I mean, in India, indigenous people are called as tribal populations, uh, as per the uh, Constitution and as per the order of the President of India. Now, the sixth schedule deals with the tribal populations of the Northeast in India, which is uh, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Assam, and other places. The fifth schedule deals with about 10 Central Indian tribal uh, built states. Uh, and the, we are here concerned about the fifth schedule. So under the fifth schedule, there are various laws that were promulgated to protect land and prevent money lending and various things, whose jurisprudence goes back to the pre-independence or to, to the British times. Uh, therefore, there were these special provisions and uh, it should also be mentioned that the tribal populations are the only one group that has been mentioned very specifically in the constitution. And there are so many provisions for protection of their land and resources, their identity, culture, etc. Now, this being the background, uh, one state in which I work, called the Andhra Pradesh, state of Andhra Pradesh, had issued mining leases from 1958 till 1984 in uh, quote unquote scheduled areas. And uh, the tribal communities living there uh, were very troubled by this particular thing since the 1950s. And there's also a presence of a huge limestone cave, which are about 400 million years old, and Paleolithic man had stayed here. So this being the case, the tribal communities who were very, very upset with this for a long time, approached us uh, so Samata conducted uh, its own little bit of research and uh, visited the areas. These are called the Bora Caves in Vishakapatnam district in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and after our initial investigation and a little bit of research, we understood that there was a legal issue here. The leases that were given by the government of Andhra Pradesh, the state government, were not valid. According to our uh, uh, analysis, 
not valid as per the Andhra Pradesh Land Transfer Regulation Act of 1959. So we approached the High Court. The High Court issued a, immediately gave us a stay order, and the mining came to a halt in 93 July. And soon after this mining, about five mining companies were there, and the mining came to a halt. Naturally, the companies were upset, so they paid the local police. And me and many of our team members were actually taken into illegal custody for a period of seven to eight days, and finally released after realizing that we are not uh, Naxalites or, or left-wing extremists. So when we went to the court, so we explained to them and they finally left us. Uh, that is like a small incident. Uh, that made us do a lot more work and we realized there were more leases in the same area and we went to the court again. And cutting a long story short, uh, in 1995, we lost in the High Court and we had to rush to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in two years delivered a judgment which actually uh, agreed with our, uh, our, our view, which says that the state government has no right to lease lands in scheduled areas to other than tribal or indigenous people. So therefore, the leases given from 1958 stand cancelled, and the land that belongs to the people, the authorities were uh, order to give them the title deeds for the cultivation that they have been doing. Along with that, the court also said that if there is any business activity in scheduled areas, the 20% from the net profit has to be spent for local area development. Now, you can say that the the court was very, very sensitive to these issues and also um, made very clear judgments, and so therefore, since 1997, so the Samta judgment came as a big uh, roadblock for the central government way back in 2000, around 2001, when they had a disinvestment ministry, and their whole job was to disinvest in the state public sector units. Since then, it has faced a lot of opposition, though in Andhra Pradesh, the state where the, the judgment applies very perfectly, the state government cannot really uh, win the law. And so therefore, they are trying to find ways of how to circumvent the judgment. There was also a move around 2001 when the, the judgment, there was a secret note to kind of see how the basis for the Samta judgment can be removed. But popular protests and exposure by media during that time, the state and the central government withdrew this secret note, and the Santa judgment still remains. However, the interpretation of the Santa judgment by various state governments, as you see, this is a pro tribal, pro indigenous judgment, and the whole system is not actually pro tribal. And so the Santa judgment faces a lot of uh, uh, pressure or, or uh, an opposition from state and the industries, whereas the communities all over tribal India uh, want the Santa judgment to be implemented. So it is now left for the uh, younger generation of tribal youth and the leaders to actually take up uh, the issue of whether the resources in tribal areas belong to them or belong to everybody. If so, uh, are they are they not the first, uh, what do you say, like the, the people who are the first benefit from these minerals or resources? And then the rest of the country can benefit from this. So this is something, uh, the discourse has started now in India with all the educated tribal youth coming forward and social media helping out in this process. So it's got to be seen in future as to how uh, the famous or a landmark judgment that came in 1997 would show the way for the future. Thank you. Um, we have heard some amazing um, 
uh, stories and initiatives of uh, how far, um, uh, if you can <laughs> go back, we have a question for the previous session, um, uh, how far we have come for language rights. And these initiatives are amazing. And uh, it, it just shows what can be done and how you know we can progress all the other communities that need to have their language rights heard. We do have a question uh, from a viewer from YouTube from the live streaming uh, from Nico Aguilar. He's asking about sensory deprived uh, in indigenous communities, such as blind, uh, deaf, mute, and similar handicapped people. What are we doing about, for example, braille or sign language? How far are we? Perhaps Kevin, you would like to answer this question? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, Jeanette. Um, one of the things that I shared, uh, I saw that in the chat box, um, the Nakodas in our area, uh, particularly the ones in uh, Fort Peck down in um, down in the United States of America, uh, they have uh, they've used uh, sign language. They call it hand talk, and um, there there are a few lexicons that are available online, and I'm pretty sure um, they've been using it uh, in higher learning institutions down there. And just because they're south of us, um, we have Nakoda, Dakota, and Lakota speakers in Saskatchewan, and where um, their their hand talk speakers, their signers, um, the indigenous uh, form, I guess of it, uh, it was used in the plains area. So that was our our way to talk to each other uh, before contact. So um, um, pre colonial uh, times, this is how we would do business, and um, I guess. Uh, and we still do that. And now today, uh, those speakers down there that are using hand talk, they're coming up here and um, we're relearning it. Um, there's uh, Grizzly Man, Nakoda Nation, uh, Mosquito, which is just south of us here that are utilizing it. And they're bringing in instructors to instruct us. And then we're re uh, reusing it as well. And um, so you have uh, Cree speakers, uh, you have the Sioux, the Sioux language speakers, uh, you have the Ojibwe, Chippewa, um, uh, Oji, Oji Cree speakers. Uh, so we're starting to revitalize using that uh, hand talk. There's also, and this is, like I said in the chat, um, it's very in, uh, in the infancy stage. And because we're starting to write some of these stories and some of these resources out there, there are people from uh, the deaf community that are reaching out to us that are saying, can we utilize uh, your resources? And if we can utilize them, um, you know, and I think it's it's because uh, the inclusiveness of Indigenous languages in Canada that people are starting to realize, well, we want to use these resources as well, right? So, again, hopefully um, everybody else is going to ride that, uh, the momentum there, but uh, it is happening. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Kevin. This is uh, great news for all the people around the world. And uh, uh, I hope a lot more communities follow, uh, you know, your steps. Uh, this concludes this session. And our next session's theme is translations and interpreter professional aspects. Moderator for this session is Tex Texan. Tex, during his three decade career, has helped numerous companies create global products and expand business to new regional markets. He has contributed to several internationalization standards and open source software and has been an advisor to several globalization nonprofits. He's an advisor to Translation Commons, where he has been architecting their language digitization initiative, bringing the languages of indigenous communities to digital systems. In this session, the speakers will cover issues of preservation, degrees, master's degrees, curriculum creation, directory creation, and dubbing for minority languages. Tex, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Jeanette, for that um, introduction and um, for describing the, the theme of this panel. Um, so we, we will begin uh, immediately with Dr. Sue Ellen Wright, and I will uh, tell you the bio that she submitted 
which is that she is the professor emerita for Kent State University Institute for Applied Linguistics and uh, the professor emerita of translation and terminology studies. Um, Dr. Sue Ellen Wright's also on the board of advisors for translation commons. And uh, I was a little bit uh, surprised when I saw the bio. I've known uh, Sue Ellen for uh, many years and uh, she has many accomplishments in the industry. She's well known in the industry. And uh, when you have such a short bio like that, when you know when you start your career, um, you want to list everything you've ever done. And at the point you have so many achievements, you don't need to talk about them anymore. Uh, you just become known. Uh, for example, like Madonna in the music industry or De Niro in the uh, movie industry. Um, that's where Dr. Sue Ellen Wright is. She has a lengthy and exemplary career in translation and terminology. She's the chair, the US tab chair for ISO TC37. She's the author of um, several books on terminology management and frequent invited speaker at conferences. So her bio is well understated. So with that, I give you the Madonna of the terminology and translation management industry, Dr. Sue Ellen Wright. This presentation introduces you to the terminology management component of Translation Commons Language Digitization Initiative. Starting from UN support for Indigenous peoples' rights, the rights of Indigenous languages, and access to in digital environments on the part of all peoples, Translation Commons has worked to address the issue that although half the world's population speaks one of the 10 most common languages, only 1,000 of the world's languages have actually been digitized. In response to this situation, we have, among other things, created a wide variety of resources, including a set of guidelines, starting with our zero to digital guideline, which lays out a framework for digitizing languages and creating a wealth of resources, coupled with the language data gathering guidelines, which discuss how to collect data, ideas about storing data, uh, creating digital resources that can be reused in indigenous environments and our two-part Indigenous Interpreter Series, because none of this would be possible without training speakers of Indigenous languages to act as interpreters, in, in many cases, to document their Indigenous language in concert with whatever dominant language they may be working with in their computing environment. Finally, we have our terminology guidelines, which provide guidance in collecting and documenting lexical information and terminological information. All of these guidelines are based on a structure for digitization, which is reflected in the flowchart that you see on the left, although I'm afraid it's not very large, depends on what kind of screen you've got. We can run through the steps. The first question is, do you have a language code? Has your language been registered and recognized by the Unicode Consortium so that you have a code that can be used in bringing the language to the web? You may not be aware, but the language codes form the basis really for the World Wide Web as we know it. And without a code, your language has no place on the web. Do you have a Unicode font for your language? It's not enough just to have a code for your language. You have to be able to express the content of your language using a script in a registered font. And we'll look at that more in a minute. 
has this font been implemented on devices? Usually it starts perhaps with using your font on a phone or an iPad, a computer, using your font in a variety of applications. All this depends on having a keyboard or a keypad that can realize your font in those implementations. And then enlisting the creators of apps like standard word processing programs, text processing, terminology management, cat tools for translation, a variety of resources that you need if you're going to fully digitize your language with the goal out there on the far end of being able to process text, translate them, and even in the end result to create neural networks that will enable you to process your language in machine translation and ontology and knowledge management. It all starts with a font. This particular font is called the Celebario Amazonico. It's one of a number of fonts that are being developed worldwide to use with indigenous languages. This one being developed in South America for Amazon Basin languages. It's based on symbols that are used in pre-Columbian uh, writing. We, we often think of this as pre-Columbian art, but these are actually writing systems. These kinds of fonts enable indigenous communities to use internet technology while maintaining their cultural heritage. If there's any familiarity with these old texts, your modern and your ancient flow together. It engages speakers and young learners to learn the language using their own font, to employ modern media in their education, to convert oral communication to written text, to identify the technology for education, but also for the preservation of the knowledge that resides in their culture. In order to do all this, it's essential to engage the community in preserving the language. Often young people who have had education on the outside, in other words, have a dominant language uh, background in addition to their in indigenous language, go back, so to speak, into their community, engage the leaders of their community, the elders of their community, and document the language as it resides with the older people in the community who still use the indigenous language. This involves evaluating existing resources and new approaches, identifying practical use of language tools and how they can be enabled with this particular language in this particular culture. This may involve connecting to communities where standards are being developed and certainly connecting with folks who have done this before. And this is where translation comments can provide guidance in creating scripts, in creating fonts, and, and activating keyboards for those fonts. The terminology guidelines mirror these initial steps. In fact, this, this slide is very similar to the previous one with the goal of cre collecting audio materials that can be transcribed and digitized. Once you begin to collect words, you can begin to create word lists. And word lists in and of themselves are useful to human beings. And we can use them in developing grammars and documenting grammatical elements. You know, what's a verb, what's a noun? And that may be difficult in your language, a distinction that may be foreign to your language. Um, and the spelling identifying variants, because often if languages are not written down, there's a great degree of variability. Analyzing concepts, and we focus on concepts because every language has polysemy, and many times the policy meanings in one language do not mirror policy meanings in another language. 
in order to identify the way terms are used in the culture and document it, we need to separate terms from the concepts that they represent. Then we need to think about digitization of the information. And, and the terminologue we have mentioned here is actually a, a um, free uh, terminology management system developed in Ireland that we haven't really established a relationship with them, but I, they're in my sights as a place to go if we need a terminology management system. The goal then is to create what we call bitext, which are segments of translations. As we collect this information, we begin to translate it, we begin to collect segments, and when we have enough segments and we manipulate them appropriately, we begin to create machine translation environments. Here you see the representation of how we might go from the word email in English to the word lightning paper in Cherokee, and a representative terminological entry, part of which is uh, obscured here, but the goal being to move to sophisticated, technically modern terminological entries that then can be used to interact with machine translation systems and to create knowledge management systems based on our terminology. So that is a, a nutshell view of managing terminology management in the context of the digital initiative in translation commons. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Sue Ellen. And we, our next speaker is Dr. Nicasio Martinez Miguel. Um, Nicasio is at the uh, University uh, Autonoma uh, Benito Juarez in Oaxaca, Mexico. Excuse my pronunciation. And um, Nicasio was born in Oaxaca, and he was raised in an indigenous community that speaks Zapotec. Um, it was later in life that he learned Spanish, and then later again when he learned English, and earned a master's degree in critical education of languages. He's now a professor in the master's degree program of translation and interpretation in indigenous languages, um, and uh, he is uh, developing a master's degree program of translation and interpretation for indigenous languages in order to help preserve um, indigenous languages. With that, I give you uh, Dr. Nicasio Martinez Miguel. Shtane, greetings to each of you who are here with us celebrating International, International Translation Day. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about how Oaxaca State University's master's degree program translation and interpretation in indigenous languages is helping to preserve indigenous languages. In Mexico, there are 11 linguistic families, 68 linguistic groups, and 364 linguistic variants. And in Oaxaca State, there are uh, 11 linguistic groups. Oaxaca State University's Department of Languages offers two BA programs for teaching foreign languages, and it has uh, three master degree programs and one PhD program in critical studies of languages. The Department of Languages incorporates indigenous language languages. It has offered workshop of peer tutoring for teaching endangered languages. Zapotec and Mije are electives that BA students can study in addition to majority languages. The master degree in translation and interpretation in indigenous languages. How the master's degree program translation and interpretation in indigenous languages is helping to revitalize indigenous languages. When we talk about language, we must talk about colonization. Comments that I've heard from people in my hometown. I don't, someone said, I don't want my children to study Zapotec because we already speak it. 
we want them to learn Spanish well and English. My kids, and another one said, my kids look more attractive speaking Spanish than, do, than they do speaking Zapotec. Why have we come to think like that? Gugi Wathiongo, an African author, asks these questions about how we see our language. How did we come to be made to feel negative about our language? How did we come to be made to believe that our languages are the cause of division among us? Why is what is our own an enemy to us? Why is what is not ours a friend to us? Why does what is ours separates us? Why what is not ours brings us together? Toni Morrison in her novel, Beloved, talks about black Americans' painful experiences. Said the protagonist of the novel has scars on her back as part of her past of being a slave. We, the indigenous people also have scars on our backs. We too have a history that has damaged the sense of who we are. Eduardo Galeano writes about how we were scarred. In the 17th century, many the theologians and thinkers denied that the indigenous people were descended from Adam and Eve. They were not convinced by the papal bull that Pope Paul III promulgated in 1537 that declared that the Indians were real men. If those people were not considered real men, they didn't need to be treated as real men either. Those actions caused scars on our ancestors and they passed them on to us. On October 12, 1492, Christopher Columbus wrote on his diary that he wanted to take some Indians to Spain so they could learn to speak. Five centuries later, on October 12, 1989, in a court of justice in the United States, a mixed Indian was considered mentally retarded because he couldn't speak the Spanish language correctly. Ladislao Pastrana from Oaxaca, Mexico, an illegal farm worker in California's fields, was going to be imprisoned for life in a public asylum. Pastrana and the Spanish interpreter could not understand each other and the psychologist diagnosed an obvious mental deficiency. Finally, the anthropologist explained the situation Pastrana expressed himself perfectly in his own language, the mystic language that was spoken by Indians who were the descendants of a high culture that is more than 2,000 years old. Those are the things we, the indigenous people, have to fight against. Because of the effect of colonization, many of us don't see the importance of speaking and writing in our own language. However, in this master degree program, the students need to practice writing in their own languages as they have done in Spanish, since they are preparing to be translators and interpreters in both languages. In this program, there are five students and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project they are each do working on. Student one is, is a mixtech. She's working on creating a glossary for interpreters for the coastal mixtech in the state of Oaxaca. Student two is a Chinantec, and he's working on Chinantec medical practices, its interpretation and its translation into Spanish. Student three is a Zapotec. He is studying how the work of a community interpreter helps the public health service, services in his indigenous community do a better job. Student four is a Quicatec. She's working on designing bilingual Quicatec Spanish teaching materials using a translation from their oral history. Student five speaks lowland Mixtec. He's working on translating the colonial land deeds that were written in Mixtec. Students write in their own languages. The indigenous translators need to be able to write naturally in their own languages so their translations sound natural. This can only happen through writing a lot in their, lang in their own languages. The students have written identity texts about themselves, their families, an important object in their family, and how their parents named them. They wrote identity texts which improved their self-esteem. Cummins and Early say that identity texts work as mirrors where their identities are reflected in a positive way. 
The topics for the identity text were taken from the book Authors in the Classroom by Ada and Campoy. In the process of doing these activities, the students thought in their own language about how they would write an introduction, the body of the text and the conclusion. The students also thought about the differences between Spanish and their language. What is the order of the words in phrases and sentences? If the students are not aware of these differences, their translation will sound foreign and not natural. So they needed to decolonize their minds. One student said, to think in our, in our language is to break paradigms. Students involve others in the process of writing. One student said, writing in our, in our own language makes us speak it with others. Another student said, writing in my language has brought me closer to my family. Students writing in their languages improves their family's self-esteem. Writing in the indigenous language, the student's family feels valued. One of them said, I can't believe that there are people who are interested in who we are. Students learn to express new concepts in their language. During this semester, the students are studying how to evaluate the quality of a translation by doing three translation projects. Translate a medical text from their language into Spanish. Translate an extract from Don Quixote into their language and translate a summary of a judge's sentence. This semester, the students are learning how to express new, new concepts by doing these projects. Doing translation in the majority languages, when you don't know how to express a concept, you go to your bilingual dictionary or you go online and Google search for the translation of that concept. But when translation, Translating into a, an indigenous language, students have to study first the meaning of the keywords and then translate it into their language. When they have one or more proposals, they test the translation of the keywords with a person from their community to see if it is understandable. In doing this, the students also involve other people who are listening to or reading their language. In conclusion, in this master's degree program, student, students get practice in writing their own language. The writing activities help to decolonize their minds. Since they have to involve other people from their community, those people are listening to and reading their own language. Because of this, they see value in their language. Thank you. Thank you, Nicasio. Um... That was a great presentation. Um, you made the impact on individuals uh, very, very clear and, and personal. Um, our next speaker uh, is Ms. Ms. Uh, Tina Wellman. Um, she's the language re resource developer at uh, Blue, Quills, Blue Quills University. Um, she is also a Cree speaker. Uh, she holds an MA in Indigenous Languages and has been accepted in the doctoral program at Luke Quills University. Um, she currently heads the Language Resource Department, which develops resources for both, and I will not pronounce this right, but uh, Dennis, Dennis Sulini and Nihaya Wiwin um, languages. Um, in addition, Tina's role at uh, Blue Quills University involves course instruction, language support for students, um, and facil facilitating language and healing workshops and fundraising activities with experience in curriculum development. And so with that introduction, um, Ms. Wellman is going to be speaking about curriculum development and book translation for Indigenous languages. Hi, hi. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Nistamina and then ask him on the Kotaki Um Nimiwihti nuuttah kauhi piksku jään kauhi piksku, aattamaa nuhumas neigansa. 
Uh, I too will um, thank the creator for giving us another day. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak on something I love so much. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit. Uh, I'm going to start right off the bat. I'm going to talk a little bit about where I work first. I work at University No Healthy Thayutsin Stamimaganik Blue Quills or UNBQ. The N stands for No Healthy Thayutsin, meaning our ancestors. And in Stamimaganik, our, also our ancestors. One is in Denesit Slin and the other one is Nihiawiwin. Um, and so this is a once residential school. In 2015, we, um, we actually uh, became the first uh, university, indigenous owned university in Canada, in all of Canada. It is um, uh, accredited by uh, Winheg and Finheg. Um, it is governed and owned by the seven surrounding uh, nations. Uh, and this summer, UNBQ has uh, began the ground penetrating radar search for unmarked aburial sites on the school grounds. Uh, and I'm honoring the residential with, by wearing the orange shirt day, as um, Dr. Kevin Lewis and Thel has, has said about uh, what, we're, what we're doing today is remembering those survivors. Um, the funding, we, we are a proposal-driven organization. Um, it's very difficult, uh, and I'm only talking about it because it's very di difficult to, um, uh, for, the, for us to build our resources. We need that, um, uh, the funding for, uh, but we do it. And during COVID, we had a lot of um, uh, higher costs because of the uh, uh, the paper industry was over budget, or we were over budget. But despite that, we were able to do um, quite a bit um, of work. The resources, uh, Dr. Marilyn Schert started many years ago. I think it was about 10 years ago she started teaching the language um, by letting the students, uh, allowing the students to write our own stories about, because we have our own stories to tell as a classroom assignment. And then um, they agreed to have them printed, um, published so that we could use the resources to, for our other communities, take them to the communities and so forth. I started working here in 2015 because of a need, a call for need for resources for our communities and for the school. And a year since, I've, uh, we've published both in Nihiawiwin and Dene Um We've, We've published morphology book, dictionary. Uh, in Dene Sislin, we did three uh, textbooks. I'm gonna, just gonna quickly go down because I know we're, we're kind of time, uh, um, uh, time crunch here. So I'm just gonna go straight down to the developing then translating. So I, I took, first I had the idea and, um, and I, so I took this idea to my boss and I said, listen, can we translate these books? Um, she has it as first, like I said, we have our own stories to tell, but she looked at me, she said, okay, Tina, we'll figure out something. So she found the funding. Then I began working on, uh, buying the English, um, to see which ones would be best suited for us. We wanted to make sure that the, the, uh, illustrations de depicted us, um, and so we bought a whole bunch of Robert Munch books and we chose five out of that. Started working on the agreements. They were Scholastic and Firefly were really wonderful to work with. Um, they really helped us along, along the way. And then we began getting into the both the Nihioi, the Nihioi win. And, and the reason why I'm saying the word Nihioi in place of Cree, because um, as a as the once red, residential school, we're trying to get away from the colonized word Cree and use Nihiawiwin as much as possible. And, uh, and Dene to work on the books. The little ch challenges were the COVID, um, the budget, and also uh, getting, because of COVID, we, we had to find interesting ways to contact our elders. Um, we needed our elders to to proofread, to make sure that we're using um, the right terminology to, in describing something. Our language is descriptive. 
And there's a lot of words in Robert Munch books that we don't have, um, like a pink tutu. So we had to think of a, um, we, I checked around, looked at, uh, asked several people and uh, uh, the best that we, they came up with was um, a pink short skirt, uh, the way to describe it. Um, for the Genesis lane, I don't know the language, but um, I was able to save time by looking at, um, listening to the audio and looking at the words and matching them. And then with this, something didn't sound right, taking it to the elder. And we would meet and like we would meet in a, at a gas station outside to quickly so that they couldn't come to the school because it was, um, um, no one was, uh, no one really came to work. Everything was online. And a lot of our elders and all and and others, it's really hard for the reserves around here to have that connection with um, with technology, with um, with internet is very iffy. And and we had we have one elder who doesn't even text. Um, so and, it, and so few, especially in in the Denisovan language, which is in Coal Lake, and uh, it's so few speakers. Our elders are are getting a far and few. Um, we had a few interviews about these books and also um, just wanted to note that one of them, the Robert Munch, Love You Forever. So we have, we did the Smelly Socks, uh, Ready, Said, Go, um, Love You Forever, uh, uh, Black Flies and Deep Snow. And we had audio included because our language is quite long. I could say a sentence with one big long word. And as learners uh, of the language, I wanted to make sure that they could hear the word too. So um, we had audio that go with the book. Um, so, and this was a grant from the Alberta Education Grant. And we did a, a lot, we did uh, a kit, two, three kits in all in the two year project, we did three kits, um, one in rabbit snaring, Wapasutapawiwin, winter food and winter games, Pippon Mitsuun and Wapipon Mitawiwuna. And one important thing I think a lot is, is Wahutu and kinship. Our relationship with each other has changed over time. Um, it's, it's kind of been left in the wayside. Uh, so we did those three and the USBs fill. I wish I could show you the video because the videos that we have a, a program here, a media program, and they're doing awesome work uh, trying to um, uh, trying to archive our, our, you know, for us here. And um, so they did an awesome job with these videos and they were really, really good. And I wish I could show them, but there's, there's, um, uh, four videos for the, the for this Wapaso Dapawiwin, uh, and then there's two videos for the uh, and So there was two videos for each kit, uh, and there was a complete set of twelve um, students. So what we had to do is we did it in English first, and then translate it into Nihiawiwin or Denesuslin. So we had to brainstorm. Uh, uh, on the on the um, uh, memory, the card games, the lesson plan. There's twelve lesson plans in in each book, and it's done done all in Nihiawi and or Um And we had printout. So these dolls here, the picture here, you see, we commissioned someone, a past student, to make these a family dolls. So there's uh, grandparents, parents. Uh, brother, sister, and a baby. And we gave, she was only able to do six. Uh, and so we gave them to each to our, our community, our school from each community so they could use as, um, as a guide in teaching about Wahuhtun. Um, and, um, and we had another lady do uh, the two others, plus uh, the USB is, has the, uh, the pattern, not this pattern, but another pattern for dolls to, so that the students can have an, uh, uh, an interactive um, built, making something while learning the language, while learning um, uh, the terminology around the sewing, uh, making the doll, and then the family um, uh, 
the family. Um, have I run out of time? I feel like I feel like I'm running out of time. Um, are there any questions? You have a couple more minutes. I have a couple more minutes. Oh, fantastic. Well, um, if, so if there, we're at a good stopping point, and then we can also take questions at the okay. end. We have a couple more speakers. Okay, fantastic. I can stop there then. Any okay. questions? We, we'll we'll take those um, at the end after the other speakers. If, okay. If you have time. Okay, fantastic. I hey can I ask you to ask you? Can do to me um. Thank you for the presentation, and I especially like the example of the pink tutu um, as being difficult to translate. As I could tell from the translation, you kind of accomplished it, but it misses all of the context and nuance, which is something that um, Agnes Barton also referred to in, in one of our earlier presentations. Um, and the difficulty of, print, of um, translating like this um, brings us to our next speaker who's going to talk about um, having a directory of, of interpreters and translators working in indigenous languages. So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Alan Melby. He's a professor emeritus um, of general linguistics at Brig Brigham Young University. And he's also um, president of language uh, Terminology Translation and Acquisition at um, LTAC Global. Um, and uh, let's see, Alan Melby is, is also a certified translator. He represented uh, FIT, the International Feder Federation of Translators, at the launch of the Year of Indigenous Languages in UN headquarters in 2019. He was recently elected to be the chair of FIT in North America. Um, and uh, with that, I would like for Alan to describe um, his, his passion for creating this directory. Greetings, and thank you for this opportunity to present at this commemoration of International Translation Day 2022. I'm going to try to convince you today that there is a need for a centralized, specialized directory of interpreters and translators working with an indigenous language. And I will tell you about a plan to create such a directory, which involves the collaboration between FIT and Wikitux. I'm Alan Melby, chair of the FIT North America Regional Center and formerly vice president of FIT Mundus, the global organization of which Fit North America is an integral part. The question that I would like to begin with is a very particular question about access, access to healthcare and justice for indigenous peoples. Sometimes, a member of an indigenous language community needs to access or needs access to healthcare at a medical facility or participate in legal proceedings as a plaintiff or a defendant in a court where that facility or that court is outside their community. Often this circumstance results in the need for a translator or interpreter who works with the indigenous language in question. How do the medical or legal professionals in these medical facilities or courts find appropriate translators or interpreters with these specialized skills? Especially when they don't have such professionals already in their circle or the ones they have typically used 
are not currently available. Our vision is a centralized online resource for medical and legal professionals and others to use to help them find an interpreter or translator who works in the needed language pair. There are many directories, current directories, to help the general community, uh, general population, find translators and interpreters between the major languages. But it's not so easy to find interpreters who have one uh, of their languages anchored in the indigenous languages. The information in the resource in our vision could be a combination of links to other directories, including some of the well-established existing directories that are primarily for major languages, but have a few indigenous language professionals listed. And it could also be links to individuals with these skills. In today's global society, where, where access to a professional translator uh, or interpreter is not necessarily uh, local and face-to-face -face with the dramatic increase in the use of remote simultaneous interpreting. We feel there's a need for a global solution for access to translators and interpreters for indigenous peoples, and that this global solution should build on existing global organizations. Our proposal involves collaboration between two of these, FIT and Wikitux. FIT is the International Federation of Translators. It's been around for many years and it has close ties with UNESCO. Wikitux has the ambitious objective of documenting every language in the world and to revitalize many of them. How did this collaboration begin? I was privileged to represent FIT at the launch of the Year of Indigenous Languages, previous to the Decade of Indigenous Languages, which is a follow-up to that year. And that Year of Indigenous Languages was launched February 1st, 2019, at the United Nations headquarters in New York City. There I met a number of colleagues, including Daniel Bodell, Daniel Bogrudel the executive director of Wikitux. Soon thereafter, I arranged for the president of FIT to meet Daniel face to face when they were in the same city. A small grant was obtained and the FIT council approved an exploratory project to determine whether there was indeed a need for such a specialized directory. How did this uh, exploratory project proceed? It was implemented primarily by Calvin Westfall, a graduate student at Brigham Young University, BYU, who was then president of the Student Translation Club. Calvin was first hired by the BYU Translation Research Group, and we thank BYU for their support of this, of the first phase of this exploratory project. Later, after graduation, the project was continued, thankfully, when Wikitungs hired Calvin to finish it. In this project, Calvin examined the languages in all the directories of member associations of FIT. After a year of part-time research, he provided the following quote to a company his detailed report is quote specifically for this presentation. 
looking at the data, there is a documented need for a centralized, specialized directory of translators and interpreters who work with indigenous languages. We know they exist, but their information is not easily accessible, end quote. Recently, I met with Daniel, executive director of Wikitongs, about where we go from here. And to uh, my um, delight, I learned that Wikitongs has concluded that the Wikitongs website should be expanded beyond the current scope, which is primarily documentation and revitalization. He stated for this presentation. Our partnership with FIT is exciting because we have the opportunity to make human resources more accessible, building, to my knowledge, the first comprehensive directory of active interpreters and translators for underserved languages, indigenous and others. We've taken that first step by indexing all the languages supported by FIT members. Later this year, we'll make the directory public at wikitongues.org. Long term, we aim to make it easier to find translation and interpreting services for under-resourced languages, facilitating more equitable cross-cultural exchange, end of quote. What is the road ahead? Calvin, who is now a language professional, uh, working with a language service provider, is planning uh, in his uh, spare time to write and publish a paper detailing his year-long study of the websites of all 135 organizations that are members of FIT. Wikitongues, which is a nonprofit with 501c3 status, which allows for many people to uh, make their contributions tax deductible, is planning to seek further financial resources through grants and contributions from individuals to support the expansion of the website. This project is, is huge. Uh, but we believe worthwhile. And well, we're in the decade of uh, indigenous languages. Hopefully it won't take us uh, to the end of the decade before the directory is usable. It is important in closing to note that the Wikitongues website provides centralized access by complementing, not competing, with existing directories of translators and interpreters. Many of the existing members of FIT have their own directories. And although they're primarily about translation between major languages, there are some, some entries of indigenous languages. The, um, project, the bigger project, the long-term project we have in mind, is in no way intended to compete with those. In many cases, the Wikitongues website will point to those existing directories, as well as to individuals who may not be easily found in existing directories. The point is to provide uh, access. To, in, to interpreters and translators for indigenous peoples when they have, when there is such a need. We hope we've convinced you that this uh, project is worthwhile and we invite your comments, comments and questions. Welcome to contact me, Alan Melby at my FIT address. Alan Melby or Alan.Melby, either one, at fit-ift.org. Please include the keyword indigenous 
in the subject line so I can pay particular attention to your message. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Alan. And um, Alan, if you would maybe put the uh, contents of the last slide with the contact information in the chat, uh, that may, might make it easier for people to uh, reach out to you uh, more immediately than waiting for the, uh, in case they didn't capture that information and waiting for the video to appear, the recording to appear somewhere. Um, so thank you for that. Our next um, and final speaker of this session is um, Dr. Kutz Ariada. Um, Kutz is a linguist at Google and has um, an extensive career in the language industry with several corporations um, and also uh, research and academic organizations through uh, different universities and research centers. Um, Kutz is involved with issues of language policies and technologies in the Basque country um, her interests lie in syntax and semantics and in the context of computational implementations in language generation. Uh, she's presently involved in dialogue systems within Google and is dedicating 20% of her time to an abstract representation of language uh, project within wikimedia.org. Um, uh, Kutz is going to be talking to us today about preserving indigenous languages through translation and um, especially uh, in, in the space of audiovisual content. Uh, with that, um, would you uh, go ahead, Kutz? Hello, thank you for the opportunity. And as um, text described, this is not my specialty. I usually do not work in audiovisual materials. And in, but I thought it would be interesting to briefly bring your attention to the issue of dubbing and cross captioning for minority or less resource languages in general. I'm going to, I'm using Basque as an example, but this applies probably to most minority languages. Ethnic minority media make a substantial contribution to the survival of minority languages. It allows imperfect speakers to improve languages, the language gets modernized uh, through contemporary life exposure and the young can more easily relate to role models. In some sense, media and minority languages supports building an identity. Uh, often in these behaviors, and this, this applies to all digital behaviors, it's not only for media. Uh, in the case of Basque, you will speak Basque at home and in school, but when it when you're in front of a screen uh, doing search or watching movies or whatever, you will tend to go to the majority languages. So the gap that wants to be covered here is let's do all these things with your own language, you know, search, all kinds of digital activities, but also entertainment, especially important for children. Um, in that context, and the resource uh, language dubbing cannot be treated the same way as majority language dubbing. For majority languages, uh, dubbing, dubbing is just an industry. For minority languages, I think it's a main contributor, it's a big contributor uh, for the survival of the language. Um, another thing that uh, minority communities need to take into account in this context is they have to find a balance between natively produced media, which is a different situation, and uh, foreign materials that are dubbed or closed captioned. This is just uh, addressing the issue of the identity building. So each community, I think both are needed and uh, they need to reach some kind of balance in this. What are the specific challenges that minority languages face? Well, the first one is purely logistics, uh, logistic. The minority languages in dubbing and closed captioning depend on public funding and therefore on public uh, companies. In the case of the Basque country, mostly these companies are Mixer and Euskal Televista, which is the Basque television, which is a public owned and financed organization who rece which receives funds and then distribute them as needed. Right now in the Basque country, there's a crisis with dubbing. Um, we have 70 professional dubbers only. Uh, since 20, uh, 2012, their salaries have gone down by 37%. 
And just to get the comparison, Catalan usually dubs 1,000 hours per year, while Basque only does 120 hours per year. Uh, I'm pointing to this because it is a, a problem that, you know, uh, doubles do not have a stable and protected uh, work environment. And I think that that comes as an additional challenge because it's a matter of lack of funds or lack of interest from the governments. Uh, the general challenges on the professional level for both for doubling and cross captioning. We need professionals. These professionals, they need um, training and they need, like I said, stable jobs, stable professional uh, opportunities. Not easy to do with minority languages. Another front is the technological front. There is a need for techno technologies that will facilitate dubbing and closed captioning, which are, you know, companies, um, international companies have this type of technologies. It's not obvious that a uh, minority languages will have those technologies. This could be costly unless it's open source. A specific issue for dubbing that has to do with, uh, you know, with speech more than anything else is that you will often find yourself in a situation where you do not have enough voices. You don't have enough actors. And it's very, very bothersome that the captain of Star Trek and John Wayne will have the same voice, you know. And so one possibility to mitigate this is to invest in voice modification technologies. The other uh, challenge that dubbing presents in minority languages is the foreign accents. In, in some entertainment movies, whatever, a character will need to have a foreign accent because it's part of the character. And we do not know what the foreign can character sounds in a minority language. You know, like what does a German accent sounds like in Cherokee? Or what does a, the Danish accent sounds like in Basque? Uh, so here is also there could be technological solutions. What I'm presenting here is a, a proposal for anyone interested in a speech to research this voice modification and accent creation generation in, in lesser known, less known languages. For closed captioning specifically happens with Basque and I'm, I'm assuming it will happen with other minority languages. The Basque hearing impaired do not necessarily learn to read in Basque. The school for the, for the hearing impaired uh, they don't exist uh, everywhere, they, you know, so they will very likely know how to read in Spanish or in French, but not necessarily in Basque. So even if you close uh, caption the uh, media, uh, it, it may miss the target. Okay, there's also another contrast that we need to make between documentaries, educational materials, news reports, and on the other side, pure entertainment. For documentaries, news reports, educational materials, this is less of a problem, of course because it's a straight text, it's, you know, uh, we don't have the same challenges, but still you have the challenge of the resources and, and, uh, and the funding essentially. And uh, dubbing entails a long chain of involvement, and, but it doesn't exist without translation. It starts with translation. And the, the chain of people involved are skilled translators that are specialized in dubbing, technicians and actors who can uh, handle the and and uh, and perform with the with the material. Uh, viewers reap a variety of benefits, in everything from supporting identity and community, language learning, expansion of the language itself to accommodate modern themes, and artistic expression, exploring role models, to simply enjoying and celebrating the native language on the big screen. Looking forward. My question is, what do companies such as Netflix, YouTube, and the Basque television are planning to do about this? Big difference here. The Basque television it has the obligation, it is its duty to do something about this. It's part of why they are having uh, funds assigned, and they do not always meet those uh, requirements. Now, for the big ones like Netflix and YouTube, uh, I will hope they will um, contribute funds and technology to improve the situation, but based only on, on humanitarian reasons, which are not that common, you know. Uh, and the other question, the other yeah. thing that I wanted to propose to not conclude on a bad note is that maybe a mitigation for this will be to find some kind of uh, technology and crowdsourcing combination that could uh, mitigate the shortcomings. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you, because I have to ask, were you share, were you intending to share a screen with slides? No. No, okay. Uh, because I think you made a, a, one of the comments I thought you made was referring to a screen. And then I said, oh, maybe there's some- No, it's my accent, probably. <laughs> uh, or it's my hearing. Um, but the, this is very brief and very just pointing out Probably people already know about this. I just thought they were interested. Yeah, I, I think it's um, an important aspect of translation interpretation that we consider dubbing. Um, and you reminded me I was in uh, Italy years ago watching uh, Star Trek, and it, it amused me that um, the phaser would fire. And if somebody was talking while the phaser was firing, you would you lose the sound of the phaser while the dubbing was there. And then when they finished talking, you would see the- um, There is a lot of issues with that, but minority languages yeah. have more issues than the others. And I really think this impacts a lot. Think about cartoons for children. I mean, uh, more energy has to be put into this for sure. Absolutely. Um, so uh, that brings us to the end of the panel. Um, we are a little bit over, but I feel like we haven't offered people enough chance to engage and ask questions. Um, so I will um, look for uh, any questions and we'll give it a minute or two. If there are no questions, we'll move on to our keynote. But um, I do want to encourage uh, people to engage. We have most of the speakers are still here. Um, and uh, we'll look for questions on, on any topic. Um, so I'll, I'll give that a, a minute or so. Or uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll start the introduction for our keynote and then I'll pause uh, before we actually begin the keynote if, if some questions come up. Um, and uh, if you wanna bring up the slide for the keynote while we're doing that. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Roy Boney Jr. Um, he's the language program manager uh, for Cherokee Nation. Um, Roy is an award-winning uh, artist, filmmaker, and digital media specialist. He served as an adjunct instructor uh, for uh, multimedia Design and Cherokee Language Technology at Northeastern State University, and a Cher Cherokee Language uh, Animation Instructor for the American Indian Resource Center. He currently works for the Cherokee Nation Language Department as a Language Program Manager. Um, he was named as the 2021-22 to 22, uh, Sequoia Fellow at Northeastern State University. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, continue. So uh, Mr. Bonney is uh, going to tell us a bit about the language programs he manages for Cherokee Nation. I believe you will, um, as I was, be inspired by their many activities. Um, in addition, uh, he has an award-winning translation team uh, that's on the uh, leading edge of indigenous language revital revitalization efforts in the U.S. Um, they will speak about what they do in their own words in Cherokee and then in English. Um, so I think you're going to um, enjoy hearing from them. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, bring to the front uh, Mr. Roy Boney, Jr. Well, Yo, the God. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Boney Jr. Gali Aliga Gedoa Kohi. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, so let's get started on this. Uh, well, as as was mentioned, I'm a program manager for the Cherokee Language Department. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our translation team here in a bit. But before I do that, I'll provide a brief overview of the Cherokee Nation Language Department itself. So under the supervision of our executive director, Howard Payton, the department covers a wide range of programs and services. Uh, we currently have around 80 staff members who work in the department. 
and it includes a, a program such as the Cherokee. We have two Cherokee language immersion schools, which are Cherokee language elementary schools. Uh, the Cherokee Language Master Apprentice Program, and that's a two-year intensive immersion program for adult learners. We also have a Cherokee Speaker Services Department, and they focus on giving priority uh, services to our speaking population, such as housing assistance and rehab and that kind of thing. Uh, so, because most of our speakers are elders, so they we are giving them priority to the services they desperately need to keep them going much longer than you know, for our, so we can learn from them. And we also have a. Uh, Cherokee Language Technology Program, and they focus on ensuring our unique syllabary writing system is supported in the digital era in the world through software localization and things like font development. Uh, we have a community language uh, program which provides uh, free classes to our communities. Those are both in person and online as well. Uh, we reach several thousand people across the globe that are learning Cherokee through, through the online course. Uh, we have several hundred in person throughout the Cherokee Nation jurisdiction area, the, the tribal reservation in Oklahoma. Uh, and of course, we have our Cherokee Language Translation Office. Uh, this is just a small sampling of our entire department services. We've got a lot going on, but uh, I could go on for hours about everything we do, but I'll spare you all that for today. So, <laughs> so the translators, they are the backbone of nearly every service our department provides. Uh, they provide translations for our tribally run language programs that I, that I just mentioned, some newspapers, the area schools, universities, and just even for community members. Uh, we formed strategic partnerships with many research institutions across the United States and globally. Uh, we recently did a small project with the University of Melbourne. Uh, we had some people come out from there and work with us on developing some uh, Cherokee language databases. Uh, we've uh, got some partnerships with Yale University to get access to their Cherokee language archives and the Newberry Library and the Gilcrease Museum here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, which is nearby where the Cherokee Nation complex is. And that's just a few things that we're doing research wise. Uh, the translators have also collaborated with major companies such as Apple, Google and Microsoft. As I mentioned, we do, we've done software localization like uh, Windows and some things for iOS and Android. Uh, and we create some with their help, we've had some uh, cutting edge technology for language, uh, such as opti optical character recognition and Cherokee syllabary through Google. Uh, we're working again on some of these databases and we're look uh, even researching uh, uh, as a text to speech uh, software in Cherokee language. So, you know, we got a lot going on. We're actively recording our speakers, so we're getting a lot of data for these kind of projects. Um, I've had the privilege of working alongside these translators for over 15 years now in various capacities. Uh, I've learned so much from them and honored to introduce the world, and I'm honored to introduce the world to them in this pre-recorded keynote video. Uh, we have six primary members of our translation team, uh, but there are a whole lot more in the communities that we work with too. If we feature them all, you know, we'd have several hours of video to share with you today, but for this particular presentation, we narrowed it down to, the, to 45 minutes and it features our translators, uh, John Ross, Dennis Sixkiller, Anna Sixkiller, Phyllis Edwards, David Carver, and Sammy Still. Uh, they tell in their own words what it's like to be a translator and the importance of revitalizing our language. And as uh, Tex mentioned, yeah, there's these interviews are mostly in Cherokee language. Uh, so, but we ask you to you know, stay on board and watch this stick it through because they will translate what they're saying in the English eventually. But there's a reason that we decided not to subtitle these. Uh, when you think of indigenous languages in North America, all of them are endangered in one way or another. And this is because of the, the attempts to wipe out the culture and language of the tribal people here. So our elder speakers, like the ones you're gonna see here in a bit, they managed to keep their mother tongue, even though after some of them were forced to go to school as children in an English environment. So they wanted to keep these spoken segments in, in Cherokee unsubtitled un because they wanted to give the audience a small taste of how they felt as children being thrown into an environment where they didn't understand the language. So again, we ask that you keep watching as they will translate what they said into English. Uh, for many audience members, this will be the first time being exposed to spoken Cherokee language. So I hope you all find it as beautiful as I do. So without uh, further ado, let's listen to our Cherokee translation team as we celebrate International Translation Day. Well done. Thanks. See when I got to John Gubishkibitawa. So lucky, yes, 
ที่โกลีเอติที่โกเฟโลติเลกจัดอวสาวอวสาวเดสควาจัลกีที่โกเฟโลตินายุทัสโกทัลยอดเดเทียจิเกเซอิเลทัสโกจูเดเทียดนิ
taught me to speak Cherokee. And my mother taught me to read in Cherokee when I was 12 years old. And I learned to write when I was 22 years old. And I have been translating for over 20 years. Sequoia developed the syllabaries. And Sequoia is the only man to ever create a uh, written language single-handedly in history. The Cherokee Nation translators are all first language speakers, and they are all biliterate in English and Cherokee. The Cherokee Nation translators translate many different projects. We help Cherokee Nation, universities and colleges, public schools, Cherokee Nation Immersion School, the state of Oklahoma, and counties. and museums, and we also help people from all over the world, all over the countries. We all just wanna thank the United Nations Decades of Indigenous Languages for selecting Cherokee Nation Translation Department to present in our own language, our experiences as translators. We celebrate in honor of International Translation Day. Thank you. Come on. Most selling it out on. Clark, I did then. Now, task it all in. No, no, no. So, I go to the wings, can you got a sit on it? I'll go to the other. Sit on it. I'll go to the other. เดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี
Hello, my name is Dennis Sixer, and, and uh, I work for the Cherokee Nation, and I was born in Jay, Oklahoma, and our first language, my first language, Cherokee, of course, and my parents, and, and talked to us, Cherokee, and only Cherokee at the home, but then when we went off to school, we'd be English and come back and be Cherokee again, and so that was a uh, the benefit that I had in, in my in my home, and uh, but I think uh, when I first started Church Nation, I'm fast forward. Uh, when I started Church Nation, been there for 31 years now. I didn't mention that while going Cherokee, but I will in English. <laughs> and anyway, I've uh, been there for 31 years, and I always appreciate this lady. She's my supervisor at the time. I was working in the mailroom, and she always told me that you you know that your language, and you need, especially when I learned how to read and write, that you need to use that somewhere. I hate to lose you, but you need to do that. And I really glad that she encouraged me. And also going back to fifth grade in school, when I was going to school at J, there was a lady in there, and she always told us the uh, uh, Turkey children said, "Don't never lose your songs or your language." She said, and every now and then she would ask us to sing songs in Turkey, and that uh, we would. And uh, I really enjoyed that because uh, I was with the, the friends and that I go to church with. We were church with back then, and so we get there and sing some churchy songs. <laughs> then about 2000 i believe about 2001 i learned how to read and write and that really helped me even further to learn my language because when i first went out to envy our elders at doing a radio program i think i failed to mention that i do a radio program been doing it for 18 years now but when i first went out doing that some man said something small and a small statement in in turkey i couldn't say it i had to go back to my job and 
back then I used cassette tapes. I listened to tape and I finally has to hear about four or five times before I could actually say, and it's just simple. I can say it easily now, but back then I couldn't. And that's this program that I do now. I really do that. I really enjoy that. And now I work in our translation department also, along with doing the RAID program. I do both in the, each week now. And, but in the translation department, we do a lot of translations. And I really appreciate that. Somebody might call me at work and say, how do you say this? And and or a phrase or a sentence or maybe something even a little bit longer than that. And I'll have to have to give my coworkers to help me out sometimes because sometimes I can't remember and and then we all just work together. And I'm so glad that we have I have those people to, to go to. And because when my mom was still living, I would always go to her and ask her. And but now she's gone. And so now I rely on my translator coworkers to help me out. And also we years back we did a speakers bureau different turkeys from different communities so that the turkey nation would come we'd all get together and and then translate some words also and also even bigger than that our turkey nation katuas and eastern band north carolina we all get together i used to get together before the pandemic we all get together and translate i think right now probably translate over three or four thousand words in turkey that we didn't have before for the immersion children and people who are coming as second language learners, but they could have that for years to come. And then just overall, I just think I just I'm really grateful that we do have a translation department and I'm able to do the RAID program because I've met so many wonderful people to the RAID program. I've met a lot of elders and a lot of weren't elders. Some of them were younger than me, still tricky speakers. I'm glad for that. But overall, I met a lot of people, some wonderful people. And I learned a lot from them, hearing their stories, and I really appreciate them and everybody that's ever helped me. And, and I just thank uh, Church Nation for allowing us to have a translation department. And thank you. What all? Oh, see you. Louis, see the lead of them. The lucky yes, the diggy love is stunning. Our land, uh, tell you a young, you could that yes, a decent, come on the cotton case, I mean. Again, I will learn. I will learn. Cultural Resource Center. I know. Say, I know. I will learn. As you know, to learn, I guess no. So then, I you you to like you done early. That's the case. I let the girl also know. I say, no. Uh, tell you how. You you know the words. I will learn. I will understand. Uh, as I you look to the newspaper, go well to collect this. And I know only. And they went to get the case of wheelchair vest, you don't. And look at their harness, they know that like you know, you we need no hair learner, we don't know. How was he or hair? Now, you know, our learner, they're honest, they have as canana, chalaka yearly, uh, go well, Danny, Danny, like this guy, uh, our learner, our learner, they're honest, they have go here, you need no hair learner, you don't, uh. We just did what do you can eat at the night you go he a senna to the lana good at lunch and skins can take us to this can know uh la hawa uh let the high you we at go here no can eat at the ask and i use you lana good i want to send a nana uh not go well you need like to the nana go again i wish to know no no i say lisa to the lana good no uh Dr. Neil Morton how was the old Helen? How one hot door, a scarcely was he lost a lucha, a scano, a nagat, a nagat, his tanag, a huida, a nana taste no canasula, a nana desert lost on a hest, our old Helen. Now, you know, with the lena, a scano does on his disc or cadastre, a legend the lena, good does on his stick of hearty, uh, no less good. See, Kalau used to learn that together. Uh, no, 
Gigi like to go well or the keyboard. Nana organized and her lease in the guard to go well and to go well or the. I was going to know you, she lent her, goose got down the hand, dog a little stone, and she down with Lloyd. No one know you, or Lena, and no, he got to me at least on the non hesties. Coin all yes, he's not here, he's scared, no zing, so the non hesties. To the Lena, goose, uh, go well, uh, dega looker, a lay those on hesty who I used to get him. The gods are like a yes, he's a new student called, uh, to non has Gazi, uh, Kanakti, a lad, uh, Junior Stitchy Lena Goose, so like a yes, uh, you and Eske Goose, and Hana Totan has they used to get her, a lesber. The lip card to her, uh, to they go well on a teacher like school in the garden, and Hana Joga well on a joke on Estana. Ask no, uh, Nicaterna, her icon will end up, I get lost on her, I get left at no, ask you what dirty. No one know, um, coherence and not to the land, not goose, uh, who's scared goose along with the youth, dirt or down as this go. Uh, used to you lose, uh, no, it's a turn now. You got a no, uh, no, uh, no story book, uh, Alice in Wonderland, because I walk, oh, gone as tenor. Ask no, yes, uh, Savo would ask her, I want as tenor. As can also learn how good yogi in Austin, and also turn a home a lay along with the Utah school store to learn how to use the work the dinner, take a look on a lay no to turn a hot dog on his disco. As can no idea, I love stunning her when I was turned, guess her I get loved a lay. I am a turn such a leg to one is guess her. A lay, a dagger day squash girl, school, uh, year daha. La or Junior, as I know, the lexi won't is going. I'll let you lay on it, only you go league. I said, Now ask a non used I, uh, doggy love stunning her. I'll let you the naked dog a dad on, dog a dad on, or just daily score doggy love stunning her. My name is Anna Six Killer. In 2000, in the year 2000 of April, I started work for Cherokee Nation. I first started working for the Cultural Resource Center which we did a lot of uh, researching in different things and going out and finding things. And, and then we went to schools. We went to different places like to, to teach the culture and, and also the language. After I started working there, in about two weeks, uh, a guy from the newspaper came in uh, and asked me if I could translate the traditional, the traditional story like how the uh, possum lost its beautiful tail, just stories like that. And, and I started doing that. And so um, I started working for the newspaper as well, kind of translating stories for years. And I'm still working for them as well and doing, and doing different uh, translation though at this time. But I like doing that. That's, that's my job. I guess it's I guess I am just glad that I am Cherokee and then I was reader and writer and speak of the language and I have used that in my in my job. Um, getting things across to the Cherokee people and then them reading the stories that we have uh, developed. And then in two in the year of 2008, Dr. Neil Morton came to my office and asked uh, and told me, he didn't ask me, he told me that in a couple of weeks, I am going to open a translation department and I want you to go in there. I said, okay. And that's when the first translation uh, department started in the year of 2008. So we, uh, I, I started working in there. And shortly after, a man and a woman, which is uh, David and uh, Phyllis, came in there to work with, with me. So we have been working together since then translating whatever comes into the office. And uh, I like doing that. We have tons and tons of different things that we have translated. And then we've translated the um, different things, even the Windows 8 that we, we did a lot of work. And with that, and there's a lot of big project that has come in and we have, we have translated all the big projects uh, as well as anything that comes in.
in the middle of Tahlequah town, there is a, a um, museum. And everything that is in there is in Cherokee and it's, it's translated. Uh, it took about two and a half years to translate everything that is inside there um, that is named and, and it's telling what it is and what it does. And we've done that. So things like that, everything around Tahlequah or everything around the world that is in Cherokee has probably come through the office and it has come to the office and we've translated those. And I like doing that. And my, uh, when I was growing up, just like I said, I, I spoke the language and, uh, and have been speaking and have been using my language since I started working there. And I enjoy doing all that I do. And I like all the people I work with. And I like my boss. <laughs> The <laughs> In total style is going stick at a style, no got stone hair home. Kilo nugla ye un old US de lole un head doti, canestic essay. Get no, I now negat total style is going. No one, uh, egard. Oh, he on June Tessa, John Laney on Dave Waska, at the Lagoon Uni Warney Histi. He got a guess, got the Lee Lee Chaho, just die, Tinandene, on an elf disc, Undel Quasti, Unessa Uni Warney, his getting nailer. Um, there was Edwards. And I'm from Marble City, Oklahoma. I have been working with the Cherokee Nation Language Department for 13 years. We worked on a lot of different projects, like signage for the hospitals, signage for streets, and other projects. And we uh, do try to work together as a group, sometimes we have to because there are so many words that have not been translated and we all have to agree on this word that can be used like in a sentence or if we want to uh, use it like in the speech or whatever. We work with the uh, Eastern Band, the Katuas, and they too uh, go to North Carolina with us to do the same thing, work on words. Uh, they have their own way of saying their words, and we have ours, so they when we translate words, they say it the way they do, and we keep what we say. But uh, I am glad that the younger generation is trying to learn the language that was given to them. And I always tell them, you have to commit 
make a commitment to yourself that you want to do this because nobody else can do, can do it for you. Thank you. So, uh, the God I all say, the gay girl, and I would have so. Oh, you see, Don Ellen, the God's a look at new one is no, no, a less good. Thou death, what a Nagada, your stick, June death, was to stick out. Jelly get high, you to the love stone, no, no, the goal of Tago, the Hajalak, no, 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 let's tell us, it ain't how death one. Sugoi Jugoli Water, uh, they just like to go well. At least to get her way, you know, they go lady. Uh, now here, the Jugoli, huh? I'll let the go well, it's got to like, you know, uh, try no out of city, huh? Uh, what time again, who know, uh, gone double that in our game, huh? Uh, Jalaga Yetley, a name, Juni loves down there. Gagosnoetana, <laughs> Uh, Ole, uh, Jun Let's <laughs> Cause <laughs> To the land, how do you use goods? No, it's done here. Don't tell me if they are not allowed to own this car. Don't tell us. Are you Charlie Donger? Say skin guns, these guns again, huh? See, not you doubt those at loss, but you're like a new one is. Do don't know what this is. This car do do you in the land? On a look, can I tell you? I say, hello, doggy loves down here. So I won't guard or. What My name's David Crawler. I grew up in Marble City, Oklahoma. Went to school there, little school, Marble City. Spoke Cherokee there. A lot of the workers that work there at the school, uh, like the bus driver, the teachers, they all spoke Cherokee. Some teachers spoke Cherokee. It was, it was always Cherokee there. Didn't lose language. And then uh, later on in life, uh, I came to work with the uh, Cherokee Nation as a translator. And I worked there for 
more than 10 years now and uh work with the language and work with the eastern band cherokee indians in north carolina uh consortium group we uh, meet twice a year work with them share words and new words old words you know forgotten words that's part of what i do work for the cherokee nation uh translate for the cherokee phoenix and you know do little children's books workbooks you know just work for a microsoft project and just a lot of different things like that and just little things that the schools need and public schools need uh, translations for cherokee stuff their cherokee uh clamat program uh help out the teachers and a lot of stuff people forget sometimes i forget we help each other remember words and stuff like that old words and that's what i do as a translator and then yeah you know, where i learned to read and uh write was my grandmother you know she uh taught me how when i was a real young a child and she taught me how to read and write cherokee and you know we didn't have too much paper so she'd uh write on the ground you know <laughs> and that's how i learned and uh, she had a different style of writing you know it's kind of uh, some people see it as difficult to read but that's how i learned to read and write just the way she wrote she used double lines you know and that's kind of like a art a little bit you know and uh, that's the way i write today and you know that's where I learned from her. You know, she taught me all of that. What the school in the Ghana? So, Sekochi Davido, Teliku Chanela. My name is Sammy Steele. My given name, and uh, my English given name is Sammy Steele. Uh, I was given my Cherokee name by my grandmother. When I was very really young, I spoke the Cherokee language fluently. I spoke it with my parents, my grandparents, and my family as I grew up. But when I got to the age of six years old, then I had to start school. And when I started school, they uh, wanted me to quit speaking Turkey. And a lot of times I was made fun of speaking my Turkey language. And a lot of times I, they wouldn't let me go out for recess unless I spoke English. So uh, so then I started learning how to speak English. And a lot of the Cherokee words that I knew, I started beginning to forget. And so as I grew up older, then a lot of them, I was, most of my language was English. But as I got older and started going to school, I finally realized when I got to college that I want to go back to my tradition, my culture, and I want to go back and speak my language again. So I started going back and I went to work for Cherokee Nation. And I worked for Cherokee Nation for 24 and a half years. And in that 24 and a half years, I went to work for the language and culture department where I started to speak my language again, started learning my culture, my tradition, and I felt more comfortable there. And so that's where I'm working at today is in Turkey translation department. It's in the Turkey language department. And so I started working there and I, uh, I enjoy working there with my fellow workers. I work there with, and we speak our language and we uh, have, uh, uh, we, we sit and visit and uh, we uh, do all sorts of things in our Turkey language. But that's how I got interested in wanting to learn my language again. And I really didn't forget my language. And uh, my grandparents and my parents would always say, you'll never forget your language. You'll always uh, be able to speak your language. So that's why I uh, really enjoy what I'm doing today. I go and I do, uh, uh, I uh, help my co-worker Dennis Sixkiller was uh, editing the Cherokee Bible. I help uh, Anna Sixkiller and David Crawler with uh, with uh, my uh, uh, some words that we translate from English into Cherokee. And I just finished uh, 
uh, laying out and designing a book that uh, my supervisor, Roy uh, Roney, was wanting me to do. And uh, uh, we've gotten some stories from the, our Cherokee elders, and we printed those in Cherokee and the phonetics and in English, and it should be coming out pretty soon. But it's a book that uh, that I, I'm proud of, that uh, I'm proud that we did, and that uh, I got the opportunity to do that because it's something I've been wanting to do most of my life, and it's to share our Cherokee's stories from our elders. I visit our elders quite a bit. We go out into communities and we visit and talk, and, and they share things with me. They give me, uh, they teach me their uh, teachings, uh, and they uh, the, and I learn more language again, and, and, be, and able to speak Cherokee with them again and feel real comfortable with that. So uh, it's uh, something that I really uh, hold dear to my heart and uh, uh, it's my culture, my tradition, and of course, my language. The, uh, the language itself, uh, we, uh, 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 we go by the syllabary and we go by the syllabary chart that the Sequoia uh, had created. And uh, we learned uh, how to write and to read through the, that syllabary that that would that we teach others to learn how to speak and write the Cherokee language. Storytelling, when we do storytelling, a lot of times people want to hear how the Cherokee language is spoken. And sometimes we'll tell the stories in Cherokee. And, uh, and of course, a lot of them don't understand the, uh, what we're saying when we do speak our language. So sometimes we have to repeat it in English. And uh, and they uh, understand it that way. Or so a lot of times we, we write it out in phonetics as well so that people can read uh, phonetics and understand the language that way as well. But uh, if we can, we try to teach them to learn the uh, syllabary and uh, using the syllabary and, and reading and writing the syllabary. And, and we tell stories too in, in Turkey. And a lot of times our stories that we tell, our elders would say, oh, yeah, uh, I love you. Jagesa, uh, Ineget, Anea, Chalaki, and Iwaneske, uh, Uno Hetland. So that's how they start their stories. They would say, long time ago, when animals talked to us, they spoke in the Turkey language. And this is how we heard these stories. And that uh, maybe one day when we sit out out in the woods or we sit out in the backyard, we sit down and we listen again, we hear the birds chirping or the squirrels chattering, maybe they'll come back to us again and they'll tell us more stories. And this is how we start our stories. And uh, so this is different uh, ways that, that we do. And I, I, I belong to uh, uh, what we call the Turk, Turtle Islands Liars Club. And uh, it wasn't really a club. It was just a uh, four group or four men that was uh, that got together and, and uh, we did the storytelling. We talked about our history, our culture, and we even talked about our crafts that we made. Uh, there was a former uh, Deputy Chief Hasty Shade uh, and there was a Sequoia Guest. They're both now deceased, but we think of them all time, always. And but they did uh, support did the storytelling. Uh, Hastings did the uh, history, the culture, and uh, the government part of it. Uh, Woody Hansen he did the handling of snakes, and he talked about the safety of uh, handling snakes. Myself, I did crafts. I did uh, uh, bow making, uh, stick bow making, uh, uh, blow guns, and so forth. Even make bas make baskets, but. Uh, but my, but now I do more storytelling now that we're the only two left uh, from that group. But uh, but we uh, we traveled all over the United States going and telling stories and and doing our crafts and and telling our history. And so we keep our tradition and our culture real close to us because that's who we are. That's our identity. And uh, we try to keep our language. And that's why I'm so thankful to be working in the translation department with the language department, because if we lose our language, we cease to be who we are. And so it's really important that we keep our language alive. And there's not very many first language, uh, first speaking language or uh, language speaking Cherokees left. Uh, we're losing them every day. So it's really important that we keep our language alive so that we can identify ourselves as Cherokee people. Mr. 
Is that the last one, Roy? Yeah, that is it. Okay, that that was great. Um, I, I love that they called that the last speaker referred to his group as the uh, Liars Club, if I heard correctly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of in Cherokee when you talk about it. some people when you see tell stories that you're telling lies. So that's where that comes from. <laughs> and so I got um, a special guest with me too, Anna. You saw in the video, she's a translator. So we, I brought her in here to participate in the any Q and A we might have here. Okay, that's great. Let me uh, while we're waiting to see if we have questions. Um, um, I, Dex, I have to, one. I have one question. I have a question uh, for the Cherokee Nation. Uh, if Roy could elaborate a little bit on what type of work they do for the um, uh, multimedia aspect of language. He mentioned that at the beginning, and I wanted to know if he could give us a little bit of more info on that. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we do uh, quite a lot of multimedia. We, uh, we have a formal communications department that does a lot of recordings out in the community. So we interview a lot of Cherokee speakers and capture events, but we also create original content. Uh, we have some Cherokee language animations. Uh, we're finishing up a Cherokee language video game. Uh, and we work pretty closely with, uh, you know, we mentioned Google is a good partner with us. Uh, They've helped us develop fonts, and because one of the issues that we had years ago was uh, the syllabary, our, our writing system wasn't fully supported, and so when we tried to make this media, our language couldn't be used in the videos, and you know we had to make just graphics. Then now we can actually type it and all this. So uh, we do a pretty wide array of, of media content. We're also you, you were talking about dubbing. We are are doing dubbing projects as well with some other animated properties that I can't mention at the moment, but. There will be coming out some cartoons in Cherokee from other properties, but besides our own. Thank you very much. Roy, when um, the book that was referred to is published, how is that distributed? Is it available generally, like Amazon and the like, or do you, do you have to have a more specialized uh, way of distributing it? Well, uh, what we're going to do. Uh, we're having a new language center built uh, and it's gonna be opening, I believe in November. It's called the Durban Feeling Language Center. It's named after one of our uh, uh, Cherokee speakers and linguists who passed away a couple of years ago, but he made a huge contribution to our language efforts. And we're gonna have a big celebration on that day. So we're gonna hand out the books for free to our Cherokee speakers. And I guess mm -hmm. anyone else that comes out for that event. But after that, we're gonna put the book in PDF form on our website. You can just download it and. Whoever wants to have it can have it in digital format. And that book also has QR codes in it, so you can scan them and listen to the stories being read to you in Cherokee language. Okay, terrific. Um, so we're a little bit over time. If there are no more questions, um, I want to thank you and uh, all of your speakers for that. Um, and then uh, we'll move to the closing address. Okay. All right. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, for all. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we, as a part of uh, closing, uh, let me say first of all, this has been an amazing um, and insightful experience with with so many learnings from uh, so many different quarters. It's been a terrific um, International Translation Day, and um, We've had so many great uh, topics. Um, for myself, I, I had many takeaways, and it's too uh, numerous to mention them, um, but I will try and, and uh, mention a couple. Um, and you'll have to forgive me. This is not scripted, so it's it's kind of ad hoc. Um, but uh, yes, keep the theme slide up. So we, we had many different um, themes and we had such broad coverage um, that it's been wonderful. One of the things that um, I was pleased to see um, from my naive perspective is that there has been um, steady progress in inclusion and representation um, for Indigenous communities. We, we heard of some of the advances um, and that was in part thanks to individuals that we heard from who are speaking here. Um, we still have far to go. Um, that is true. But at least we're seeing uh, progress 
in many different spaces. Um, I thought uh, in Barda gave a, a great talk. Um, many of these talks, I think I'm gonna go back and uh, rewatch and also look for the slides. Many of the slides had uh, more details than we had time to cover during the presentations. Um, but I thought Imgarda did a great job of talking about the importance of even having an international decade of indigenous languages um, in order to enable uh, long-term planning and execution for what is a substantive, sub, I'm sorry, substantive um, and uh, comprehensive project. And Imgarda described um, a, a very large scope for uh, the action plan and many elements of the action plan. And I, I came out of that under, understanding and appreciating um, all of the different types of elements that were being considered for uh, the decade and uh, why that is going to take a decade and how many things are being covered. So um, that, that was um, enlightening for me. Um, I was impressed by the breadth of topics um, and the depth that we managed to cover in, cover in the limited time here, even going from children's books to music to dubbing. Um, and uh, we, of course, covered teaching um, indigenous languages, but we also covered um, teaching the teachers and uh, the refinement of tools and defining best practices and developing curriculums um, and in, incorporating culture into uh, the teaching and even having proficiency exams, which um, will make sure that the training um, and the teachers that are participating in uh, promoting indigenous languages are, are doing it with, with quality and, and accuracy. Um, it uh, also came across uh, the importance of uh, the work of translators and interpreters. Um, it, we discussed it at a global level in having representation for the different communities, but then also uh, the importance of preservation to a community. And then again, um, at an individual level, for example, having interpreters working with people um, who are uh, going through the legal system, for example. So. Um, we, we had many topics. Um, we also covered resource development, and I was um, interested to hear about the UNESCO um, Open Education Resource Project um, and uh, even developing resources, as Alan discussed, in creating a directory for translators and interpreters so that people have projects and want to um, work with indigenous communities can find uh, people who can help them with that. Um, we we've talked about the importance of capturing language data um, and building a corpus. Um, and this, I, I knew that it was important to language technology and, and digitization, um, but Dorothy Gordon brought up an interesting point, which is not only do we work today with actual language, things that have been said or written, um, we're, we're moving to a space where we artificially generate language. And it, it occurred to me uh, when she talked about that, that where the volume of language that's out there is, is important and we want to have indigenous communities be able to be represented. If they're not represented digitally, um, then, those communities actually lose out at an exponential level because you have the size of the corpus, which for the majority languages is huge. For the minority languages, they are trying to develop that and they won't catch up, but um, they can expand it. But if the artificial generation of language for chatbots and, and communicating with people and providing help is also creating more content, then that difference becomes larger by a, an exponential factor, which um, is going to further put at a disadvantage um, the indigenous communities unless um, we invest the time and effort uh, to 
digitize those languages and uh, be able to capture the corpus. So um, maybe I, I'll stop there. I have I have many more notes, but you know, I wanted to um, make sure that uh, I wanted to recap some of the topics because it was so fun. Fantastic. And uh, we will be posting the recordings um, at uh, some point on YouTube. And so if you want to go back and as I will to see more about the uh, what has been said and, and to get more out of them, that, that will be great. So um, on behalf of UNESCO and Translation Commons, I would like to thank all of the speakers and the many volunteers that worked so hard to uh, behind the scenes today and for several months prior to this to bring uh, this event together um, and who will be continuing to make the videos and so forth. There's more work for them to do. Um, we're also um, especially grateful to our contributors who generously gave their time and condensed many years worth of experience and insights into their uh, presentations. Um, so we will, let me see, I think the slides are not quite ordered the way um, I've been thinking about them. Let me back up a little bit. Um, so yes, I, I think it's important to thank our partners. Uh, Dr. Melby um, was generous in providing the Zoom platform for the panelists and presentations um, and for hosting and monitoring the event with us and for being one of the uh, presenters. The UNESCO team um, has, has, has been a great partner for us. Um, they've been working with Translation Commons to help create the event and mark the launch of uh, the decade. Um, and they were also helpful in promoting the event. I want to especially call out um, Imgarda um, and uh, we can see the other folks. I'm not going to go through every name on, on the list. The, the other uh, group uh, that we partnered with is the University of the Hyderabad team, uh, Siva and Prabhakar. They were um, very helpful in uh, establishing the University of Hyderabad as a partner to Translation Commons for this event. Um, they were also uh, instrumental in co-developing the program uh, with us and recruiting many of the speakers. So uh, I think that's um, important to point out. So um, as we announced, uh, we also marked today as the launch of UNESCO's International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which is going to extend from 2022 to 2032. Um, we encourage you to visit um, the International Decade uh, link. We have a couple of uh, links we're showing here to learn more about the decade and also to visit the Translation Commons uh, Language Digitization Initiative um, site. Where you can learn more about Translation Commons' role of um, digitizing um, uh, of digitizing languages and and especially the indigenous languages. Um, so uh, let's see. And so I know that, um, okay, so this is a new slide, thank you. Um, so that you can register on the idea, I, uh, inter, on the decade site um, and on social media the other link there. So you can subscribe to the channel and get more information. Um, and if you want more information from Translation Commons, uh, then we also have this email address. Um, it's Krista at translationcommons.org. Um, so I know that uh, a decade, 10 years, sounds like a long time. However, there is much to do uh, as we've, we've had some indication of today. Uh, there are still many needs and challenges for translation and interpretation. Um, and the planning and first steps we, we take are critical to being successful. It steers uh, the rest of the decade. I encourage all of you to get involved today, today um, and help steer and deliver these efforts to assure the uh, complete support for all indigenous languages by the end of the decade. Um, with that, 
um, this event has come to a close. Um, however, work on the decade is just beginning. I look forward to continuing with all of you in this effort um, and marking our progress next year and every year on this date um, until we can host this event with simultaneous interpretation and transcription in many indigenous languages, um, including perhaps Braille. Uh, we talked about, we, we didn't talk as much about accessibility, but it is important in this space as was um, lightly mentioned. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for participating and encourage you to work with us uh, going forward. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so this event is now closed. <laughs>